For those of you who think that police don't have a sense of humour, you got a wake-up call coming today. I'm just hoping in the first five minutes there's going to be no profanity. YouTube guidelines. Simon has had an extensive career in the cops, working his way up to the serious crime squad. Did a lot combating drugs and heroin and all this other stuff. Come from Scotland, but we can understand him. Out of all the Scottish guests, he's probably the most comprehensible with his accent. Won't no offence, Blink. <laughs> <laughs> Won't mean any subtitles for this one. And he was telling us a few jokes about the Liverpool police before we started the cameras rolling, and we're just hoping he's able to get out of here very quickly. He was just saying we're very bent. <laughs> <laughs> What was that joke about the uh, where arms cash? I couldn't possibly comment, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I am understandable after that big uh, introduction there. What was the joke? Yeah, that was not a joke, that was the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I got a phone call at Pitt Street in Glasgow, which was the police headquarters a lifetime ago, and it was the Liverpool police. So I got it translated, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a message we'd had that there was a cache of uh, Kalashnikovs, explosives, and a bazooka behind the job centre in Liverpool. And the guy on the end of the phone, the scouser on the end of the phone, was absolutely flabbergasted and, and surprised. And he said, for goodness sake, we've got a job centre. <laughs> <laughs> Now, because of the five-minute profanity rule, I can't tell you any more jokes about Liverpool until much later. But do remind me, because I've got a good one. I've got a good one. And you, were, you did act surprised when Peter said there was police corruption in Liverpool. Well, I'm glad to find that out, because I'd heard about this police corruption thing. Oh, so I had no idea where it was. Mm. I just assumed it was across the pond. But here it's been in Liverpool it's all this time. Yeah. yeah, that explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, towards the end we're gonna talk about your book the 10 percent that actually explains why he's free just now <laughs> <laughs> i'm free because they used to call me wild man back in the day in america but now i've been married they call me wild mild man to be fair like your yeah. wife tells me to do something and I do it, apart from the gardening. Yeah, well, you know where your bread's buttered, don't <laughs> exactly, you? Exactly, yeah. yeah. We all do that. <laughs> so let's go back to your origins before the police. You're working in the Glasgow shipyards. Yeah, I was born in Glasgow, uh, an area called Postle Park in Glasgow. It's interesting because most people would say Postle, that's what it's known as, and there'll be an equivalent area in Liverpool probably the, a lot of equipment areas in Liverpool. But I, I work in class and, and classed as rough scheme and it became the centre, a heroin centre in Glasgow many oh, years right. later. But any kind of crime that's going on is going on in schemes, we would call them in Glasgow. Is that a, is that a Liverpool word? So that's well? like the projects for American audiences. Yes. Like yeah. council yeah. estates? Yes, very much so. Big council estates? Yes. Council estates, that's a good one. Council schemes. Yeah. 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 Uh, but yeah, that's what Postle was, very much working class and uh, uh, a bit rough and ready, I suppose. Um, so to give you an idea of, of how I ended up there, uh, I think the working class was the thing I said there. I think that's what's important is that I didn't have a choice in the matter. The biggest priority in those days for your children in our background was a trade get a trade, get a trade, get a trade. My mother saw that as a ticket to the rest of your life. You would always be in work if you had a trade behind you. Very true. Yeah, and in those days, very much like Liverpool, I would imagine, just driving about here, uh, the shipyards and the docks and car manufacturing, yeah. these were the trades. Billy Connolly says that when the school gates opened when you were 16, the shipyard gates opened and everybody just flooded across. And everybody got a trade. That was your, your picture trade. I was an electrician, nearly. I nearly became an electrician. So all my pals, all my friends were staying on at school, but that wasn't an option for me. Mother, my mother got me the job. She went and got the paperwork and got it sorted, yeah. and there was no uh, debate about it. You were going to get, get your, start work. 
There was no hires or anything like that. But that's good though as well because you've got your own money, haven't you? By the time you paid, you keep. Yeah, that. all my friends were at school uh, doing fifth year and sixth year, and I was loaded. Yeah, I was rich. I could go to the record shop on a Friday and buy an <laughs> album for a pound. <laughs> Um, and had money in my pocket, albeit my first wage was £20, £21 a week. But that was good. Yeah. It's a job for life too, isn't it? I mean, uh, up in the north there, there's people like the ICI and Fords, when people come out of school, they go there because the dads went there and the dads before them. Yeah. But it ends up a job for life, yes. you know what I mean? You yes. don't, um, they look after their own. That's right. I suppose like mining communities and things like that are exactly. even more like that. Yeah. So that was the background. Uh, coming up in Porcel Park. Uh, but my stepfather, I need to go back a wee bit further. <laughs> because in Glasgow, in the west of Scotland, uh, religion is a big is a big thing. Or was. No, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that divide. And my mother, I went to a Catholic school originally. I need to apologise to my friends that didn't know that, first and foremost. <laughs> uh, and then my, my, I never knew my dad really at that stage. He had disappeared when I was a baby. And my gran and grandpa brought me up until I was about five. Here's a, here's a flavour of what it was like in those days, because you're only youngsters, you two, you don't remember things like this. When I was preschool, I would guess three, maybe four at the most. I would wake up in the morning and the house was empty. And I had to get off the bed. And, and we had an old record player, a gramophone with a lid that I went over to and my gran had piled singles on it. 45s, and I just had to pull the lever and the singles would start to drop and I had to listen to them until she came home. She was out cleaning the school. Ah. And if they finished before she got home, I tipped them over. I became a DJ in a later life. <laughs> Maybe that's why. Just turned them over and put the B-sides on, pressed the lever and off they went and dropped one at a time. Do either of you have any clue what I'm talking about? <laughs> I suppose it's to keep you out of trouble, isn't it? Yeah, but you know the old record player. Yeah, the old drop, record yeah. players. Yeah, yeah. Old Young phone. people would not know, but you, you stacked the records up, then they dropped down. That's right. And the little thing went on it. Then the, and then the arm came across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the noise. <laughs> yeah, singles. <laughs> My first music was uh, punk rock, and I used to buy the singles yeah. from the Sex Pistols. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> what was your first record? That I bought? Yeah. The first one I bought was Pink Floyd, Umma Gumma. Ah. I'd heard Floyd. I don't know if I was sober at the time. I doubt it very much, but I'd heard Floyd somewhere. I was yeah. only about 14 and uh, went in and bought a gummy. It was a triple album. I think that's why I bought it. It seemed Did like good, good value, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Scottish went through and through. Yeah. Little did I know that half of it was a drum solo, but that's beside the point. We used to listen to a lot of Floyd, didn't we? With yeah. My, my first one was um, Nina, 99 Red Balloons. Because I was fascinated on the B side because it was like sung in German, right? And which side did you listen to, Wild Man? The A side. <laughs> <laughs> so fate stepped in when you were injured badly playing football, aka soccer. Yeah, that whole the introduction to the book, the ten percent, is is about fourteen pages of those early days because football was the pervading thing right through there. Since I was old enough to walk, I just wanted to play football. That's all I was interested in. Yeah. And that kind of helped me. In Glasgow, there's two teams that used to Celtic, Celtic Rangers. and Rangers. Well, there's another team. And when I went to get my first football strip, yeah. at the age of four, I was football crazy. That's all I did was play football. And my grandfather said well, he was taking me for my first football strip to a shop in Glasgow, a sports shop that's yeah. no longer there, Lumley's. And my mum said, the only rule is you can't get a Rangers or a Celtic strip. Because as soon as you put one of them on in Glasgow, you become ostracised from the other 50%. Aberdeen. Or something. It's just trouble. It's just looking for trouble. Yeah. 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 So I had the, the choice of all the strips, probably some English ones as well, but I narrowed it down to two. And one was Motherwell, that you might have heard of. Yeah. Yeah. And the other one is world famous, is Patrick Thistle. And that's who I picked. Thankfully, Thankfully. and I thank the Lord every day for that, <laughs> that I didn't become a Motherwell supporter. <laughs> I had the wisdom at four years of age to pick the Jags, and that's what I did. And so I've always been able to steer that path between the two <laughs> because my mum married a Hun or a Protestant when I was about seven or eight, and I got taken out of the Catholic school and put into the Protestant school. Mm. So it was all a bit confusing for a boy that just wanted to kick a ball. That's all I ever wanted to do. Was that different for you, though? Because I know that the Catholic school, you'd be doing, like, prayer and mass and stuff like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and it was very much scale. oriented, especially at that age, at yeah. five. It's a lot. Uh, some people would say indoctrination, but that would be a, that'd be a bit extreme, maybe. Did well, the nuns go- actually teach you? Know, Did you it? get bullied or anything for the switch? Oh, I remember standing at the gate, at the fence of the Catholic school, St. Teresa's, it was called, in Postle Park, yeah. shouting at the proddy boys who were below us going to their school, just down the road. And we used to shout at them. I don't know what we shouted, proddy dogs or whatever. Yeah. And, and they would shout back, and that was all the... F- that's what the fun is, isn't it? The banter. Yeah. That's like an old firm game. Imagine going and nobody shouted at each other. It'd be yeah. rubbish. Yeah. We call that a good atmosphere now. <laughs> but then, after summer holidays... I had to walk past my mate. <laughs> and then oh, oh, again. Oh, <laughs> and I had to learn the other lyrics, oh, you know, oh. Catholic cats or whatever it yeah. was that I was shouting back with my new mates. Yeah. So it's very confusing. Did your new mates not recognise you from the old Yeah. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> at that age, it's just, just banter, isn't yeah, it? You get slagged yeah. for anything at all. We didn't really know. You don't really know at that age what, why. What you're saying is learned really. behaviour. Yeah. It's totally learned behaviour. Yeah. And you were all. It, show, it kind of shows the nonsense, doesn't it? It kind yeah. of highlights just how it's tribalism. It yeah, yeah. And the trouble it's caused. You were also a motorbike driving rock band player. Where are you getting this? <laughs> Your research is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I played in bands for, for a few years up until. Uh, and the police kind of messed that up by moving me different places and stuff they like that. They didn't squeeze your stage presence out of you, though, did they? <laughs> <laughs> but it was just cover band, Sean. We made a single with it. Went, I've still got about 300 copies in the loft somewhere, but uh, yeah. just cover band. But great fun, great fun. And when I stopped playing live, I really missed it for about six months. I was almost suicidal because it's a real buzz. Yeah. But if you'd was... like to buy one of them copies, they're exclusive, £10 each. Please get in touch. Okay, I'll take one. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? I'll have one. So what made you join the police in the swinging 60s? Well, I was working in Yarrows. By this time, I'd, football was still the main thing, and I was playing football for Yarrows. I was also playing for a few other teams at the same time, but it was a big step up in football. It was junior football. I don't know what the equivalent would be in England, but in Scotland it's junior football. It's kind of between amateur and professional. It's called junior football, which is a bit misleading. But a lot of uh, a lot of guys who don't quite make it as pros drop into junior, maybe for family reasons or work reasons. So it's like semi-pro. Reason. Yeah, yeah. Semi-pro is probably the equivalent down yeah. here. And I was only 16, 17. I had no right being there. And I got a bad knee injury um, and had to go in and get a, an operation. And it messed up my career in, in my apprenticeship. I, I was doing a course, a techni- an ONC, a national certificate that I could no longer do. It kind of messed up. So I was on the lookout for something else. I drove a Yamaha motorbike and one day, pouring a rain, I was driving past police headquarters in Glasgow and it had been on Radio uh, Radio Clyde we have up there. You'll have Radio Mersey or something down here, mm-hmm. no doubt. Uh, the police were advertising for recruits at that time. Little did I know that that was the time when, just before the miners' strikes and all, just before Thatcher came in, and they were beefing the police up for what was about to come because the country was just about to change entirely. All that industry went over the next 10, 15 years. Uh, but I must have heard it on the radio and it was in my subconscious and I popped in as a lark, really. Yeah. I had hair down here, <laughs> motorbike helmet, the waterproof saw and the whole bit. And I went in and said, uh, can I join the polis? <laughs> <laughs> and they gave me a form. But I think I had this conversation with a lad uh, last week who's thinking of uh, joining the police or applying for the police. Most people apply at some point or another. They have a notion that it might be a thing they'd like to do. Um, so the police are used to churning numbers like that. They get all sorts coming in saying that. So they yeah, give you a form and off you go. Um, and when I got back, I was staying in a flat in those days with my mate Stan. Um, we were the only white people up the close, so that gives you an idea of the, the, the area we were staying in. And he he just laughed at me. In fact, everybody that I told that I was thinking of joining the police just laughed at me. And I think that encouraged me even more. And they've still got that kind of shocked look in their face. Although I've been retired for years, <laughs> <laughs> I actually became a police officer. <laughs> <laughs> Is the training vigorous or was it skimpy? It was brilliant. It was brilliant? Because I was sporty. And in the, I think it's entirely different now. In fact, here's a, here's a fresh off the press story from a police officer last week. 
nothing to do with the book or anything like that. This policewoman in Glasgow told me she was at Tully Allen, the police college in Scottish Police College in Scotland, and there was an 18-year-old recruit, 1989, and, and he couldn't do one press-up. Couldn't do one. But that's acceptable for recruitment these days. Now, in 1977, I can assure you that most of it was physical. Half the time we were there, we spent running, swimming, getting dragged out of your bed to attention, pressing your unit, the whole bit, just con probably like the forces, because the intention in that first week was to break you. Yeah. The minute you walked into the college, there was somebody screaming in your face. You'd be okay, because it was usually about a haircut. It would be you and I, well, man, yeah. need to get a haircut. He'd be okay as a recruit. <laughs> <laughs> they'd be screaming at you and some guys would say fuck off you know? yeah. and that would be them they'd walk out the door but that was the whole point of it it didn't bother me because I came from a background where screaming and shouting was going on all the time <laughs> you could do your press ups you were healthy so you, even if you can't do press ups you can join the English police yeah I don't know about English police oh. they're corrupt remember <laughs> I want to join. <laughs> I can't do a press up either. <laughs> See if you've got a ten on your back pocket. Yeah, sorted down here. I, I read something apparently. recently that said that because everyone's just sat on the computers now, it's changing how physical people are. And in America, they can't get the required number of troops because they don't fulfil the fitness level. Because people just sat at the computers and they're yeah. not. They're losing the physical fitness. I can believe that. Entirely. People are actually getting backache and they're getting there's a. Is it tunnel syndrome or something with the like with the hands? Oh yeah, carpal yes. tunnel. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, and all these conditions, bad circulation, all the all the things. Just playing on a computer, yeah, it's crazy. Whereas isn't it? that generation we're it. talking about in the sixties and seventies, most people were manual working and yeah. were walking to work and things like that. Yeah. That's why all the joggers are about it. And gyms, we never had gyms in those days. Yeah, because people walked to work and did did manual labour. Round that end, all the joggers seem to be about. Like your age, 50, you know what I mean? 50, thanks very much. Well You're done. Welcome, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so they assigned you on. university going? <laughs> <laughs> very well, but I want to join the police. <laughs> Felt it clever. <laughs> you need to put on a bit of weight. <laughs> I'll eat more donuts. <laughs> You got you got assigned to a rural part of Scotland, 150 yes, miles yes, away from Glasgow, where you learned about death. Oh, your research. It's going to get dark now, viewers. Yeah, this morning. Been, put the lights out. This is how naive we were, Sean. Right? Some of these names might mean something to some of the some of your listeners, or viewers, even. Uh, when when we first got our numerals, our numbers, mine had an L, which meant L division, and you had a map that told you where the different divisions were. And L Division was over to the west, and it stopped round about Loch Lomond, yes? And I thought, that's fine, because I lived in the west end of Glasgow, so it was a train journey to the yeah. west, no problem. And eight of us were told to meet at Buchanan Street bus station in Glasgow, the main like Lime Street bus station, and get a bus to Dumbarton, the headquarters of L Division, where we would be told where we were being posted a few weeks hence, after college. We still had to go to college at this point. Now, we're all new. We've all got our uniforms on, and we meet at the bus station. And we go on the bus, and we're all looking for change in our pockets. And the bus driver says, lads, you don't pay. You're policemen. And we go, oh, so we are. That's how naive we were, <laughs> yeah. right? So we're all up the back of the bus. <laughs> the problem with that uniform is people don't know you're new. They should have an L. They should have a big L. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they don't have that. So people assume you're a policeman. They ask yeah. you things. Everybody asks you the time. So you yeah. really need a watch to be a policeman. And directions. But you just make that up anyway. It doesn't matter. So we're all on the bus and we get to divisional headquarters and we're all put in a big boardroom round the board table and we're all we're just wee boys. And the divisional commander comes in with his braiding and all that, Mr. Watson. And he came in, stormed in, and he said, I need two for Oban, two for Dunoon, two for Rossi and two for Campbelltown. Sort it out amongst yourselves, lads. You've got five minutes. And off he went. And most of us didn't know where these places were. I knew where Campbelltown was because I'd been camping there and I'd been there on the motorbike yeah. and had an idea. So I immediately said, I'll go to Campbelltown. And my mate, Graham, said, I'll go there. Where is it? That's how stupid we all were. So we came out and I said to my other mate, Rab, where are you going, Rab? And he said, I'm going to Rossi. 
And I said, you're mad. You need to get ferries. You need to go on the boat. He said, no, you get the train to Rossi, big man. It's an island. It's an island of beauty. <laughs> so that's how naive we all were when we were getting posted to these places. So when I went to Campbelltown for my first time, I was on the bus, got off the bus, and the place was deserted. It was a public holiday. And there was a guy standing at the bus stop and he said, are you the new policeman? All these people coming off the bus. <laughs> but he knew exactly. <laughs> I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'll show you where the police station is, big man. And he took me and showed me where the police station was not too far away. Ah. And he turned out to be one of the, the rogues in Campbelltown later on that I told, <laughs> I told the story about. <laughs> uh, so that was me posted 150 miles away from Glasgow. Graham, who came with me, he travelled separately because he was in a different shift from me. And he got on the bus, asked the driver, I'm going to Campbelltown, paid his money, and the driver said, you have to change at Tarbert. And when he got to Tarbert, he got off the bus. And the driver said, what are you doing? And he said, you told me to change here. He said, no, not this Tarbot. That was Tarbot Loch Lomond. He had to change it Tarbot Loch Fine, which is another three hours <laughs> further oh, on. <laughs> <laughs> so we had no idea. We were just wee boys getting sent away down there. Did uh, you move there? Obviously, you didn't Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And had my family there. And Campbelltown's now a home to me, you know. My daughter's buried there and uh, it's, uh, it's a home to me. Well, when you first started, though, what was it like? Was it like a quiet village or was it like, no. like heartbeat type of thing? Just the opposite, well, man. Uh, which In the first part of the book, to put you in the picture, there's that introduction about my childhood and what, and then posted in the police. And yeah. then it's all police from then on, interspersed with stories, personal stories and football. Uh, but the whole first section of the book is about my time as a rookie in Campbelltown. And it was a town of, it's a town of about 6,000 people but a surrounding area, a rural surrounding area, and the islands and whatnot, beautiful part of the country, Mull of Kintyre, yes? Oh, yeah. It's a story in the book about Paul as well that was in the newspapers last week, in the sun last week. Um, but it had RAF Makahanish on its doorstep, five miles away, where the Americans were based in, that, in the day, back in the day. They had a SEAL base there, and they had troops, and there was nukes, apparently, reputed. All the pedos sexing over here, them and that was them. That's them. <laughs> that's them. Did you know them? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do, dude. <laughs> so you can imagine the, the environment with the Americans there, because yeah. red-blooded soldiers chasing yeah. women about, men determined that they're not going to plant any seeds there. A lot of women from Scotland went over to America. Any American bases down here, there will Burton be. Burton Woods. Right, be exactly the same. It's the, it's the officer and the general thing, even isn't it? And even now, yeah. All, yeah. All, the, all around Burton Woods, even though Burton Woods not there, it's all American name. Yes. Like Missouri yes. Avenue. Because they take like, over, don't they? they yeah, take exactly. Over. This is why yeah. we ended yeah. up in Arizona, because my aunt and other relatives married Americans. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A lot From of women. Burton Woods Air Base. I'll tell you a crack. I was in the pub one night, right? And this is the cultural difference, right? And there's this American, I don't know if he's a seal, but he was about six foot six and he was built, right? They really were built, some of these we guys. big guys, And there's a wee Scottish girl next to him, nice Campbelltown girl next yeah. to him. And I'm waiting to get a pint at the bar and, and she turns around to him. He, he must have said something to her and she turns around. I need to slip into the vernacular here, okay? She turns around and says... See you, you wanker. I'll fucking slash you, you prick. Right? <laughs> <laughs> or some, something along those lines. Mm. And he turns round and looks at me and says, ain't she so cute? Yeah. <laughs> 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 they loved that Scottish thing. Yeah. You know, they really loved it. The Americans were brilliant. We're going we're gonna to go from human out of the darkness. No, too tell, soon, too soon. Tell us your corpse <laughs> stories. Well... Lots of types of corpses, Sean. We've got uh, murder, suicide, sudden deaths. In the police, yeah. it's something I wasn't prepared for uh, at all, is that the police deal with nearly every death, certainly deaths that happen in a public place yeah. and uh, any suspicious circumstance where a doctor won't pronounce and, and sign the death certificate, i.e. in the death. hospital. Not even suspicious, that's too... Well, until there's an explanation. Yeah. Unexplained. And there's a post-mortem and all the rest. So the police have got control of all that. The Crown have got control of the body and everything else. And t but that's a complete surprise to a rookie cop. And the very first, the very first story about death in the book is, is a really sad one because it was an ex-cop. 
I didn't know him. I think I'd met him once or twice as a youngster over in Isla, but I didn't know him per se. And he had died of brain hemorrhage, and we were night shift. And that was the first... I was only days in the police, days on the street, uh, on the night shift when we got sent. But I need to be honest, it was all a blur. It was blue lights and... Because everything, it's like any emergency service. It's like in the hospital. Things tick along nicely, don't they? Yeah. Until something, until the shit hits the fan. Yeah. And it goes bang. And that's where all the training and everything slips into like place. Like this COVID for now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, when we got that call, I was a pass. I couldn't drive her then. I wasn't a police driver. We went and we dealt with it. But the thing that struck in my head was we had to take the body to the mortuary. And at the mortuary, transfer the body from what the police call the shell. And it's basically a fiberglass coffin yeah. shell. Temporary, very much a temporary portable thing that the police used to transport. I suppose body bag would be the equivalent over over, over the pond. Uh, and we had to go and deal with this. And this was the first time I'd ever seen a dead body, far less touched one. But what, what I remember, still to this day, and I can feel the hair... How do you miss that? You must miss that hair standing up in the back of your neck. <laughs> I've, got, I've got it on my chest. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, is when we went to move, Graham, his name was, uh, Tom was at one end, I was at the other, and is the cold. You never feel a coldness like that the anywhere else. Cold. It's, it's I, You know, it's worse than that. It's a coldness that goes right through you. Yeah. Because it rings a bell somewhere deep in your soul. Uh, and I never, ever forgot that throughout the rest of my service. So that was a natural, um, Ash has written here that there was an accidental, there was a suicide and a murder. Bear in mind what I just said about dealing with death. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're constant. It's every every minute of the day with mm. that radio, Yeah. that can happen. You know, go to a house, go here, go there, and there's a dead body. It's, a, it's very it much constant. a part. Yeah, road accidents, all sorts of things. Is it another level though when you see like a road accident or suicide, and it's it's a, it's a, the scene is different from a natural like a you know an aneurysm? Yeah, 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 totally. Road, violent deaths are much are different, you know. Yeah. Uh, natural deaths, natural causes are a bit more palatable to us, aren't yeah. they? Because yeah. it's nature. It's natural. Because yeah. it's something that nobody could have done anything about. When it's a kid or a murder or, uh, yeah. or a road accident, decapitation, whatever it happens to be, it's much harder, yeah. much harder. That must be horrible uh, to see that. And I think here is a good time for a wee disclaimer because I'm going to tell you a story that I've already forgotten I was going to tell you there okay. about death. Yeah, the suicide one. Remember me about suicide. Mm -hmm. But you said at the start that we would have some laughs. Yeah. And we have to because in all the emergency services in my experience and certainly in my career in the police, Humour was what got us through, guys. Some of the most horrific, Lockerbie and things like that. The only way you survive is, is and that's the valve. Maybe now they have counselling or something, but in our day, you had a dram. Yeah. And that, and then you talked about it with your colleagues and you made it, you told the funny story about it. You told the, the, the humorous part of it. You dragged that out of it. It's bad, and but that even, now, you cope. even now they don't have, we've, we've had recent coppers on, haven't we? And even though, like, they've seen horrific things, and they don't have anything situated for them to counsel. No. It's just go and get on with it. <sighs> I, I was praying that was different now. I'll tell you about an incident in Govan much later in my career. Uh, in Glasgow, and probably in the UK at that time, we had armed response vehicles. We had one or two cars that were out 24 7. Yeah. And the cops that were in them were firearms officers, and they had guns in the boot. I think it'll be much more sophisticated now and there'll be much more of them now because of the, the alerts that we're on and things like that. I'm surprised you had guns at that. I mean, we're talking a few years ago now, aren't we? This is 20 years ago, easily. Oh, oh. More than that. But the, we still needed guns now and again, but very rarely. But you yeah. needed to have access to them. But this is probably for the whole of Strathclyde. We had one car. <laughs> the armed response vehicle covering an area the size of Merseyside. You know, it's yeah. different scale. But that car was involved in a road accident. That's irrelevant to the story, actually. It was involved in a road accident where a car coming the wrong way and the motorway collided with them about one o'clock in the morning. And the car went up in flames, the police car. One of them was, was fired through the windscreen and out. And the other cop, the driver, was trapped in the car and it was on fire. Now, you can imagine how many cop cars got there within minutes. Yeah. 
and we all had fire extinguishers and, and we couldn't get it out. We couldn't get in to get no him way. and he died in the car. Jesus. Yeah, and, and it was horrible. And I apologise for telling you that story if his family happened to hear this or anything, but it's a fact. Yeah. And most of us knew him. Uh, and we got back to the police station and everybody was distraught and all the rest of it. And the inspector said to me, I was in the CID at Govan at the time, he said to me, Simon, have you got a bottle up the stair? And I said, of course I've got a bottle up the stair. Because every detective, every cop probably <laughs> had a bottle <laughs> in the stashed in their desk. And he said, take the, the boys. There was three or four lads around the pool table kind of yeah. you know, struggling with it. Young guys. And I said, right, lads, follow me, debrief. Need your statements from you. And they all followed me up the stair like robots. And we got the glasses out. And within an hour, they'd all had a few drams. And we were make, making stories up and having a laugh. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. And then the inspector sent them home. And the next day, they're expected to come into work at two o'clock and carry on as if nothing <laughs> happened. The whiskey was a trick. And see, if I could, if, if I sat here and did nothing but told you stories about how drink was used to bring us down from situations, we'd need to be here for a fortnight and we'd never <laughs> talk about anything else. Because that was the therapy, guys. What that drum do you like, by the way? Now I like a, a Bacardi. Do you like a Bacardi, yeah? Yes. Now I'm getting a smell from next door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so the suicide one, this is going back to Campbelltown. Young cop, right? Um... And there was a lad phoned up one night in the middle of the night. And the way things worked in those days, every month was a cycle. Every four weeks was a cycle. So you were back night shift four weeks after you'd done the night shift, if that, and that follows on. You did back shift, then you did night shift, then you did early shift, and then you went back again. And that was there were four groups doing that. Uh, the reason I tell you that is because this lad seemed to like us being on duty when he does these things, right? So he phones up and says, I've taken pills, I've taken tablets, I'm going to die, you'll need to help me, here's my address. Now that's a classic cry for help. Of course, yeah. 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 But you, you need to go. So we went and kicked his door down and sure enough he had all the tablets, empty bottles and whatnot. Got him to the hospital, got his stomach pumped and all the rest of it. And my first lesson as a young cop was that there was, we had to charge him with a breach of the peace to try and get them brought to the attention of somebody, somewhere, because there was nothing nothing there for yeah. them. Social work or whatever, but that was a different thing entirely in those days. So he obviously never got any help, but our hope is that the court can flag him up as a risk or, or whatever. Four weeks later, or maybe eight weeks later, I'm not sure, we get a call. I'm going to do it this time. I'm going to jump in the loch. Now, you know there's a Campbelltown loch, Campbellton Loch, I wish you were whiskey, Campbellton Loch, okay. No? No, no. no. Ran their own country. <laughs> Campbelltown's on a peninsula. You're in corrupt Liverpool. Of, of Kintyre, Mill of Kintyre. Where Paul, you heard of Paul McCartney? Yeah. <laughs> Who? <laughs> <laughs> Maca to me. <laughs> I the Rod Stewart. <laughs> He's a Scotsman, yeah, a famous <laughs> Scotsman. <laughs> so... Uh, Camelton Loch is a big loch. It's why the Americans were there, remember? They had the base and they had their, their seals and the ah, water they right. need sea and all that. So, And it was a big MOD jetty station at that time. The fishing fleet was big. There was a Jaeger clothing factory. The town was really buzzing to answer your earlier question. Well, yeah. man, it was a busy place with all that going on. It's not anymore, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to jump in the loch. Now, the tide's in. It's two o'clock in the morning or something like that. Freezing cold, winter's night. So we go down in the van and I see him running towards the water. So I'm out the van. I would be 22 years of age at the time. I'm out the van and after him. And I'm chasing him along the esplanade, the front in Campbelltown, with the water on our right-hand side. And apparently I overtook the fire engine because they were coming back from something and they're all shouting out the window, on yourself, because you know the fire people, you know the firemen, because yeah. you go to fires with them. They're all shouting at me, but I was oblivious to that. I was focusing on this chase because I wasn't going in that water. <sighs> oh, to get him out. <laughs> and, and about 10 yards from the end of the pier, a rugby tackled him. Oh. Honest to God, Gavin Hastings would have been applauding <laughs> uh, and saved him again. So that was twice. But the sad part of that story is that I went away to police college a month or two later, and while I was there, I heard that on our next night shift, he had put a, 
a tube in the exhaust pipe and had oh, actually committed suicide. Man. He cried for help that many times, though. Yeah, and probably other times that I'm not aware of. You know, he had a life going on in between yeah. there. So there was family and friends probably alerting people. We'd put him to court twice, but there was no safety net there for mm. him. Do you know something? I don't think it's that different now. You know, I'm, I don't it's, know. I don't think that I think the suicide, I've got a lot of... I don't know, I have mixed views with it myself because I think it's sort of a bit selfish in a way. Yeah, yeah. There's two sides, isn't there? Yeah. There's the two sides, you feel... And I'm not being, I'm not being like heartless by saying that, but it's what your family go through. It's the same as when you go to prison, but it's not the same, obviously, because you're going to get, you're going to get out eventually. But when you go to prison and you've done any crimes and all that, you don't actually think what your family are going through. They're going through the same time you're going through. Can I pick you up on something you said there, wild man? Yes, yeah, certainly. When you go to prison, you've done crimes. Is that a necessity? <laughs> <laughs> Am I in the wrong place? <laughs> well, this is America where it was referred to. Oh, it's as Liverpool. This. You go to prison when you don't pay the police. And as long as you... Yeah. In America, as long as you wait, you don't get shot. Our mistake, our mistake from a detective was we didn't play the, pay the police. We yes. wanted to go to prison. Oh, <laughs> All right, going back to the darkness, then, you did mention encountering the corpses of kids. Mm -hmm. What were the circumstances that these kids were dead? Oh, man. Where, where to start? I'll tell you the, the, a good story because it's got a, a humorous side to it as well. Yeah. Within the first few months, certainly, the, maybe the first night shift, maybe the second. In fact, I think it was my first night shift. I'm in the police van, middle of the night with Tam, and we're quite happy. The streets are deserted. And the sergeant comes on the radio and says, uh, attend such and such an address, report of a sudden death. Yeah, and it's coded. It's got a code, but that's what it means. And a sudden death is what the police call any incident like that yeah. we have to attend and we go and it's a poor guy that's been drunk fallen asleep on his back been sick and uh, and died now the problem was that he lived up a stairwell like that so when we get him in the shell getting him down the stairs was tricky and it, it was Laurel and Hardy stuff right because Tam wasn't the brightest and I'm, I'm a rookie I've never done this before so we've got him in the shell lid on and we're trying to get him down the stair. The funny part of it is that the Land Rover was off the road that night, the van, the Sherpa van that we would normally use, and we're in a short wheelbase Land Rover. Now, I need to demonstrate this, because I'm in the back of the Land Rover, with yeah. my back to the grill, drivers over that in there. I'm facing back the way, and the back door's open, because it didn't fit in. The shell didn't fit in. Okay. So I've got my feet up on the stanchions at the back of the Land Rover, holding on to the shell. So the body and it's only doesn't... got a wee bit of wire. It's only a wee wire handle on it that you can get two or three fingers in. And now that, that's another story I'll tell you about later on about a Chinese man that died. So I'm holding on to this with my feet up there and Tam's driving to the cottage hospital, which is only five minutes away, but it's up a big bray like that. Oh. And he's the worst driver in the world. Oh. So you can imagine my thoughts if this came out the back after getting them down the stairs and all that. But we, the sergeant said to me, Simon, you're going to the post-mortem in the morning. Now, that's 100 miles away in Alexandria at the hospital. But I want you to watch the post-mortem, stomach it, be sick, do whatever you have yep. to do. But once you've seen it, you'll never be disgusted or shocked by anything else. Because remember, guys, as a police officer, you can't afford to go, oh, oh, oh if somebody's hurt. Yeah. Exactly. You're going to see people in road accidents, you're going to see all sorts of horrible things, and you need to help. <laughs> it's no use going, oh, bruh, that's disgusting. You might do it after. <laughs> yes, afterwards, do what you like. Yeah. Have a drink. Yeah. <laughs> but so he was right, the sergeant. And that's, it was a common thing to send young cops to see things like that. Because uh, if you've seen a post mortem, nothing's going to shock you after. Take that. us through that then. What, what a post mortem? What, yeah, yeah, Have you got the yeah. stuff? Have you got the scalpels and all that? <laughs> Who are you as wild man? <laughs> <laughs> Jim, Jim, Jim. <laughs> Sound men are ten a penny, aren't they? <laughs> uh, what, 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 what do you have to <clears throat> watch and what's going through your head as you're watching it? It's every sense. It's, a, it's, it's in a mortuary in a hospital, so you know the smell right away. A lot of people don't like hospitals just for that, yeah? 
So it's very that uh, uh, disinfectant smell right away. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Big fridges with drawers that pull out, so there's loads of them, and you know what's in them. Uh, everybody's gowned up. And the mortuary attendant looks exactly what you would imagine a mortuary attendant to look like. Right? Quincy. Probably a nice guy, but he looked, <laughs> he looked like a lurch to me, yeah, but that's me from your brain. <laughs> I mean, imagine dealing with these things every day of your working life. It oh, must God. have some effect on you. Mm. And the pathologist, uh, very professional, um, like a doctor, I suppose, I suppose that's who he is. He's a very qualified doctor. And it's all very business-like. And the, the body is put on a slab. The slab has got drains for the blood and all that. So it's all very, what is the word that I'm looking for? Clinical. Clinical. That's the very word. Very much so. Water running and stuff. Uh, everything goes in jars. It's been tape recorded. So he's tape, taping himself talking. He's commentating as he does it. The rib cage gets split and the skull, the top of the skull comes off. All of that stuff. Oh. So it's, it's full on because he takes all the organs and puts them in jars to go for testing yeah. and things like that. So there's no uh, there's there's no uh, nice thing about this, you know. Are you in shock? No, no. I think, it, speaking about this earlier, about sailors' legs, you know, if you go on a boat, some people just, they go pale and the next minute they're, they're being sick, or you quite enjoy it. Well, I'm that latter type with sailing, and I must be that latter type in a lot of things because I just took it for what it was. But I could understand somebody not being able to stomach it. Some people don't like the sight of blood. Not no. that I like it, don't get me wrong. <laughs> not that I'd volunteer to go to one. But I've been at many over the years now. And and I suppose the important part is the the ones I went to mostly later were murders. So you're there for a different reason entirely. You can't afford to yeah. think, oh, that's They're horrible. Victim. You're there to find out what happened to the person and, yeah. and how it happened and how they died. And you're having a conversation with a pathologist about the signs and what he's finding, and cuts and bruises. and So it's a different head you've got on entirely. You have to have got over the gory part of it by then. Yeah? I suppose the sobering thing is that that's where we all end up at the end of the day. You don't like this, Sean, do you? <laughs> do you need a break? <laughs> <laughs> oh, young, well, he likes gory. He just goes straight to the gory. <laughs> Talking about hospitals, I had, it looks like I've been doing heroin. Oh. I had, um, that is just giving me blood's done. I won't mention the hospital, but it's, the nurse is a crap. She must have had like six or seven pricks to get it. She couldn't have hit a fucking dartboard. Look at that, it's terrible, isn't it? Do you know the difference between a porcupine and a police car? What's that? A porcupine's got the pricks on the outside. <laughs> 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 oh, my God. Whoa, yeah. this is going up and down. Like, <laughs> in the darkness, in the darkness. <laughs> That's what you want, though, isn't it? Is. Can it's I tell you my Liverpool journey. joke now? We're past the five minutes. Go yes. on. Yeah. Guy goes in the pub and he says to the... The barman, paint a lager, please. And he goes over and sits down and he, he goes over to the... I've forgotten this joke. <laughs> <laughs> he goes over to the, the, the scouser sitting at the table and he says, uh, any chance of a blowjob? And the scouser goes, fuck you, right in the face. And the, guy's flat out. and the barman comes running over and says to the scouser, who's drinking his pint, right, the thing, what happened there? What happened? What did he say? He said... I don't know, something about a job. All right, so... Censored, censored. We're not in Liverpool today, by the way. No. Really in Manchester. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so you said you're pretty hardened to what you saw, but... Kids' corpses has got to be an Well, extreme. that's what I was going to... I never finished that's that story, extreme. right? Okay. I never finished. So I watched my first post-mortem. And afterwards, the pathologist gives you a death certificate, which is our whole purpose for being there. Yeah. Our real purpose for being there is not to see a post-mortem. It's the identification of the body. So it's the same person that we took from the house, that we took to the hospital, that we took back. There's a, there's a, a link in the evidence there, the chain. Which is very important in police work. That well, anything you can tell a family as well, can you? Yes, anything that's produced in court or anything has to have an evidence chain that can't have been interfered with anywhere along the line. But that's another story entirely. But the pathologist came out to us and said, uh, "I'm not going to issue here. I'm not going to issue the death certificate." 
why not? And he said, I'm, I'm not happy. There's something I'm not happy with. Come on, I'll show you. And he took us back in. And if he doesn't issue, Tom was already away to phone the CID in Campbelltown to yeah. say, we're not because if there's no death certificate, it becomes an inquiry then. Maybe not a murder inquiry, but a suspicious inquiry of yeah. some kind to find out what happened to this guy. And the pathologist says to me, look, there's two holes in his head and I can't explain them. I don't know what's happened. And I was, it looked like he'd been shot. Yeah. I couldn't explain it either, so I went back out and Tom was on the CID and all the rest of it. And I had a brainwave, I suddenly. And I went and looked at the shell that we'd brought him in. And then I went and got the pathologist and I said, I think I've solved the riddle. And we looked at the lid of the shell and it had a screw sticking out. Mm. Like that. Ah. It wasn't flush. And as we'd been carrying him down the stair, obviously mm. his mm. head had banged on the screw and that solved the riddle. The screw, the mark of the screw marked, it matched. Yeah. And the pathologist was happy to sign it off. Wow. So that was meant to lighten up the thing about the post-mortem. Yeah. <laughs> and as we're coming out with the, the, the shell to put it in the van, the, the, the mortuary attendant's going to one of the fridges to take out the next one. I don't know how many they do in a day. Maybe half a dozen. Maybe, oh. I don't know. And what comes out? That size. It's a baby. Oh, oh Jesus. Unexplained death. It caught death. Was, oh, you don't hear of that now, thankfully, touch wood. You don't hear as much of it now, but in no. those days, caught death was a big thing. And he opened the fridge and took out. And that was worse than the whole post-mortem I just watched. Mm. That, yeah, it sense? must be. Yeah. Oh. I remember going to a sudden death and it was a caught death. Well, it was written off as a caught death by the pathologist, although I now know that there was different circumstances to it. But uh, the policewoman, we didn't put it in the shell, the policewoman sat in the back of the police car with the baby in the shawl, dead. But we couldn't put it in a shell. No, no. And when we got to the hospital, I always remember the nurse taking the baby as if you would, you know how you take a baby? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You protect its head. Yeah. And she did the same. And I thought, that's nice. Yeah. Grief. It's respect, but that must be an awful thing to say that. Yeah. I mean, kids are the worst. In America, we beat the shit out of people who ever touched kids or anything. Or like, there was one guy out coming in and he strangled his baby, and I can't really say what he got, but he got his just desserts anyway. Do you remember the guy I told you about met me off the bus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When I first arrived, the rogue. Yes, he was the uh, the rogue in the day, right? There was yeah. loads of rogues, but he was violent, right? And. Uh, a rogue, no question about it. Not a thief. In those days, there was quite a differentiation between thieves and fighters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, and of my, course, yeah. My grandfather was a great fighter. Well, but fighters would have more respect. They'd have yeah. more, like, you know. There was an honesty about, you know, I'll give you a doing and then we'll shake hands yeah. and we all go for a drink together. Well, and they it didn't was like thieves. Or was, they didn't like, no. They'd look after thieves the Thieves were sneaky. Yeah. Yeah. In the back door and all that kind of fly, we would call them in yeah. Glasgow. Is that a word down here? Fly, fly or sly yeah. or whatever. So there was an instant, a Sunday afternoon in Campbelltown, and there, there's certain things stick in your mind because of the shock you get. Yeah. Most things, and as you go on in your police career and get older, it takes a lot more to shock you. Yeah. But see, when a, when a kid is reported missing, all the alarm bells go off in your brain, right? Because that first... I think it's the worst, of you? Yeah. And, and and you can get dampened a wee bit because kids go missing all the time. And they turn up at their pal's house, they turn up down at the cafe. My my daughter did it in a in a shopping centre in East Kilbride and she yeah. was in the pet shop. She was about four years of age and I caught her in the pet shop looking at the rabbits or whatever. Just went wandering off. But the whole shopping centre was, was locked down by that time, you know. So uh, uh, let, he, the guy that met me off the bus... A wee girl went missing on a Sunday afternoon and she'd been in her garden playing. Yeah. And her mum phoned in and said, she's gone, she's gone, where is she? And nobody could find her in the vicinity and it seemed that she'd been taken. So the roads are closed further up the road immediately, the ferries are, all these things go on almost automatically. And, uh, and we're searching for her. And searching, stopping cars now, going out the town and all the rest. So you can imagine you can lock down a place like that quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Maybe not quickly enough. So it's panic stations for about an hour. And uh, after the hour is up, I was coming down 
uh, a place called Long Row in Campbelltown towards the main street. And I saw this guy who I'm talking about, who'd, who'd, the rogue, standing where he normally stood, where he could see the main street and a lot, he could see everything that was going on. And I stopped to see ID car and got out and walked across. Now, this was a boundary I was crossing to stand next to him because it's to be seen in public. Him and I actually got on okay privately. Yeah. yeah. We played football. We were both referees and we'd played football on the same team at one point. But publicly, it's a different ball game. It's them and us. But I stood next to him and told him my problem. I uh, didn't ask him anything. I just said, here's what's happened. We girl, blah, blah, blah. And he said, the chef in the Argyle Hotel, which was diagonally across the road from me. That's your starting point, big man. And I had said, I'll leave some money for you and I'll do this to, to open the door for him. And he said, I don't need anything. Just you get them before I do. Because mm. there's a policing of itself goes on and see if you took the police out of these communities. There's yeah. an argument that they would run better, you know, <laughs> because they, they get policed of, of, a, of, a, of a way. It's like Paul Ferris and Blinky run it. Yeah. Ferris, another story all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and Blink. Um, and Paul so, Gardy. So we went across, and there's a car park behind our girl hotel, and he was he had his car parked, packed. He was ready to go, but the wee girl had been found in the meantime, uh, in a swing park. He had dropped her off in a swing park. Oh, she all right? He, he must have seen the yeah, yeah. He must have seen the blue lights and seen the activity and what was yeah. going on. He'd left her, and this was him ready to scoot out the town. And it turned out he had done the same thing, and and worse, a lot worse uh, down here, down south. Mm. Um, but that was a good capture. But that was that relationship that you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Where the boundaries are crossed, where kids are involved. The worst of criminals will step over the boundary, and policemen will step over the boundary the other way to sort these things because well, they're unacceptable. Thing, That's why they're kept separate in prison. Yeah, because they're not acceptable. Yeah. Because you've got paedophile hunters now who turn those people into the police, and it's not considered snitching by under the criminal code. Because of the nature of the crime. Yeah. 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 And that's the way it should be. Exactly. And if he had said to me, um, you need to give me a license to, to deal smack for the next week, then that was what would happen to get that wee girl back. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that never occurred. He just told me. So you went from being a rookie then to becoming a trainee detective. Yeah. In Campbellton. You do a probation in the police of two years. Probably the same down here, but it was two years. And in that period, is your learning curve, is your apprenticeship. And after your two years, uh, that's your fully-fledged policeman. You don't have any more powers or anything, but your employment situation changes then. It would yeah. need to be the Secretary of State or something that would sack you then. So it's a big deal, that two years. And the day my, my probation finished, I started in plain clothes the next day. As a, the aid, they called it the aid to the CID which was a, a trial in the CID to see if you liked it and if it liked you. But at two years' service, I was really young to be doing that. I skipped a queue by quite a... Especially in a place like Argyle. It's the county, we would call it, is rural. So there's a kind of pecking order there. Yeah. But I skipped that pecking order because I had a flair for, for plain clothes because I didn't look like a policeman <laughs> or behave like one. <laughs> Did you find it was very clicky, though? Did you find, like, the people who were getting in were, like, sort of... Who you know, not what you know. No. No. Not in those days. And maybe before the Masonic thing was very big yeah. in the police in those days. But see, when I joined, remember what I told you about the wage conditions changing? Yeah. It was a whole new breed of copper that came in then because it became a good career move, a, a good career, a valid career opportunity. Their wages until then, Wild Man, were terrible. Yeah. Up until 77, 78, the police wages were well below the national average. And, so, and that's wow. an entirely different part of the book is about corruption, what people would see as corruption. But the, the truth is that police officers were so badly paid... They had to make the money up somehow. Well, they lived off the wee bit of fish that they could get from the fishmonger yeah. or a wee bit of butcher meat that they could get it's from the butcher. It's bad, They should get paid well for what they do. Well, they do now, and they have since, since then. Yeah. Although I think it's been depleted now. I think Maggie Thatcher made all these promises mm. that are now being watered down. What do you think about community policing? I was a community police officer for about six months. Was I you? thought it was fantastic. I was undercover. I was in uniform undercover, if that makes any sense. Do you know what I mean? Because community were it. Ned see a uniform. Ned, is that a, a, a palatable word? Ned, a criminal, a crook, a, not really a criminal. A Ned is a, 
somebody's just on the wrong side of the fence, you know. It's uh, it's very much a police term in Scotland. There's good guys and Neds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's Neds and there's good Neds, right? <laughs> like you two. <laughs> Are we good Neds? <laughs> See, you're taking it the wrong way. A good Ned is good at being a Ned. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like a dealer or somebody that's just a step above the Neds. Mm. Oh, okay. Doesn't get caught as much. <laughs> mm. So the Neds. And would probably be nice to the police, you know, he'd probably yeah. be respectable to good, the police. Good Neds pay the police off, do they? That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> I keep oh, forgetting where I am. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly, yes. <laughs> so, weeks into your job, Anna yes. Kenny's body oh. is found. Yes, her skeleton was found in a place called Skipness, a very, very rural part of Kintyre, the north of Kintyre, about 30 miles from Campbelltown. And it was it, she disappeared from a Glasgow nightclub mm. uh, two years previous. Mm. Yeah. It was... It's, it was very much part, and it's now part of folklore. We probably know who did it, but we've never been able to do to, to pin it on him, although it's been done for other things and all the rest of it. But, uh, yeah, so I'm a rookie again. I've got two or three months service yeah. now, and we were sent night shift to guard the locusts. That's what they called it. The locusts is where it happened. And you know a murder scene? They put a big caravan, mm. tape it off, put a big caravan... And the reason for that is so that the locals can come and speak to you any time. Anybody that knows anything can come in any time, night or day. The house-to-house -house inquiries are run from there, where the team will go out and chap doors. And so it's based in? Yeah, it's a base camp right at the locust. Yeah. But this locust was in the middle. I think on a night shift, 12-hour night shift, we saw two or three cars the whole night that drove past. So wow. that's how rural it was, you know. And it was a shallow grave. It was just a hole in the ground. Forensics were all finished by then. But the big thing for me was that the serious crime squad came to town. They were brought in because they're a squad that would supplement local CID. Yeah. When something like a murder inquiry blows up, it takes a lot of resources. And a local division can't generally handle a protracted murder inquiry. So somebody like the crime squad in those days would come in with a team of elite detectives that would get involved in the murder inquiry and supplement the inquiry team, set up the instant room and all that stuff. So they were actually they weren't actually better than you, but you just had to do your own. I was job. only a rookie uniform cop, so yeah. I, had, I only was in the periphery of this world, man. So you, you looked up to them, did you? Very much so. Yeah, I yeah. mean, there's no, they're all senior cops. They're all senior detectives. They've all been doing the job uh, for years. So and it's all experience in the police. Got a lot of cover bands and all that. They're all detectives. They're all suited and booted. Yeah. But that's one side of it. I mean, they're the elite. Right? Yeah, they drink as and well. <laughs> we, I called them the serious drinking squad. <laughs> <laughs> and, when, and when I joined them, that's exactly what I discovered they were, as a serious drinking squad. The boss, when I went there, was a guy called Joe Jackson, Superintendent Joe Jackson, and he said to me on the day that I joined the serious crime squad, years later, not that many years Simon, in this place, we work hard and we play hard. I already knew that because I had seen them in action. Boy, did they play hard. But, and I must get this across for the, and for the benefit of anyone. Does anyone listen to this? Yeah, all of our police interviews get, get a lot of views. We get more, you get, police interviews get more views than the gangsters. The work hard was a big part of it. These were professional guys and they were... Man, they were rough and ready, yeah? Yeah. If they came through your door, you knew they were coming through the door. We didn't mess about. I was in the serious crime squad. We were usually tooled up, and there was no messing about. If somebody was brought to our attention and needed arrested, there was a reason for that, yeah? He was dangerous, usually. And you don't take chances with dangerous people. So these guys were the elite. And I want Anna Kenny's family to know that although it's still outstanding, there was no stone left unturned, and the inquiry is still ongoing. There's never a stone left unturned. The, the work hard part of it is true. They really, really did graft. But see, when they finished after a 12 or 14 hour shift, they played hard as well. There must be someone knows something about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we went out uh, two years after, the, after the, the girl went missing. We went out in the town, nearest town to, uh, to Skipness's Tarbert. And we went out on a door to door inquiry. And we were given a sheet like that, an A4 sheet, 
uh, with some questions on it. Some clippings of newspapers, what was yeah. on the television at that time, what movies were being released in the cinema so to try and people, jog people's memories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were to chap doors and ask people going back two years. There's two funny sides to that. One was that while we were doing it, one day, there was a traffic car sitting at the bottom of the hill at the 30 mile an hour limit, at the top of the hill, with his gun, booking people for going over 30 mile an hour. How clever is that? When we're chapping your door, asking if you remember something from two years ago. Yeah. And some people were just slamming the door in your face because mm. they'd just been done with the traffic cop. Mm. You know, that's how clever we are. The other funny part is there was a lad, George Kaya, who was ex-forces, and he got the same instructions as us, but he got sent up the hill and told, go up the hill, George, chap all the doors till you get to the last house and then come back to the police station. When we all went back for the debrief, there was no sign of George. The key to this is that he was ex-military. So when you tell a guy who's ex-military to do something, he just follows it to the word. Yeah. So you don't so say things hill, like, yeah, the hill. and then he saw a farmhouse. <laughs> oh, farm. And then he saw another we shared. Wow. Would, he, would, he would still be going. Yeah. <laughs> nobody told him when he went to send a police car to go and get him, bring him back. <laughs> um, just out of respect for Anna's family and stuff then, maybe watching this, what, what was actually Anna's story? Young girl, Glasgow girl. Um, I don't know much about the backstory. Remember, Sean, I wasn't a detective. Yeah. I was very much in the peripheral of this. Yeah. And see if I got to go to the pub at night and listen to them telling stories. And that's that was my place in the scheme of things, was yeah. on the peripheral as a uniform cop. Couldn't even drive. Mm. Couldn't do anything. Had no part. I was sitting there thinking, I want to be one of them someday, you know, because yeah. the stories and the, the whole stature... Uh, it, the whole, the whole, the seeds that they were sowing <laughs> weren't just for me. I might add in the local town. They were up to all sorts down there. You know, there was like the scandal. Sweeney or the professionals. Uh, yes, yeah. and they were and they were desperate to to not desperate, but they were keen to get involved in local things too, because that meant a court citation, which meant having to come back to Campbelltown six months a year later to go to court, which is like a holiday. Another you know, piece of for them. Oh, the <laughs> amount of booze, the bill they ran up in the local hotel was just uh, silly. You know, T-bone steaks every night and all the rest of it. But Anna was a, a young girl in Glasgow who, who just went missing. She was a missing mm. person for night, all that time. Fun. She'd come out of the nightclub and disappeared. Yeah. Never made it home. Um, and that's where she was found. And this person Dad. who is in prison, who is a possible suspect, what crimes did that person get nailed for? Murders. Murders. Yes. Oh, dear. Okay. All right, so we've got now a body was found in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> Sounds like a joke, doesn't it? Sounds like the beginning of a joke. It, does. <laughs> it is. Oh, it is. <laughs> As usual, there's a serious side to it and there's a funny yeah. side to it. The serious side is that uh, we're 140 miles away from Dumbarton, the headquarters I told you about earlier on, mm. and that's where my boss is, the detective chief inspector. There's a detective inspector at La Gilped, uh, and I've never met anyone who could drink like like my old inspector Roddy could, and he wouldn't mind me saying that. He'd be very chuffed by me saying yeah. that. Actually, mm. I called him a stank. He was like a stank for whiskey. He just poured it down. <laughs> but this happened on a Friday night or something, Saturday morning, I think it was. That uh, there's a Chinese restaurant, uh, the Golden Ocean, and next to it there's a door that leads into flats, and those flats are about four high. And that was owned by the restaurant for staff because he would bring his staff from Glasgow or wherever and yeah. put them up there. And they all lived together. And the, a body of a young man was found in the top floor again. It's always a top floor, isn't it? You've got to come down with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the shell again. Yeah. But uh, the serious side of it is that he was in his 20s. The room was ransacked. And I, immediately I walked in the room, I thought, wait a minute, Burgly. this has been a fight, or, a, or yeah, or an intruder, yeah. or whatever, forensics and all the rest of it. Phoned the bosses, who both came down, and again, I'm an aide to the CID, I've got no part, I want to be in the CID at this point, I'm not in the CID. They came down, spoke to, had, I had all the Chinese restaurant staff in the police station, all separate and all the rest of it, to interview them. They were interviewed and whatever happened, it was no suspicious circumstances after the doctor and all the rest of it had been involved. 
and there's never been any more suspicious <laughs> circumstances than I can recall. But I don't think it's suited to have a murder inquiry at that particular juncture. That's my reading of it. Yeah. And at the start of my book, I, I, I make that perfectly clear that everything in the book is just my perception. You would have a different perception and you would have a different... Definitely you, wild man, would have a different perception. <laughs> But everybody has their own thoughts. There's no such thing as the truth in there. It's just what I remember about it. Yeah. And my feeling at the time was, this is a murder. And nobody can be bothered doing anything about it. Maybe if it had been a young uh, Scottish guy, it would have been a different ball game. I don't know. But it just allowed the bosses to say, no, nah, we can't afford the murder inquiry. It's like in now. America, there's a case of um, people reported a black woman's corpse and the cops... Uh, they didn't even want to go and look for it, and then they said they just couldn't find it. It was there for like days before anyone did anything. If it had been a you know a white woman from a wealthy neighbourhood, for example, they'd be on it like that. There's, yeah. there's that discrimination, isn't there? Yeah, but it's true in America. I've seen it with your own eyes. Is that if you're white, you don't get shot, but if you're black, if you're white, you get a chance to put your hands up. If you're black, you just get straight away. So this Chinese restaurant didn't even close its doors. Maybe a few hours that I was there, but he was open that night. And that would be his priority, the owner of the restaurant was, yeah. that he was going to be open that night. Well, it's good that get, the guy Get rid did. of the evidence, get people in, trample the place. Who knows what happened? Yeah. I'll never know. The funny side of it is... They could have cooked him. I got a uniform. John Malcolm and I uh, went up to get the shell and get the body in the shell. And we parked the police van, the Sherpa again, reversed it up to the door. Yeah and opened the back doors of the van and taped off the area. Because at this point, it's a murder inquiry in mm -hmm. my mind. And uh, all the photographs are done and all the rest of it. And John and I got the body into the shell, the famous shell. Again, the three fingers. And we carry it down all these stairs. And it was a summer's day. It was really warm. And we get it down and come out into the sunlight. And we haven't got quite enough left to put it in the van. So we have to put it down and change hands. And as we put it down to change hands, John says to me, big man, this is the biggest Chinese carry-out I've ever had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and the two of us did what you've just done and sat on the shell and burst out laughing <laughs> and then realised there was a crowd of 80 to 100 people oh, standing round to get you watching these two coppers yeah. pissing oh. themselves laughing on top of this shell. Not my proudest moment. <laughs> <laughs> Bad news and barhead. Oh, that's a sad one. Is it? I don't know. You decide. Okay. You know how we were talking about the cop in the in the car that got burnt to death? Yeah. And, mm. and all the things that you see over the course of your, your career in the police, right? And I couldn't I couldn't make anything up that that hasn't isn't real. Does that make sense? There's no point in me in making something up gory, because you can't exactly. you couldn't come up with a scenario <laughs> that's any fires are horrible, drownings are horrible, uh, everything's horrible. And sometimes drownings, the smell, guys. I think that's the two worst deaths, isn't it, really, a fire and drowning? We took, yeah, we took a body, a drowned old man, uh, to the hospital for the post-mortem, and we took him in the Sherpa van. I think it was John Malcolm and I again. And he had been in the water for about a month. Uh, I won't go into the... I know you love the gory details, but I'll not go into it just now. But we're basically driving 130 miles to the hospital for the post-mortem, and we had to take it in 20-minute turns in the van with a mask on, before COVID, with the mask on, 20 minutes was all you could handle, the smell. And then we would swap, wow. and the one in the car behind, we followed up with the police car behind, would change over to the hospital and back again doing that all the way we'd be all bloated and everything wouldn't we enormous and uh, and that van that Sherpa van sat outside the police station in the backyard for a week with the doors and They're windows open. wide open <laughs> and we had a wee guy Harry Hutch in those days who looked after the vehicles and was a kind of general handyman and every day he spent hosing it disinfecting it burning incense in it you just couldn't get rid of that smell ever Ever. I mean, you dampen it down and it, and you think you've got rid of it and then some night you'd be driving along and it just hits you again. It's the most pervading smell. So, barhead. And having seen all that, I'm now 12, 14 years into my service, maybe 15, 16 years into my service. So you've seen all that. And I'm coming back from something towards barhead to sign off and got a call, heard a call on the radio 
Uh, and a woman's phoned in. She's suspicious. No answer from her neighbour. She wants the police to attend. Hasn't been seen for two days or whatever. And I'm passing by. I'm CID. I've got no right. It's a uniform call. Yeah. But I'm there. So I said, I'll nip in there. Send a car, but I'll nip in and, and make sure she's OK. Because the woman was upset. So I go in, top flat again. The woman says, Mr. Such and Such, I've not seen him for two days. I'm really worried about him. You lift a letterbox and you know the smell right away. Yeah, yeah you recognise it now, for sure. Put the wee window in and the, and the door, open the door and go in. And it's an old, an old man, probably in his 70s, maybe a bit older than that, in his armchair, television still on, quite quiet, a cup of tea on his chair arm beside him, half drunk, and he had died in his chair. Quite so quiet. nasty. Yeah. What a way to nice go, Nice way to go. You would think exactly, so. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Now, you compare that with everything else that you've seen before. Yeah, I'd want to go Nothing that way. Nothing to it. Nothing to it. So you, you radio, sudden death, get the doctor to pronounce life extinct. It's just routine. Yeah. Yeah. And that haunted me. That haunted me. So much so that I spoke to the doctor, the police doctor, about it maybe a year later. I said, I can't get this old guy out of my head. I don't mean it was 24-7. But I would wake up during the night and who was in my head? Who can explain that? I think it's because it's reality. I think it's because... It's all reality. I yeah. think it's the straw. I think, that, I think we've all got a capacity for these things, but you can only take so much. I think there's a straw that breaks the camel's back. And see, if it doesn't, it's going to blow up somewhere. Like like post traumatic we would call it now. You think, there's see, lots the kids, going on in here that we don't understand. You're putting on the brave face, but you're suppressing it. And the you? humor and yeah. everything. It's all to get by. Yeah, yeah. And then this old man suddenly don't get me wrong, uh, he doesn't haunt me anymore, thankfully. <laughs> thankfully. I don't know when it stopped. But it was really strange that that one death out of all hundreds and hundreds would stick in my head. I wasn't in the crime squad or anything at that time, I was C I D. So you'd seen all the murders and all the rest of it, and post-mortems. And... But you'd seen a lot worse, and this was a natural death, but it's one what's stuck in your head. Yeah. I think we're going back to human now. Ash has put down Coco the Clown. Ha! <laughs> Maybe funny for you. It's embarrassing for me. <laughs> this was in Campbelltown again. This is going back now to Campbelltown. See, I was a detective. And uh, there was a, a report in the local hotel that a guy had stayed for a week and run off without paying the bill. And he'd run up a good bill, a couple of grand in those days, which was quite a lot. And, uh, and the clue that I had about him was that uh, he was a clown. For that week, he'd been hosting children's parties in the town. In the hotel, nurseries, schools, he had been going about dressed as a clown doing parties for nothing. And he was brilliant and he had a big red nose. And that's all they knew about him. The name and, and that he'd signed in, and all, that was all rubbish, you know. It was all just nonsense. All we knew was that he was Coco, the clown. <laughs> but one of the staff in the hotel, the manager in the hotel, said to me, Simon, I think I know why he's run away. And he showed me an advert for the circus that was ongoing in Glasgow at that time. And it was starting that night in Glasgow. And who was the star turn? Coco, Coco. The <laughs> That's why he's away. So I phoned Glasgow. Boss wouldn't let me go to Glasgow to chase the clown, so I phoned Glasgow and got the <laughs> local CID to go to the Kelvin Hall in Glasgow and interview Coco and arrest him. I don't care about the kids at the circus. <laughs> <laughs> so the two detectives from Stuart Street went and... Uh, Oh, so embarrassing, because the guy that was on in Glasgow in the circus actually was... Cole called the clown. The real, a German. Uh, they don't even call him a clown. It's something much more serious than yeah. that. Uh, and he was the real thing. There's only a few of them in the world that can wear this red nose, and it's all very serious stuff, <laughs> the clown world. Believe me. <laughs> but like he, magicians, the secret yeah, of the magician. Yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. circle, magic circle and all that. So he was uh, less than chuffed at the CID <laughs> coming into his <laughs> private dressing room to interview him. But uh, Coco, my Coco got caught maybe three or four months later down south, because uh, you put out a description and all the details goes out. And in those days, there was things like telex and all that that went out. An all-points bulletin, they would call it across the water. I remember telex. You, you <laughs> holidays on that, couldn't you? 
That was teletext. That was (laughs) teletext. Not much difference. I worked with a guy in Govan, John, uh, and we had a telex machine. (coughs) And one night he phoned Pitt Street, which is headquarters, about 10 miles away from Govan, and said, can you put more paper in this thing? And they said, what thing? He said, the telex thing. It's run out of paper. He thought the paper came all the way from <laughs> headquarters to the telex machine. I would have been sure, actually. <laughs> but you would never laugh at John because he was an ex-professional boxer. Oh. And he could knock you out with one punch. You got a red nose like Coco. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was my best mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you then moved to the Isle of Butte as the only oh, detective. I did. I did. How did you find that? I just went on the ferry and it took me. <laughs> <laughs> that easy? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sean. <laughs> I couldn't resist that. It was fantastic. I was the only detective. The sheriff on the island was a very famous sheriff called Irvin Smith, who was notorious in Glasgow, very pro-police and funny and funny. The stories about Irvin Smith are legend. And the procurator, Fisco, who's our prosecutor. Like a judge. No, no, the judge is the sheriff. Yeah. The prosecutor uh, uh, is a, what have you got down here? The cops send it to the Crown Prosecution Service, who are the arbitrator. But it's a different system down here. In Scotland, the police just give everything to the procurator, Fisco. Yeah. The same as a death. A, a, anything at all goes through the procurator. It's the Crown. So they make all the decisions. The police don't prosecute anyone, like down here. It's all done by the Crown. Slightly different. So she was the procurator fiscal in Rossi. Uh, and she was desperate. She didn't want to go across to the mainland ever. So she was desperate for more crime in Rossi to justify her existence mm. on the island. And Irvin Smith was a legendary sheriff that I got to go and, and put the cases to in the sheriff court. So it was a fantastic. And when I arrived, the first day in Rossi, I went out for a pint with one of the lads that I'd met and we walked into a bar, the Harbour Bar in Rossi. It was a disco. I always remember that number one was uh, Relax. Don't right. do it. Mm. Are you honest, I can say He's away. Relax. He's away. Don't do it. Where do you want to go? 1980s, Bronsky <laughs> B. Oh, Frankie Goes Hollywood. <laughs> Erasure. Ah. <laughs> dun, dun. Anyway. And a little note that I've been watching this. You just said that there are people in the police, in the authorities, in the government who... Want crime because it justifies their existence. Just just make a note of that. <laughs> <laughs> Procure fiscal. No doubt. She Allegedly. didn't want to travel to <laughs> she didn't want to travel across to Greenock, which was quite a rough area in those days, and she was quite happy. She was near retirement as well and was fed up travelling back and forward. So she would gladly have stayed in Rossi. But if Rossi was very quiet, there was only one court a week on a Thursday, unless it was a custody or something. But So she needed work to justify, to say, I can't go across, I'm too busy. She could have followed Coco up. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> a crime wave. <laughs> <laughs> so I walked into the Harbour Bar and the smell of dope just engulfed me. The place, in those days you could smoke in bars. You remember that? Yeah, wow, yeah. Wow, that seems like a far off day, doesn't it? But the smell of hash was just a bit blindy. And I said to the guy, what is everybody smoking? Ah, oh, yeah, that's the way it is. Nobody, there had been no drugs case in Rossi for three years. Nobody had been done for possession or anything to do with drugs for three years. As long as it's just weed, though, it's all right. Well, it wasn't. I mean, it was in the pub yeah. that you could smell. But the problem was that drugs were rife on the island. And in those days, early 80s, I maintain the police could still have done something about drugs in those days with a yeah. totally different attitude towards it, but they didn't have. And Imagine uh, crack would be coming out about that. Yeah, not far off, just yeah. after that. Yeah, well, it started stateside, obviously. Yeah, but we yeah, just, yeah. We're always just a few years behind. It ends up with heroin everywhere, especially Liverpool was hit hard. Yeah, in Glasgow, the, in the big scheme. Edinburgh, yeah. Edinburgh was terrible. The train spotting and all that was all, yeah. that was all the thing. But, so I'm in Rossi, young detective, uh, just been made detective, so now I'm fully fledged. I'm um, in this island environment. Got your own uh, car. And there's everybody's using drugs. And I've got the best sheriff and fiscal in the world to deal with that. And I just went to town. Eckies were just coming out then as well. It was all kicking off as far as I was concerned. So I didn't really have a big... I didn't have a big uh, bent about drugs. I, I, 
I hadn't dabbled. I'd done what every teenager would do. I'd had a wee bit of blow. I'd tried acid once. You know, yeah. all the bits and pieces that you do. And it really didn't do anything for me. I wasn't bothered. I liked a good drink. So I had no beef about it. I had no special. But it was a way in to all the crime. Because the police, believe it or not, the chief constable of, of Strathclyde Police round about the late 70s said, Mr McNee, his name was, there's no connection between drugs and crime. They're two entirely different things. Now, anybody in their right mind at that time knew that all the crime was getting committed to pay for drugs. drugs yeah. Every car that was tanned or broken into. Especially heroin use. Is this, this, it causes a uh, massive amount of, of I wouldn't say you need I wouldn't say weed smokers so much. No, 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 no. I would say cocaine, heroin. Heroin, and, heroin users are a fraction of drug users, mm -hmm. but they give drug users a bad name. That, that might sound a bit weird because they, they do the majority of acquisitive crime. They'll go burgling, won't they? House fest, car so. fest, burgles, everything. Because it's a habit that they need to feed. Yeah. And we, we've all known them, guys, we're 100, 120 pound a day They habits. should be given help because a lot of them were abused as kids and stuff like that and they're, they're doing it to get, block that pain. I out. can't stand heroin users, me. I cannot stand them. And that's me probably being judgmental because I've done every drug under the earth, but I would not do heroin. I've got a question for you about the war on drugs then. Mm -hmm. So the, the US government... I thought you may have, actually. US government spent, I think it's the estimate, a trillion now on the war on drugs. Yeah. At the peak of the war on drugs, you know, you, you got these politicians posing with seized loads of coke and saying down they're taking the Pablo Escobar's of the world. But if you look at the stats, 90-plus mm -hmm. percent of the arrests were drug users, and the majority yeah. of them, yeah. potheads, over yeah. half a million a year at the peak of the war on drugs getting arrested for weed possession. Mm -hmm. So on this channel, we're calling for the complete legalisation, decriminalisation of weed, the end of the war on drugs, on drug users, yep. and putting all that money, because the police are saying we haven't got the money to investigate paedophiles and go after paedophiles, taking all that money that's wasted on potheads and putting it into going after paedophiles. Legalise it. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that idea? Since... 19, since Rossi, that was my first experience. I'd seen some hash and stuff. I had a cannabis plant growing in my office in Campbelltown. Because <laughs> yeah, right? you know, I'd, I'd got a cutting. I'd got a cutting off and I raided the guy who was growing it in his loft and I'd planted the cutting and it was a beautiful, lovely plants. But that was all I knew and I had a box in Campbelltown that had all the drugs, all the illegal drugs in it that I could take to the school and show kids. Have you still got it? <laughs> <laughs> Much. Can we turn off now? Yeah. yeah deal first. Uh, so nice. Rossi was really my first experience and it was a way in because I discovered that junkies will tell you anything to get out again, yeah, to feed their habit. And what a source of information it is for pedos, for anything at all. If I want to, I heard a thing in the radio here in Liverpool, an unsolved murder from 10 years ago that's on the news this morning. I don't know why it's on the news this morning. It was a police officer that was killed in a scheme in Liverpool 10 years ago today, God. or it's the anniversary anyway, and it was on the telly this morning. If somebody said to me today, Simon, you're in charge of that inquiry now after 10 years, Go to this scheme and find out what happened. Go and get 10 heroin addicts. We would go, yeah. We, that's our entry <laughs> exactly. point. Exactly. That's our entry point. And yeah. from there, we will learn anything that's going on when I squeeze them by the balls. Tell me Do you what know you what I mean? Know. We'll set you free on the next crime. Yeah. Because once I've got him indoors and he thinks he's not getting out, he'll Ooh. tell me anything to get out of there. Shop the granny. And that's our entry point to get the next person to speak to yeah. and the next person to speak to. So it was always my way in. I always believed that the people we were dealing with, especially the users, the junkies, yeah. were the victims of the whole friggin' match. Totally the victims. It's never changed. And what we did in those days, I'll tell you a cracking story about my pal Tam Snedden in a minute. I'll tell you right now, Tam went back from Tully Allen. He worked in a place called Stirling, which is a tiny police force. Mm -hmm. And coming out of Tully Allen Police College as young detectives, we were raring to go. And he went to his boss and said, I can sort all this crime out, all the street crime. In those days, car radios were getting stolen quicker than you could replace them. Yeah. I thought everybody in the world must have a frigging car radio. Do you know what I mean? They are getting stolen, that cassettes. But Tam said to his commander, give me a week, boss, to go and have a look at the underworld here and I'll find out what's going on and sort it out and we'll see what drugs are about. And his boss said, yeah, when you go, Tam, shut up and go and do it. And Tam went, and that week, he ran riot. Because like Ross say, Stirling was the same. Because drugs are not a reportable crime. 
It's not like getting your house broken into or your car tanned or stolen or being assaulted. You yeah. don't phone the police and say there's somebody using drugs on our street. It's under the radar, totally. So it doesn't reflect in police statistics. And that's all that matters to the bosses, in my day, was the stats. Still is. <laughs> so Tom went mad, did 20 or 30 drugs cases and came back and the commander phoned him on the Monday morning and said, in my office, Tom. And Tom thought he was going in to get a medal. Right? He, he, thought, paperwork. he thought he was going in to get a big medal pinned on here <laughs> and maybe promoted and the big pats on the back. And what he got was a kick in the balls. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking idiot. What do you think you're playing at? Until you started this, we had no drugs problem. Nothing. Now we've got the press phoning up, we've got lawyers on the phone, we've got we've got a big drugs problem. We're the worst drugs problem in Scotland now because of you. <laughs> Not interested in the fact that there were drugs on the streets. Best is sweeped under the carpet and out of the way. That was the attitude of the police. And that confrontation, that, that blinkered attitude. Yeah. So drugs and heroin was coming into the country. The, the addicts were being created at that time. The police were doing absolutely nothing about it because they didn't want to know. And all the laws that were there, the Misuse of Drugs Act that was revamped in 1978, all of that was coming in, was widening in that gap between the drugs world and the authorities. There's your war on drugs starting right away, oh, yeah. and we created a big black market. I know that in Liverpool... There's Didn't a, we? Yeah. There it is. Like every you want to make year. money? You want to... There you are. There's your black There's market your right there. there. Yeah. Made it for you. Saatchi and Saatchi, I don't know if this is true, but it's a lovely story. Apparently Saatchi and Saatchi were commissioned by the government back in the day to, to judge their anti-drugs campaign, whatever they put on TV or radio yeah. or whatever. Kids, don't use drugs. And Saatchi and Saatchi said, if they had been asked to do a campaign to promote drug use they to teenagers, it. they couldn't have done a better job wow. than the government. Wow. Yeah. These are all the unintended consequences of the yeah. war on drugs and the drug laws, and it, it needs to end. I saw it this morning on the radio. I saw a chief superintendent or something on television saying about wearing masks and stuff for COVID. All I can say to young people is, obey the rules. The rules are there to protect you. This is why we do it. Think of what was the term we came up with. It was a... It was the initials that you were to remember, an acronym to remember your mask and your safety. And your, and he thinks that teen, who don't even watch television anymore no. are sitting at nine o'clock in the morning listening to him, telling them what the rules are. When I was a teenager, the rules were exactly what I wanted to know so that I could do the opposite. Exactly. Isn't it? <laughs> the yeah. rules are meant to be yeah. broken, aren't they? Yeah, especially yeah. A, a guy... <laughs> The uniform and the braiding and all yeah. the rest of it. Who's never seen a, an angry man in his friggin' life, no. I could wager. They can't put something real on. Do you know what I mean? Let me ask you then about mass incarceration. So Who? <laughs> I never touched her. <laughs> so we saw, under the war on drugs, the mass incarceration of low-level drug users for profits into private prisons, which has now become... Tens of billions of dollars a year industry. <laughs> Especially hard hit black guys, they got them on the exact same plantations they had them working on when they were slaves before Cat slavery was abolished. Cattle yep. market. So I'm, a, I'm an associate member of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, and those cops say the purpose of prisons is to put person A, who's harming person B, take them out of society. Pedophiles, robbers, rapists, drug traffickers, whatever. Thieves. Yeah, thieves. When you mass incarcerate low-level drug users, young people with weed possession, for example, who's that kid hurting? No one. If No one, or if anyone himself, cry for help or whatever, needs, needs mentorship guidance. Yeah. Not because so, he's getting stolen. He wants to get stolen. He wants to get stolen. He doesn't need any help. You know where we're right back to? Remember my poor soul that committed suicide? Yeah. We're right back to that mental health issue, aren't we? Yeah. There's nothing there, guys. No. I've got a friend in prison just now, and he'll get out. He's getting out again. He told me, I think, uh, two or three months. But he'll be back in within a month because he's now becoming, that's his safety zone, that's his, that's his comfort zone in yeah. there. Second home, Because isn't it? he's not well. 
and he'll get out and he'll be okay for a week or two and then he starts and the meds don't help. He starts boozing and, and he's back in again. He's got a but he doesn't do anything. He's he got just a, annoys the police, really. Yeah, he's got a cot and three square meals a day. Yeah. He's not a thief. He's not a violent person. He's not an offender, really. He's, he's maybe a bit of a, a, a shamster, you know. Yeah. We, we, he'll buy things cheap Lobo and sell them around the pubs and all that. He's just earning a living. But he's not well. It becomes He's a on way, the spectrum. It becomes a way of life for um, some people who are institutionalised. And low-level drug users Which are is arrested. exactly what drugs is, a way of life. Yeah. Low-level drug users, if they're doing soft drugs in prison, it's, it's all injecting heroin. Yeah. Yeah, it is. The majority of shooting up heroin. Mm-hmm. So they come out with a heroin problem that they didn't have before they went in. Yeah. I mean, and they're paying. Yeah. Literally, yeah. you can get, like, f- from the streets here, you can get, like, five pounds worth of heroin. And in, in the jails... To cost in a hundred pounds for the same fucking little bit in it. Yeah, yeah. What? What? Let me ask you a question then, Sean. If you, I've not heard of this before. This uh, SEA. I'm, I'm in. By the way, I'll join up. I'd have joined up 30, forty years ago. Yeah. Because I've known since day one that the guys you're talking about, the low level drug users, are just a source of information for me. Yeah. And a lot of them became informants. Yeah. We, we uh, did a turn in a place called Tucker Hill and Govan where we got a lot of smack, right? Mm-hmm. We'd watched it for a week. We were in there. We were in post office vans and all sorts. We were right in there, saw the whole thing, made the arrest. This guy had already done 10 years. Sentences were much harder then for dealing smack. So he was looking at serious jail time. And uh, But w- while we were watching, we'd not only identified the deals and had all the information, photographs, we'd found his safe house as well. Mm. Right? And he had a wee boy climbing a drain pipe four flights up to get to the safe house. And we knew where it was. So when we hit the house and I spoke to him privately, I said to him, there's two things we can do here. We can just go down by the book. And, uh, and I know where the safe house is across the road. And I saw his face drop at that, right? Uh, and you just go to jail for the next 20 years because that's probably what he was looking at at the yeah. time. And we, what's the other route? <laughs> the other route is we forget the safe house. You tell me where the stuff is and I'll lose it. Yeah. Do you for the 10 bags or whatever they had, which is almost personal use mm-hmm. in your house. And he said, what's, and what else would you need from me? I said, I need to know the supply, the supply chain. I need to know where your next schedule to meet. I need to know names. I need to know phone numbers. And we did the deal. And because of that deal, going away from the from that, the funny side of it, because of that deal, we watched a cemetery. We saw the whole thing going down where his dealers were. That ended up a big a big uh, uh, turn down at the shipyards down in Port Glasgow in Greenock. And it was a, a cruise ship. No, not a cruise ship. A, a merchant ship. And there was tons of stuff taken off of there, mostly cannabis. Yeah. But it was an end to a big, big cartel that was yeah. shipping stuff across the Atlantic. And that came from a house in Tucker Hill and Govan because you can do a deal. And that's, what, that's the power of drugs to me. So the punchline is that we've now got all this smack because we went up to the safe house, lifted the floorboard, mm. and there it was. And I can tell you exactly how much there was because we went out in a car, in a police car on the Sunday, me and my neighbour, Davy. And had a junkie tout with us, right? I'd hate using that term now because it sounds disrespectful, but he was a heroin addict. And in those days, but he was a friend and tout informant. Yeah. We took him out in the car, drove up to the hills up in a place called Mogai and gave him magazines and scissors. <laughs> to make <laughs> and, raps. And told him to make raps. <laughs> and he made 274 raps, right, that we had. He maybe got half a dozen f- for his trouble. Yeah. We were out the car when he did it because it's, it's all over the place, you know, the windows open and all the rest of it. And he made all this for us. The reason we got him to do that was I said to him, now you don't tell a soul that we've got these. Knowing fine well what's going to happen. Sales, isn't it, once you've got so many? He's telling everybody. The minute he's out the car, he's off to M- McLean and Davy have got all this stuff. That night, Davy and I went out to the back of the side of the police station at Govan and dug a hole about three foot deep and buried it because we couldn't get caught with it we'd go to jail <laughs> where did you bury it? <laughs> it's flats on it now <laughs> <laughs> this is 30 years ago flats built on it now we forgot we had no intentions you that see, would be the, good heroin soon <laughs> see the Neds need to think that you're capable of anything yeah any amount of violence any amount of planting of drugs anything untoward any torture yeah they need to believe that you would do that to them 
for you to have any leverage whatsoever. Well, I think some of the serious crime people do. He likes the Paul Ferris and likes his... The Link. police are much more scared of Paul Ferris than he ever was. <laughs> I'll tell you why in a minute. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But from then on, all the drug dealers and users in Govan thought that we had what we would call a present. We wouldn't need 274 of them. 20 of them would get you a stretch in jail, a good yeah. stretch in jail. So think of the power we had. If I'm coming to your house, Sean, and you're expecting me to go, what's this in your top pocket? Oh, for goodness sake. 20 bags. That's real power. So we were chapping doors. Mr. McLean, come in. Do you want to make a cup of tea? <laughs> <laughs> and all the cars were left open. Everything was left open so they could say, oh, I never locked my car. That could be anybody that put it there. Because for a few months, they were sure that we were going to do that. We were going to pick Signal. our target. Yeah. We never had to. The fear of it is much, much better than ever using it. And it, you don't go to jail if you don't do it. The thing is, so if they, if they deserve it, I think they deserve it. So, who? The people you stitching up. They don't get. We stitched. never stitched anyone up. That's the whole point. There was the fear of being stitched up. Uh, yeah. right. Gave us the power. Yeah, they yeah. tell me anything. So this leads to another question. Then, the black market in drugs is so big now it corrupts some members of every profession: police, judges, politicians. Unquestionably. Referring yeah. back to what you just said, there mm -hmm. are cops who have been busted. When they say they're going to get rid of it, we'll give you the pass. We're going to get rid of these drugs for you. But mm -hmm. they actually resell them. Or there's oh. a dealer they're working with who they're protecting, who they have resell them. And the amount of money they can make from that is so much versus what they're getting yeah. paid as, yeah. a, as a police person. The temptation's always done. There's always some that are going to go down that road. Is that a question, Sean? What, what, are, you, what, are, you, what are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on You're that? You're absolutely right. I'll tell you what's surprising about it, though. I don't know how many cops there are in the UK. I can only go Strathclyde Police had 6,000 cops, right? Yeah. Probably Merseyside will be similar to that. Mm. The Met, I think, has got 40,000, something like that. So that's the scale. 6,000 people recruited, trained, and become police officers, mm. guys like me. The Temptations, my book's called The 10%, right? So that's the 10% who I perceive, it's only a useful term for me, is cops who are actually on the front line dealing with the guys you're talking about. Yeah. Most cops go about doing their calls, their traffic duties, yeah. their house break-ins, whatever. Few of us get to go into plain clothes and do that kind of thing. Even fewer get to go into a serious crime squad or get nearer the margin. And that margin I'm talking about is criminal and police because yeah. you have to get close to that line to be able to deal with them, to even speak the same language. You, can you bring me back here after I tell you a quick story about speaking the same language? <laughs> can you remember where we are yeah, on this line? Yeah, yeah. yeah, the 10%. I went to prison with an advocate and we had done a case. This is retired, right? And it was a, a private case we did. He had an appeal against an attempt murder mm -hmm. and the appeal, appeal failed. And he was only a wee boy. He was only 16 or 17. And we had to go to the prison to tell him that his appeal had failed. And I'm with the advocate and I'm the driver, really. So we went to the prison, got in, got the interview, all the rest of it. He's brought in to us and the advocate explains to him that his appeal has failed. And the wee guy is sitting looking at the advocate like that. Got it. He never understood a word the advocate said to him because the advocate probably said, Mr McAllister, I have to inform you that uh, after a strenuous appeal made in the highest court in the land of justiciary, and the wee guy's like that, didn't understand a word. Yeah. And when he finished, he looked at me. The wee guy looked at me and I said, you're fucked, mate. <laughs> and he went, oh, all right, big man. <laughs> I thought that anyway. I thought that anyway. <laughs> so it's that communication. You have to go down to the line. Yeah. And sometimes in, in undercover work, what you're doing is going over the line. You've been one of them for however long it takes. Six. And I've been in there dealing smack, I've been in there setting up houses to deal smack, yeah. to get in the community, to get the information you need, to get offered the supply you need to bust the whole thing up. Another quick story before I go back there. My first ever time undercover, right? Sent to Oban, young detective, sent to Oban, which is a rural town, similar to Campbelltown on the west coast of Scotland, near to Mull, up that way. And we're sent up there. There's a pub called the Man Eater that's no longer there, but there's drugs for sale in there. And we're putting you two in to find out what's going on. So me and this other young guy from Dumbarton got sent in 
we, I was be 22, 23. We were electricians, supposedly, staying in a local hotel. We had a cover story. We were up to do a job, blah, blah, blah. So him and I are in there playing pool and having a few beers. The problem was in these rural areas with the licensing hours, because we assumed that we would finish drinking at 11 o'clock. So you kind of pace yourself to 11 o'clock. Yeah. You know, your, your pints or whatever. A few shots at the end of the night. Come 11 o'clock, we are well oiled, as they would say in Scotland, and friendly. And Stay behind, somebody goes up and orders another beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we're like that still. Eleven o'clock. So we went up. We still get a beer. Oh yeah, we're open till two. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine the state we were in by oh. two o'clock? So much so, we're playing pool. We fell out, and we ended up fighting. <laughs> Him and I, <laughs> with the pool cues, right? We're chasing each other about with these pool cues. We had to be separated. rat asked. And thrown out. <laughs> and we wake up, we wake up the next day. Oh, shit. I think we're barred from the place that we're supposed to be undercover for the whole week. But we go back at lunchtime with the overalls on and all that. And the manager asks, what a state you guys were in. And we're very apologetic and cuddling each other. And, and they let us back in. So during the course of that week, the raid was on the Friday night when all the cops came in. And we didn't want to be there, but the boss insisted that we were there to identify the deal because yeah. they were selling everything in the world. You could buy anything in there at all. So they raid the place and they're all lined up and search, pockets turned out, handcuffs, the whole bit. And I always remember, because him and I were worried that they would that they would be shouting abuse at us. We're only wee boys. And uh, one of them's looking at me and shaking his head and I said, what's wrong? And he says... I don't believe that the police recruit guys like you. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first undercover job. <laughs> you made a good name for the police. Yeah, yeah. I was good at it. I yeah. was good at that. <laughs> See, the Americans, brilliant as well. I remember the American uh, Navy. They had a different name for it. You know, the forces have their bar. Yeah. Sergeant's mess. There was a sergeant's mess and all that. Well, the Americans of the place. And it was like a bit of America when you went in there. I'm sure they used dollars and I'm sure everything was Americanized. Yeah. It was a bit of home for them. Duty free. And it got broken into one night and the gantry and all the booze stolen. And the boss said to me, this is before that one actually, undercover, they said, go out tonight, come in and go in plain clothes and go out with Kenny and see if you can find what's happened, where the booze is. And we found it. I think we drank it as well. <laughs> <laughs> All we had was empties at the end of the day, but we knew what had happened to it. <laughs> was it four fe fellow Americans that stole it, or was it the English? I'm not sure Scottish. who actually stole it, but it ended up in the American's house. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, a few houses, because we were at every party in Campbelltown that night. Yeah. We were very sociable. We were very so I couldn't even remember where I'd left the CID car. I mean, got the actual bottles because you can identify the bottles from the, the American base. You know? yeah. So we knew we'd got the right houses. They were just all empty by the time we got them. <laughs> so are we going to Paul Ferris next or back to the 10% story? The 10% story was interesting because of that crossover yeah. Yeah, to the other side. And see, when you're down there dealing with drug addicts, right? I'm, I'm going to stop junkies because they're drug addicts, they're addicted and they're deliberately being addicted by people to make money from them. And the people that are making money from them are so well connected that they're being protected. Their whole industry is being protected by keeping it in the black market. Because you said a thing earlier on, legalise it. And it kind of flew about the room for a minute or two. But it's exactly what we need to do, yeah. is control it. We, we call them controlled drugs. We try to control the drugs. It's a market, which is, it's market for, everything's market forces, isn't it? it, it Supply and demand, and it's it, so, it's staring me so much in the face. This it's, is really powerful what you're saying right now, Simon, because we could say this all day long, and we're ex-cons, I'm a trafficker, and people say, yeah, that's good enough, well, for them to say, but coming from you, who was on the other side, yep. who's, who's learnt that through your own personal experience, I can't commend you enough because people are going to watch this now and they're going to go away. People who were previously undecided about that, they're going to go away and they go, you know what? Listening to Simon today, that's that's changed my perspective on, on, on drug laws and drug policy. And then they're going to start putting pressure on the government. It's the only way we're going to get changed the only way. in the world. Listen to us too. They'll just say, well, they've been there and done it, you know what I mean? They're just trying to fucking get out of it. There's lots of ex-cops out there that feel exactly the same. And we yeah. knew it. It wasn't. This wasn't something... This wasn't an opinion. 
this is a fact. I know for a fact that if we had made certain things and drawn certain lines, here's a fact I know. If we made heroin legal today, we would stop the drugs deaths in this country overnight because like, there's people like, like dying in the streets like Portugal did. because of corrupted heroin. Yeah. If we controlled it and made it proper heroin, I'll tell you something else. This is something people miss out, right? See, when I was in the police, I knew this for a fact. There's a culture. There's an addict culture. As in them, there's a language. There's an ang a language that police officers use. There's a language that doctors use, the jargon. Yeah. Accountants will have their own jargon. Podcasters and YouTubers have probably got their own jargon. Certainly, drug users have, and Big addicts line. really do. They could talk to each other and we wouldn't know what they're talking about. That whole culture, which is what it is, has grown from them being under the radar, doing something illegal. It's back to the teenage thing, isn't it? Yeah. See, if we legalised it, overnight, the attraction of it kind of disappears for new drug users. Oh, I'm allowed to do that. Oh, that's not so much fun after all. I need to go to the chemist to buy it. That's what they said in Holland. The parents were in the, you know, having the hash cakes in the cafes. Kids don't want to do what the parents are doing. No chance. No chance. It's like Facebook. Apparently they don't use Facebook anymore, the youngsters. <laughs> They're like, let's go on with that. We've taken it over. And the other thing is drug laws have created the biggest profit opportunity in the yeah. history of the world for organised crime. Yeah. Everything from the cartel violence now to knife crime in London are criminals competing over the black market profits. Yeah. See the story I told you about the heroin we took and buried? That's a nice example because that that was safe for us to take and bury because yeah. nobody's ever going to report it. If I steal your drugs, I'm safe because you can't go to the police. No, you can't. No. He stole my heroin. I beg your pardon. <laughs> 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 so that whole black market is unregulated entirely. We don't have any end to it. That's why you get tax man in it. Why you get like. Guys I'm surprised the revenue it. aren't all over it. There's a fortune to be made. If people are interested in this subject, then I urge you to go onto the website of L-E-A-P, Leap, and you'll see all kinds of testimonies, not just from cops. Um, they're supported by judges, prosecutors are saying war on drugs is a complete shakedown on the taxpayers, waste of money, reverse it, Nonsense. decriminalise, put all those resources to the use of police going after people who are hurting other people, not lower-level drug users. All right, Paul Ferris. Yes, Paul Ferris. I'm, I'm loath to leave that. You know that, Sean? Because it's so pertinent and so important. And yeah. it's been the same for 40 years. And it, the gap's got wider. And it's a shame to leave the subject, but we've covered it. They the knew from... The policymakers knew from alcohol prohibition that after 10 years, Al Capone's running around with his machine guns, crimes yeah. after... after yeah. They know it doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. But what they've done is they've learned to profit from it. These contracts, now private prisons and everything else, it's tens of billions a year. Can I say something controversial Go on. for your American audience? Because I read this recently, and I don't know how true it is or mm. anything. I've not done any research, but it just rang a bell in my head. Yeah. That uh, politicians, let's see, I don't know how many senators there are, three mm. or 400. Mm. And they're all God-fearing. They're all of faith. Yeah. Every one of them. In public. They go to church. They say the right things. They, all of that. Not one of them says, I'm an atheist. Because that would cost votes. But everybody must know that they're not all God-fearing. That that's just what they say. Fronts. Yeah. And drugs is the same. The, the government have got this policy and they all sit behind it. But they know the truth. Somehow we need to get through that and make, make them vote, but make, get them out of office. Scandinavian countries now have handed drug policy to people who are not getting voted into office. Because if you're getting voted into office, it's, yeah. it's the Nixon yeah. model. Yeah. I'm tough on crime, I've never done drugs, and we're going to throw those scumbag drug addicts into prison, blah, blah, to get votes. Yeah. But there's a change now, because uh, in, in, the young people are coming up and they are wise to all this. We call that old generation the drug war dinosaurs, and they're dying off. So it, it, the floodgate is open. Look at America did the war on drugs, but now look at the weed policy, the state level. It's the people yeah. voting for it, yeah. not the politicians. Yeah. It's the people overthrowing it. What's your view on Trump? I like him personally. I thought you might. <laughs> well, you're going to get, get trolled for saying that. <laughs> no, I do. I like Trump. Let's not go down that road. I'd rather, <laughs> Paul, Ferris. Rather Paul Ferris. Paul Ferris. <laughs> <laughs> I understood Paul. <laughs> and I'd like to say as well, uh, my publishing company, Gadfly Press, um, recently published Paul Ferris's audio book. I will put the link in the description box below this video. We'd love to get Paul on the podcast. 
if he's up for it. And I urge people to go down and get check out his audio. But it was done by a Scottish narrator. Mm-hmm. As, as charismatic, charismatic as Simon here today and, and comprehensible to uh, U- USA audiences. We've had Blinky on. Much love and respect to Blinky. Doing Blinky's book here soon too. <laughs> <laughs> Before I tell you the Paul Ferris story, I yeah. should say, with my serious detective police face on, yeah. that when I joined, I met an old inspector who said that he didn't use nicknames for criminals. He used their proper names. names. He wouldn't give them the respect. And that, that stuck with me my whole career. And I used that, that demonstration, even in court, Paul. Most, most people giving evidence in court speak to the procurator fiscal and give their evidence in chief. Yeah. And then the defence lawyer stands up and cross-examines you. And what most people do is speak to the fiscal and then speak to the, the solicitor. The solicitor asks you questions. I never ever did that. When the, I'd speak to you, you're my pal, you're the prosecutor, and when he stood up to question me, I would turn and face the sheriff, the boss, who's taking notes, and he would, oh. and he's asking me the question, but I'm answering him, who's I'm answering to anyway, or yeah. the jury. The last person I'm going to look at is the solicitor. It was brilliant. He got so angry. It's a good angry. head game, too. So angry. It yeah. is a very good head and game. And he would become my pal. He would help me with my evidence. Yeah. And he became the enemy. It was mm. clever. It's good. It's good stuff. What was the question? Paul we, Ferris. Wee man. The wee man. Yeah. So, I, I, nicknames and all that. I did, even films. See films about the great train robbery and all yeah. that. I don't watch that. I, I don't like uh, glorifying crime at all. Right? Have you seen Wee Man's Especially, movie? No, I haven't. But I'm going to tell you a story from it because apparently the Sun said last week, I told them this wee story that I'm going to tell yeah. you, and they said, oh, it's in Paul's memoir, Paul Ferris's yeah. memoir. So he's told, and apparently it's in the film, a version of it, but films are always. So it's dead straightforward. I, I was a young detective in Rossi now. I had done a few months in Campbelltown when I got moved to the island of Rossi, uh, of Butte, uh, the town of Rossi on the island of Butte. So I'm the only detective on the island. And I got a phone call one day from uh, the chief super or super at the Swedish crime squad um, and said, OK, son, can you do us a favour? We're looking for this car. It was a Daimler. Uh, and here's the address. I don't want you to do anything. Just see if the car's there and see if any lights come on when it gets dark in half. And it gets dark very early in Scotland, you know, but now... <laughs> <laughs> So I did that. I had a need to, a more need to the CID by now. And we went down. The car was there. I didn't know what it was about at this point. And the light came on. It was obviously occupied. It was a flat, top flat again. Oh, was it oh, top, top flat? flat oh. didn't it, were you? <laughs> <laughs> and I went back and phoned Pitt Street and the police headquarters and told the, the chief super. And he said, right, there's a, a ferry coming in at six o'clock, half past six. There's going to be four serious crime squad officers on it. I want you to meet them. They'll have this car take them to the police station, they'll have firearms, check the firearms, get the boss to meet them and then show them some digs for the night and then they're going to, and I need you to get a warrant for that address, right? So by the time they came over, I had done all that, had the warrant, had them in a hotel um, and the warrant was for this house and then I found out that it was Paul, that was Paul Ferris that was in the flat. Ah. I yeah. just want to say something for the viewers who are not familiar with Paul, who he was at that moment in time. He was a... Uh, he was a uh, gangster. <laughs> he was feared mainly among his own because he was a pretty ruthless guy, allegedly. Um, he was part of the, the criminal world in Glasgow and there was other families involved and a history involved that had gone in the Glasgow schemes that had gone on for a number of years, power struggles within... Uh, the, for control of drugs markets and whatnot, and that, and and Paul had been an enforcer for one of those families. That's how he had started off, because he was ruthless. He was there's no question of that. He had, and and you maybe understand that better when I've told you the story that he had this um, calmness about him that uh, that I never saw uh, anything other than. So the story is that they come over, they've got their guns, and off we go, and I don't get a gun. I'm, an, I'm a firearms officer at this point, but my boss on the island said, no gun for you, because he knew the serious crime squad, right? You just stay in the background and do exactly what you're told, but don't get involved in anything if you can help it, okay? I'm only a young boy. 
So off we go. There's a, cu- there's a couple of de- detective sergeants, two or three detective sergeants in the DC, all tooled up. We go to the flat, warrant in hand. When they go to the door, I'm, I'm peeking. That's a good Scottish word. I'm peeking. Peeking would be your word for it, round the, the stairwell. Yeah. Out the road. Because I've got no gun. <laughs> 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 and they chart the door. Paul comes to, Paul Ferris comes to the door and he's got a night gown, a, a dressing gown on. I could really wind him up here and say he had a goonie on. <laughs> goonie. <laughs> <Made> his underwear. <laughs> no, he didn't. He had, a, he had a dressing gown on. And they opened the door and grabbed him and put him down. And he's on the ground and they've all got their guns out, as far as I remember, all pointing at his head. And they, all I remember is seeing the guns doing this. Because in Scotland, in the UK, we don't use guns that often. It's very seldom that you actually draw a gun on someone, and never at that kind of range. Yeah. yeah. Unless you want a confession from them or something. No, that's a joke. So they're all... That wasn't a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said a gun in your head. <laughs> 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 I do know a detective in Glasgow who had a great clearance rate and that's how he was doing it but that's another story entirely um, so, so you see the shaking because they're not used to doing this yeah, and the and fingers are on Ferris. the trigger it's Paul Ferris and the fingers are on the trigger well, like. I would assume so yeah <gasps> and he's <laughs> Ferris is on his back looking at them pinned to the ground with his guns Please, 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 please. We're all in suits, remember? Yeah. And all I remember is seeing Paul looking at the, the guns and saying, is that a snub nose? D8, Smith & Wesson. <laughs> and he was as calm as I am now, calmer. And they're going, shut up, shut up. You're under arrest. You're being detained. <laughs> all right, OK, calm down. <laughs> Not a nerve in his body. <laughs> cool as a cucumber. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know uh, Paul Ferris. I've met him a few times in circumstances like that and seen him at court and stuff. But cool. And, and the story, I've investigated crimes that he's been allegedly there or thereabouts. And it's always the same as this uh, deadpan, it's only a wee guy. And in those days, the wee man was one thing. That's what the film was called. Yeah. But most cops that I knew that had ever dealt with Paul Ferris said that Babyface was another name that they had for him in those days because he looked like a wee boy. You loved the film, there was, you? Yeah, the movie. There was excellent. nothing big about You know, he wasn't a big... You know, it wasn't threatening or intimidating yeah. physically. The guy who was actually... Enfor- in his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> the guy he was actually enforcing for in the movie... He um, ends up later on in the movie killing his son. Okay, it's a good plug for the movie. <laughs> I mean, that whole world, we're not really in that mode to go down that underworld and that, the ice cream wars and all that stuff that was all going on at that time. Organised. See, we, Well, that was just all too, too much for a Conetto, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> He's going to burst into song again, isn't it? <laughs> Any excuse? Just walk on a toe. <laughs> oh dear. So yeah, so we, like, like I was saying, we'd love to have Paul on and yeah. check out his audio book and his and his book in general. It's available worldwide, and I'll put the link below the description box. It's available worldwide on Amazon. The punchline to that story, not yeah. the punchline. Paul was was charged. He was found with an amount of cocaine. Possession of coke. Allegedly. And he got not proven at court. Brilliant. That night. And the punchline to that is I get asked all the time, because I was there, I get asked to search his car. No, yeah. I get told to search his car. I've never searched anything as well as I searched Paul Ferris's car that night, because I was sure I was, bound to f- I was supposed to find something. And it went to court. I wasn't cited because I had no part to play in it. The four senior detectives, serious crime squad detectives, gave their evidence and the jury saw fit to find Paul not guilty based on the evidence. How did they fuck up then? They must have fucked up somehow. Well, that's exactly what happened because most people say to me, oh, they tried to fit him up, didn't they? No, they somehow they fucked up. And my they? point is that if they'd been going to fit him up, who do you think would have found the drugs? Exactly, yeah. They'd have put the drugs where I would find them and I'd have gone to court all day long. And the jury might have believed me because I was only a young detective. They put it down as an illegal search or something. Yeah. They fucked up because 
they got drunk that night afterwards. There was carry on in the beach and the guns were carried yeah. and all sorts of things going on. It was the usual serious drinking squad. See if you, <laughs> I'm serious. See if you take a Glasgow, anyone in Glasgow out with Glasgow, they think they're on frigging holiday. <laughs> <laughs> they do. See the minute the bus leaves the Glasgow boundary, all you hear up the back is tch, tch, Yeah, tch, yeah. As the cans of tenants lager are getting opened. It's like me being down here, I'm on holiday. <laughs> So I think the four of them came over. That hotel that night was a riot. And I don't think they did their job properly. I think they were unprofessional. That's exactly, they fucked up. That's yeah, exactly what I mean, happened. that is like... That's Scottish story. That is still alive, are you? I'd love to hear all of his stories from his own mouth and see what he says the truth is. Yeah. And we don't give police like, information away, like addresses, by the way, so... <laughs> <laughs> Don't be asking. <laughs> so, so we're going from one Paul to another McCartney. Oh, and we're going back in time. Yeah. Young detective, Campbelltown. Paul living on the farm in the Mull of Kintyre with his uh, good lady, Linda, and the kids. And everyone knew he was there. He was there every summer. And my excuse was, right, I'm 20, 23, about 23 just trying to be a detective, trying to aspire to a young detective. And I'm on my own, and Lennon, uh, John Lennon had been shot probably six months before or something like that in New York. So my excuse, and that's all it is, guys, nothing better than that is an excuse of a young guy to go and try and meet Paul McCartney. Why right? not? But I've got a warrant card that says I'm a policeman, so... Fuck it, we're in. <laughs> <laughs> so I drove the old Cartina, right, the old Mark III Cartina up the, the road to his farm and I nearly took the sump out of it that day. It was some road. And then there's guys with shotguns. Yes, can I help you? CID, it's private land, nobody's allowed on, but I managed to blag my way in. Right? Yeah. What did you so say? I've got to see Paul. A security matter. Top security. It was. I wanted to make sure. Oh, What I missed was that there was a, a show on the next day. It's called the July Show. And it's always held in August. <laughs> Don't ask me why. It's gone to show you. I should have said that. It's held in a place called Peterson Park. It's like Helen Games that are on, yeah. vets that are on all over the country. And this is a big farmer's show kind of thing when there's a horsey bit where people ride their horses and their kids, there's cable throwing and there's tents, beer tents, lots of beer and tents and guys going about selling sheep and coos and all that. Right, it's a farm show and it's a big deal. And they always go to it, or they always used to go to it, the McCartneys, because they love the horses. Yeah, like oh. a traveller's market. It wasn't a market, it was a show, they sure. call it a show, maybe um, there must have been cattle and things on yeah. display as well. So It's terrible that I can't think exactly what, how to describe it. But a fete is how it was described in the sun. But they go, and that's why I'm there to see them, to see what their movements are the next day. Because yeah. remember, John Lennon had been shot. So I'm a thorough detective. I want to know what their movements are going to be so that I can make sure the police arrangements are... Nobody gave a shit, the truth be told. So I eventually get to the farmhouse. Even the farm manager, Mr Cairns, Bobby Cairns, told me, what are you going up there for? You know, he's not interested. Just I said, I'm going to tell you. It's about tomorrow. Can't discuss it. I need to kill you. And off I go. So I get to the farmhouse, get out of the CID car, and Linda McCartney comes out. And she's got a face like thunder, right? Mm. You guys won't remember the rep that they had back in the day, that she had back in the day, the press, the media, everybody hated her. Of course she was with Paul McCartney. It was she kind of was burgers she made, they were fucking horrible. <laughs> 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 Maybe that was why, the veggie burgers. They were fucking what, disgusting. We had her time, actually, wasn't she? I don't mind them. <laughs> <laughs> There are other burgers available. Yeah. <laughs> Big Mac, <laughs> McDonald's. <laughs> so she says, yes, can I help you? And I thought, the warden card draw was a trick. CID. That only made things ten times worse. Because Paul had been done over in Japan or something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, time, yeah, yeah, so that only made things. She said, and why are you here? What do you want? And I don't know if I can say this on your show. But I shat myself, right? <laughs> my, my bottle just went, because she really, this is Paul McCartney's wife yeah. in my face asking me why I'm outside his farmhouse. And I'm mumbling, it was a, the show tomorrow, and all the time I'm backing off to get back in the car because I'm out of my depth here. Totally 
out of my depths as anyone probably would be. And for some reason, maybe I was I was probably red in the face as well, right? And probably a wee bit of that. For whatever reason, she said, do you want to meet Paul? And I said, <laughs> <laughs> come on and get a cup of tea. She must have oh, realised. Have... I wasn't much older than her oldest child at that time. Yeah. Do, Heather, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe five years between us. And she's looked at me and thought, that's Fanny, you're probably you know. seeing through the ID bit <laughs> yeah. as well, you know what I mean? And I'm on my own. Yeah. And cops on their own are always less <laughs> intimidating. She takes me in, and honest to God, guys, it's quite surreal the next hour, right, that I'm with him, and he takes me a wee tour of the farmhouse, shows me his studio, a bit like this with the amps and stuff, but they're all switched on. And he explained to me that you've got to keep it at an ambient temperature for the tuning and all the rest of it. Right. Uh, and him and I clicked like that. So wow. much so that I said to him, uh, I was playing in a band at the time, and I said, listen, we're playing a wee gig on, uh, tomorrow night. You, you're welcome to come in for a pint. And he, he, he humoured me and said, yeah, that might, that might be a good idea. I don't think he ever had any intentions of doing that. But so, we got on so well that I believed for that wee while that he might come in. I was looking for him while we were playing. But he didn't yeah. have the arrogance. Someone would say, oh, fuck off or whatever. You know what no, I mean? no, no, he no. Because him that. and I did get on. You know yeah. we, you know how you just get on with some people? Him and I got on really well. We're at the same level of humour. And and uh, I'm walking around his farmhouse looking at the piano from Magical Mystery Tour and stuff like that. His wee boy, Jamie, was about three or two at the time, and he told me a story. Paul took her round the table in the kitchen, and Paul's telling stories. And the wee boy kept saying, pig, pig. And Paul said, listen, that's not you he's talking to. That's just the word of the week, you know, on the <laughs> yeah. farm. Yeah. And he said he was watching telly the other night, and Top of the Pops was on, and it was some single that McCartney had out. And the wee boy was looking at the telly, and then looking at his dad, and looking at the telly, and then looking at his dad. And eventually he said, Dad, are you Paul McCartney? <laughs> <laughs> so I could go on all day about my visit, right? Because I met Paul McCartney. But I came out, back to the car, and Paul follows me. And he says, Simon, just a wee word. And he brings a plastic bag out of his pocket. And it's got a packet of John Player special cigarettes in it. And he says, I found this this morning, about half a mile over the hill when I was out horse riding. And I wondered if you could get it checked out. I thought I might have seen the, the blinker binocular or something, you know. It's the middle of summer. Just get it to Interpol or whatever and get it checked out. I think it was me that said Interpol, actually, because I watch telly as well, you know. So no problem, Mr McCartney. I'll get this dealt with as a priority. Stalker on the farm. So I'm away. And the next day, that's in my desk, right? I probably smoked the fags. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but the next day, I'm at the show. And uh, I'm walking past where Paul is in his Land Rover with his Glasgow Herald newspaper, reading it, and there's at least 80 people, maybe 100, staring at him. He's behind a, a, a roped off area, reading his paper, and all these people are just staring, because it's Paul McCartney. Yeah. And I'm walking behind them, suited and booted. I'm at the show now. This is the show. And Linda's riding with the horses and the kids and whatnot. And I'm walking behind and I look over and all I hear is, Simon, how are you? And it's Linda McCartney. <laughs> and ev every head in the crowd turns around <laughs> to look at me. Guys, see if I could just go back in time. I've so many smart things I should have said. You know? <laughs> Don't bother me, Linda, I'm working or whatever. But uh, I didn't, I just giggled. And, <laughs> 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 and little did I know it would be the last time I would ever get a chance to speak to her, you know. They're very wow. famous people, wow. aren't they? Very famous people. So I'm coming world. out of the show, heading back to the CID car after waving to Linda, and I see a car sitting with a local farmer's girl in it. And next to her in the passenger seat is Heather McCartney. And they're both seats back, feet up in the dash, Having a fag. <laughs> and I went up to the window, which was rolled down, and I said, Heather, she went, oh, you're the policeman that was up at the farm? Because I had been the celebrity at the farm. The kids were firing questions at me. Yeah. And Paul was saying, I remember getting pulled up in Liverpool with the... I was, he was driving an E-Type when he was 17 or something in Liverpool and oh, got Jack. pulled up. I was, yeah. yeah. So she says, you were at the farm, you were up to see my dad. I said, that's right. And your dad doesn't know that you smoke, do you? And her face went, Shoo. I don't know her fags. 
The John Player Special. And I said, I bet you it's John Player Special. Oh. Went, How did you know that? <laughs> I said, because you throw them away on your way home at night. Stop it. Because he thinks there's someone stalking the pharaoh. <laughs> and I never told him. Because wow. I thought, what's the point in putting him? He's guard yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's guard up, isn't it? <laughs> and he's still alive. So it worked. So every Liverpudlian has got me to thank for Sir Paul McCartney still being about. <laughs> <after him. laughs> when you read about that Paul McCartney thing, when I read the, the, this bit here, I, I don't know where I got it from, but I always thought there was a, a, like a, a Scottish gangster called Paul McCartney too. Not to my knowledge. No. Because although it's Paul McCartney and I'm in Liverpool and all that, it was about Linda. She was a beautiful person, you know that? She yeah. really, really was. She made me feel just part of the whole thing. In our family, you could sense the, the mother in her. Yeah. Regardless of wealth or anything, she was just a beautiful person. Even if her sausages were shit, she was a lovely person. <laughs> <laughs> They've only got Peter's work. Allegedly, I never said that. I said the burgers were shit. <laughs> 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 so what was it like to move to Glasgow and join the serious crime squad? It was uh, it was different. An eye-opener. Because I was young. I was only a young cop, a detective. And I think it was on the back of that incident with Paul Ferris. It was not long after that that I got the phone call and got told that I was going. <clears throat> and when I, was, when I got there, I was very much out of water because they were all seasoned detectives, like I explained earlier. And someone coming from the sticks like me was unheard of. Although I had been born and bred in Glasgow, I was always from the sticks. Because I had got transferred from Argyle, from the county, into the city, the city cops always assumed that I was from that area, not from Glasgow. So it was different. And the first day I get told what everybody gets told when they start a new job, you know, keep your ears and eyes open and your mouth tightly shut. Stay away from the gobbles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you become a serious crime squad firearms officer. Do you want to explain to people what the serious crime squad is? Yeah. Or was. It's changed name now, like everything else. It's all uh, slightly revamped now. But basically the job will be the same for some elite squad now, that when a murder or a serious incident occurs in an area like Birmingham the other night, then the resources required to deal with that to canvas the, the shops, to get the witness statements, to examine the locus, to do all of that. The inquiry can sometimes spread far and wide and probably will do in that case. And there's too much work for the local detectives to cope with because everyday policing goes on regardless. Yeah. So you, you've got a supplementary that comes in and murder squad, whatever you want to call them. We were the serious crime squad and that's a team of experienced detectives who can come in and deal with the inquiry together with a few of the detectives from the local... Just watch the Sweeney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> what, what serious crimes did you initially have to tackle? Mostly murders. Uh, but anything that, uh, that would take you out with your area. A uh, Liverpool one. We had a case where <laughs> somebody was poisoning food, baby food, oh. in Marks and Spencer's. Oh. He, had, he, he had said he had put... I don't remember this, what year was He had this? injected... Oh, shit. They wanted, it was a blackmail thing, well, was Listen, it? I was drunk for all these years. I don't was remember. Was this the 80s? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like Ronnie Wood. Somebody asked Ronnie Wood, what were you doing in, in those 10 years? And he said, hey, ask my biographer, don't ask And me. put broken glass or something in it. It was poison. Poison, poison. Yeah. poison. He'd injected, because yeah. you could put a needle through. And, That's a recall. Uh, and Maybe had, food, didn't they? Yeah. But uh, this happened a few times. But this guy phoned up Martin Spencer's and said, I've poisoned baby food in Liverpool, and I've done the same in Glasgow. Uh, or I've done the same and elsewhere, but I'm not going to tell you where until I get the money. How much do you want? And it was something very specific. It wasn't 10 million, it was 123,642 and 20 pounds or something, you know? Oh, something does, very... that, does that indicate mental illness? No, it indicated debt that we found out later <laughs> on. <Yeah. laughs> he was only trying to pay his wife's lifestyle off. Right? Oh. But we found that out later on. But it was a panic station at the time. Um, and on the day, he'd said uh, the money's to be at the, the back door of Marks and Spencer's in Glasgow, right? In Renfrew Street, Renfield Street, Renfrew Street in Glasgow. And uh, I'll appear there at 10 o'clock and the guy on the desk, the customer service desk, is to hand over a bag 
of £120,000 and so many pens. Uh, and then I'll tell you where the poisoned food is and you can get it off the shelves and we'll all move on with our lives and live happily ever after. How do you think he was so, going to get away with that? <laughs> well, he, wa he wasn't a Ned, as it transpired, right? He was just a, a guy that had got into the show. Yeah. But on the day, at the appointed time, it's a, a sergeant that's on the desk and in plain clothes dressed as a Marks and Spencer's customer service and we had plotted up round about it, right? We were in a van not far away looking through a hole in the back. When you've got a tiny, tiny hole like that, an aperture like that, and you look at it, you can see the whole street. You could never see it from the outside, but it, oh, it's the same looking into a room or whatever. But we had a guy, the funny part of this is there's a guy, George, uh, I called him Baldrick from television because he was always like Baldrick, you know, he was always dressed like... Warren Atkinson's Baldrick. Yeah, yeah. great, undercover, Adder. great Adder. undercover guy, yeah. But George was a street sweeper that day, sweeping the streets of Glasgow with his trolley, you know, the trolley they use and the overalls, council worker. And it was pissing down, right? It was really raining like it only can in Glasgow. And, uh, and George is out there sweeping the street. He's the only street, street sweeper in the country that would work in these conditions, but he's giving it lardy. Loving sweeping it. the street, yeah. And sure enough, uh, a motorbike draws up, a courier motorbike, and the guy goes into the reception desk and says, I have to collect such and such for Mr. Such and Such. And this was what the guy had done. He'd sent a motorbike courier to pick up the money. So can, we were speaking about arrests later earlier on. Remember how when yeah. somebody gets arrested? Well, can you imagine this guy getting arrested? See, when he saw us running towards him, he was probably so relieved to find out that we were police officers because they probably came from everywhere. The guy jumps over the desk. <laughs> we're coming in the doors. The street sweeper's coming at him with a brush. Everybody's jumping on him, and he's Poor so guys on less than minimum wage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's only the courier. Oh, I'm only the courier. I have to pick this stuff up. Where are you going? Really? We got him back to the police station. He had to go to Edinburgh Airport to hand us over at such and such a terminal, at such and such a meeting point. He was to take the money, and that's where the guy was that would get his. So we You're swapped. In a race against time. Yeah, now. yeah, but we did, yeah, and we swapped. Uh, his motorbike for ours, right? And, and we had a, cy a motorcyclist, off we went, and we all teamed through to Edinburgh and just a mad rush, you know. Everyone thinks police operations are all finally planned, and, fin and they are if you've got notice. Yeah. But I would suggest in situations in the crime squad, things happen like that. One minute you're sitting having a fag and a cup of tea, and the next minute all hell has let loose, and it's mayhem. And that's where the training comes in. I've got another good story about that. We were shooting as well. But so off we went through to Edinburgh Airport and George Baldrick, uh, he was on the motorbike. He was on mo one of our motorbike drivers. But he didn't hang about. Straight into the terminal. We are all coming in at different angles behind him and George went straight up. The guy's waiting for him. George went straight up and said, Mr. Such, and he had the bag in that hand. It was beautiful. He had the bag with the cash in it in that hand, supposedly. Mr. Such and Such, yes. And as he put his hand out to take the bag, George went like that with a handcuff. Click. Wow. You're nicked. Wow. <laughs> and then That's we classy. all went, <laughs> the oh, panic again. Shit. Yeah. What a story. And he was a businessman who had got into debt. He'd got into serious debt, hadn't told his wife. He lived in the West End of Glasgow, a beautiful bungalow. And he, if he'd got that 123 grand, it would have done no more than kept him going for another year. You know, it would just have yeah. cleared his feet. It wasn't a case like, I've always said, if you're going to do something, do it right. You know what I mean? A life-changing thing. If you're not going to do it for a million, don't do it at all. Yeah, I'm along with that, Peter. What yeah. are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> so there's another story that involved a shooting. Yeah, this was a surveillance unit again in the serious crime squad. We were talking about serious crime. The serious crime squad gave birth to the surveillance, uh, Strathclyde Police Surveillance Unit, which was a branch of the serious crime squad, but as its name says on the tin, yeah. we were only doing surveillance on serious uh, major index criminals, we would call them back in the day. <coughs> Your Ferris and all the rest of it, you know, would come under that, but more robberies, more violent crime. <coughs> Excuse me terrorist stuff and, and then you start working with special branch and you start working with different uh, sometimes you don't know who you're working for 
you know. You get told, this is the guy, Paul Atwood, he'll be at a studio on such and such a date. This is what he's driving just now, if he can get it fixed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're here, plotted up, and we follow you for the next two or three days. And sometimes we didn't even know why. <laughs> it's Sean, by the way, not Paul. Sean. <laughs> oh, Paul Ferris. Paul, Paul Ferris. Paul, Paul McCartney. Ferris, there we go. <laughs> In fact, one day we ended up here. Following the night. I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> we one round. Night, Dr. Evil. <laughs> one night we followed this Irishman from Glasgow around about and we ended up in Liverpool that night in a hotel in Liverpool. And we had nothing. We had no luggage or anything. One of the boys detoured to a chemist and got us some razors and bits and bobs. The guy got on a ferry and we were told to leave him that he'd be picked up at the other end. Uh, you can write your own story around what, what he was up to. And it was back in the 80s, remember? Oh. But we were stranded in Liverpool at midnight with, with just the clothes we had on. So we went to a nice hotel. You always went to a nice hotel when the police were paying. And I remember the bellboy coming up and saying, uh, where's your luggage? And then one of the lads said, this is it. And it was the bag with the razors, <laughs> <laughs> shaving foam. Super drug or somewhere. Don't worry about a change Woolies. of clothes. I'm changing with Sean. Sean's changing with Peter. Yeah. Peter's changing with... <laughs> and we went out that night to a club in Liverpool. You'll know the club. You'll definitely know the club. And we're having a beer. And one Not of the state. I don't know. I don't know. One of the lads said, uh, there's a bird over there got her eye on me. The Grafton room. And we're all like that. And she was stunning, right? She's standing near the bar, and sure enough, she was eyeing him up and winking and giving him the, the signs. So we goaded him on to go over and buy a drink and speak to her. So off he goes, and about five minutes later comes back, ashen-faced, right? Totally bottled it completely. Rosie. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? She says, oh, man. she came over and she said, yeah, she took a drink, and she said, uh, here's the deal. You and I go back to my place. And, and you can have me. Then, my friend here has you. There's a big guy standing behind her. <laughs> about six foot six, built at the side of a house. And he was going to have Paul afterwards. His name was Paul as well. <laughs> so that was Liverpool. That was a, a Liverpool experience. So, so they you do could it. end up anywhere <laughs> in surveillance. You could end up anywhere in the country at all, just at the drop of a hat. No, he didn't. No, he no. bought it completely. I wouldn't mind. I, I'd like a job like that, though. Or you could just end up like anywhere you'd want to. You know what I mean? See that randomness of the police. That's what police officers like. Yeah. That you could be sitting one minute doing nothing, sitting in the car dozing, and the next minute on your radio you're going to a fire, you're going to a road accident, you're going to a fight, you're going to something. Well, that's, what, that's what we like, the randomness yeah. when we're running yeah. around Arizona. Yeah. We're not too far apart, no. really, psychologically. Yeah. So the story with the, the shooting was that we were pl there was a guy doing 23 years for robberies, mm -hmm. and he escaped. And the drug squad had got word of three addresses that he was supposed to be at, one or the other. They didn't know which one. And they gave us an address to look at because they didn't have enough resources to cover the three houses. So they gave the surveillance unit one of the houses to look at. So I can see how cynical you are. We're thinking they gave us the third house. What's the chances of that bearing fruit? They'd keep the goodies for themselves. They wouldn't share a packet of crisps with the serious crime squad. So the chances of us ever getting involved in this yeah. are nil. So I'm in the car. I'm in the passenger seat. I've got no gun. My neighbour has, because usually it was one in the car, but he's driving. It should always be the passenger who's tooled up. But Willie's got the gun. Uh, and we're sitting having a cup of tea that we'd just got out of cafe and a fag. And it's three o'clock in the afternoon and we're plotted around this tenement flat in Glasgow, like a close, we would call it in Glasgow, but it's three in a story. And at three o'clock, our man appears in an XR3. The man himself that's doing the time for, for robberies and has escaped. Now, this guy has been stopped before by the police and he produced a shotgun, sawn off, and told the police if they didn't get out of his way, he would kill them. And they did get out of its way. They were traffic cops, so it wouldn't have done any harm if he'd shot them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think that should be an Olympic sport, actually. <laughs> <laughs> them and wardens. <laughs> but the scaredy traffic cops let him go anyway. Uh, so he's going to kill a cop. He's he said he's not going to be taken alive, right? All this shit that they say. But this guy might have been real. So uh, we're plotted up, and he appears, and he opens the, the back of the 
of the car and he's loading his gear in. So he's going to leave this address. This is him making his big escape. So the plan was that we would hit him. If he appeared, we would arrest him. But just on three o'clock, ding a ling a ling a ling a ling the primary school across the street, directly across the street, comes out. Uh, and you can't kids the kids everywhere. Can you? Mm. Young kids running yeah. about. And parents picking their kids up. And this guy's going to shoot a cop. Mm. So there's no way we can hit him there. Apart from anything else, the kids would start asking you, are you a policeman? And you'd have to go down on your knees and say, yes, I am, and show mm. them your handcuffs and all that. Yeah. Anyway, we follow him. And we follow him through the streets of Glasgow. But he's only doing 30 mile an hour, and it's very hard to follow someone who sticks to the speed limit because nobody else does. <laughs> we follow him. And by the time he gets to a quiet suburb, where I, I've got a flat quite near to there now, we are the lead car. Willie driving, me in the passenger seat. And I've got no gun. Willie's got the gun. All I've got is a baseball bat. And we turn into a side street, Riverside, and it's a very quiet residential, and the call comes from behind us to hit him now. Now, what I should have said was our DI was out that day as well. He never came out, but he must have thought it's a lot of shit as well. He's out and he's got a gun. And he's in the car behind us with the gun in his lap. Now, as the, the target car moves along the street, Willie overtakes it and pulls in front of it and forces him into the curb and up against the wall. Right? It's an accident. He forces him. Crash. I jump out of the car with my baseball bat and I jump onto his bonnet of his car and start smashing his windscreen to distract him because he said he's going to shoot a police officer, but he's going to not shoot him with his hands up here. And everybody else is going to do something similar. It's all bang, bang, bang. It's all over. We get him handcuffed both sides. These things always happen. He's got a seatbelt on and he's handcuffed on both sides. It becomes a Rubik's Cube puzzle to try and get him out of the car. <laughs> but get but the we do get him off. out of the car and he's arrested. I run up to the end of the street and stop any cars coming in. And behind us, there's a whole convoy of surveillance unit cars that have come in behind us and seen all this unfolding in front of us, all my colleagues. So I'm stopping traffic coming in, the uniforms, we can hear two tones everywhere, police are converging on us. And Willie Wilson, who'd been my driver, comes up and says, big man, the DI lost it. He was trying to shoot him. I said, what are you talking about? When I jumped out of the car, the car behind me had rammed him as well. We'd forced him into the side and the car behind had rammed him. Everybody thinking distract him from getting to his gun if he's yeah. got one. When he rammed him, the DI's gun had gone off <gasps> and he'd shot a hole through his windscreen. And the ballistics boys reckoned that I was on the bonnet when this happened and it probably missed me about a foot or so. They found a bullet in a garden hundreds of yards away because the DI was sitting with his gun cocked and his finger on the trigger. He didn't know that the, that the guy driving was going to ram him. <laughs> Willie driving my car with the gun. He had stopped the car. I jumped out because he's still got a handbrake and got to wait till the car's... So he's maybe five seconds behind me. He does that and goes to get out and sees the, the bullet hole and hears the report of the gun. Bang! And thinks, fuck, he's trying to shoot him. He's trying to shoot the, the Ned. So Willie gets out of her car, runs across the street and jumps over a hedge into a garden. Now that hedge was over six foot tall. Six foot three inches. Because our convoy's coming in and saw Willie running across and clearing the hedge. That was a world record at that time. He cleared it. <laughs> <laughs> you were lucky, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. So what, kind, the wind what kind of a sentence did that guy get? A lot. A lot. I, don't, I don't remember that. Did you think he was going to go full on roll, roll moat? Yeah, and in those days you didn't get the old half time and all that, you know, you actually yeah. did some serious time back yeah. in the day. Yeah. We don't have room for them anymore because we put all the uh, addicts in jail. <laughs> True. Yeah. So you were moving up into these bigger crimes and another world famous one to this day that you were on, the Lockerbie bombing? Mm-hmm. I wasn't on it for very long. Yeah. Luckily. We had the scene. Uh-huh. I was oh, actually night Jesus. shift when it happened. I was night shift when it happened. Oh, I was in Pitt Street. Yeah. I think on my own. There might have been two of us, but we were just a night shift when the call came oh, in. 
Yeah. And the call was for all resources, what we could send. They asked for a specific number of uh, detectives to be sent down, and I had to phone the super at 2 or 3 in the morning, yeah. tell them what had occurred. No internet in those days, remember, as well, so it was all TV and whatnot. And I got the, the ledger out, which was a duty roster, mm. with all the, all the names and went through them, and he told me who was to go, and we sent maybe four cars down. And, uh, at that time. What was it like on the ground? It's maybe the hardest thing to describe to you, Sean. Again, it's just my recollection. Everybody will have their own. But I know lots of cops that went by the board after, as a result of it. I've got a good friend that got done for shoplifting about a year after it. Promise and he, and it was stealing a pound's worth of screws. It was something stupid. But it, whose mind had gone on it. Yeah. Did we have post-traumatic in those days? I don't even know if we knew that term. I don't think soldiers even got, got that kind of therapy. Back to that old one, isn't it? People asking us to do things on their behalf, like deal yeah. with this, and not putting the resources in place to help deal with the consequences of it, because there are consequences. Same as Alzheimer's, because like years ago, I well, died of old age, was going a bit nutty, but they didn't even didn't right. have Alzheimer's, did they really? I don't remember it. It's a modern thing to me. Yeah. We we would say, oh, he's got, he's do wally. It's do a lally, yeah, do yeah. We've got that up here, yeah. Okay, yeah. Your, old, your old granddad's gone do lally. Yeah, Aye. yeah. He's a bit round the bend and all that stuff. We had terms for it. But families were much closer then and they would tend to look after older people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas now it's a different environment we're in entirely. So can you take us through the, the assignment then, the day, what it was like? Lockerbie? Yeah. I was only there, I think I was there the first five days, maybe a week. But the thing I was going to, because there's nothing I can tell you that you that you don't already know in your mind, because <clears throat> it was all going through our minds, <clears throat> about the, the death that these people had suffered, and we get told that they were unconscious coming down and all that, but I don't know if that was to, to make it more palatable for us all to deal with. But the thing I could convey, I mean, it, we've been in mortuaries and things, but when you see... That many people laid out, you know, that's a different... Then you get into Vietnam quarters and things like that where you become numb to it, I suppose, yeah. after a certain length of time. What, what I'm going to try and convey to you is I remember going to Carstairs Hospital in Scotland, which is a, a hospital for criminally insane, if we still have that word. But if you've lost the plot completely uh, and you're violent and dangerous, then that's where you would end up, right? Like Broadmoor? It's, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's straight jacket stuff and drugs and treatment and whatnot. You're really not coming out of there um, for a very long time anyway. And I remember visiting there, <sighs> visiting, going to take a statement of someone there, right? It was a murder inquiry. And we got to the main door, CID, right, OK, and we had to empty our pockets completely. Everything, chains, jewellery, anything that could be used as a weapon, weapon. right, comes off. Radios, everything. And then we were told, right, here's where you're going. You go out that door, turn right and then left, and that's it on the map where you're heading. You'll be on camera the whole time. There's never a place in there, a bit in there where you're not on camera, and you're going to the third wing, the third uh, building on the right, uh, and wait at the door. You'll be on camera and somebody will come and let you in, something like that. And I remember that walk in the atmosphere, and I can still feel the hair standing on the back of my head. And Dead man what, walking type of thing. Yeah. And that's what Lockerbie was like. Yeah. The whole area, the whole town, the atmosphere. It's funny atmosphere, isn't it, how it can be created? Yeah. But the cops, it, there was no humour about that at all. There's nothing funny I can tell you about Lockerbie. And I can make fun of most things. I could maybe make fun of some of us getting pissed afterwards or some of the stories afterwards. But well, actually, that moment... But that was absolutely gut-wrenching, you know, and the, the, the remains of the plane are there to see. But you, you think that would stick to your head more than the, exactly. the old guy? Exactly, and then an old man <laughs> yeah. in a chair. It must have triggered it. So you said something concerning earlier. You said that they told you guys they would have been unconscious and, and dead uh, when they hit the ground. Did you, when you got there, did you find that that wasn't the case? No, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I know what you're fishing for here, but it's not there, it's not there Sean. Yeah, It's yeah. not there. I wasn't people like pill pillows in the bodies and stuff like that. No. Very respectful. Very respectful. That's yeah. good. Totally, totally. 
Oh dear. It's very hard to convey. You know how the baby coming out the fridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And and these kind of things, they hit something in your humanity. Yeah. There's something inhumane about that amount of people. Different if it's an accident. See if that had been an accident. That had been a plane crash or an engine failure or something. But somebody did that. Somebody planted something on that plane yeah. to do that to other people. It's horrific. And, the, and the, the families are still dealing with it. I'm talking about some cops who were getting paid, who were mostly on overtime and made some really good money down there, mm. and who were doing their job, a job that yeah. they had they volunteered for and taken on as, when, they, when they took that oath to be a police officer. They were there. What we're really talking about is families who were bereaved on both sides exactly. of the Atlantic and still... 25, 30 years later, are having to deal with the consequences. We're actually getting that phone call too. Fuck, it doesn't bear thinking. <sighs> and that's what's in every cop's head all yeah. the time, is the, the story behind. Yeah. Because it's us that have to go and shut the door. And I tell know it's, people. A, it's not the same tragedy, but it's a similar tragedy. It was Hillsborough. Yeah. Yeah, God. And, then, and, and uh, all the Liverpool fans. Yeah, and the police had a lot of the, well... And anyone listening to this who's been at somewhere like Hillsborough, yeah. there'll still be an atmosphere there to this day for them. Exactly. Yeah. It pervades you. It's like that cold corpse again. Yeah. These things that touch your soul, you know? You said you had to go and knock on people's doors to let them know that the family member was deceased. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you have to do that for the Lockerbie situation? No, I didn't. No. I, I touched on it because it's a whole aspect of police work that yeah. people forget about. Yeah, yeah. And it's in your whole service as uh, as death messages we call yeah. them. Mm. Um, and again, we used to make fun of it. Are you the widow, such and such? You know, and all that stuff. Do you have to get special training for that then. No, but I say no. I did. Wouldn't you pass it on to uniforms to do it's that? Usually uniforms that do it. Yeah. yeah. First time doing that. What's going through your head? <laughs> first time. First time you do it, you don't. You're with someone that's doing it. Okay. Yeah, like everything else. Yeah. Yeah. And the first one's a good one because it was Tam McNabb who I've mentioned earlier on. And uh, we went to tell this elderly lady that her husband had died in the hospital. Mm -hmm. He'd been in the 70s probably, maybe older. Yeah. And he'd been in hospital for quite some time. So that's not a, a bad death message to yeah. deliver if there is such a thing. It's a good death message. Yeah. But we went to the address and Tam said, what we do here is we go to a neighbour. We tell the neighbour and take her with us. And then she's got, because she's going to be on her own, most likely. Then she's got someone that she knows with her and we can escape and everybody get on with it. So we went to the neighbour's door, chapped the door, she answers the door, and I don't even know if Tam got any words out. She was hysterical, mm. the neighbour. Ah, oh, don't tell me, don't tell me, oh no, oh no. It took us about 10 minutes to calm her down, mm. enough to come up to the door of the new widow upstairs. It's not your husband, love, it's this one over here. Yeah. <laughs> so now I think, God, this is my first one. <laughs> so we go upstairs. <laughs> we go upstairs and chat the door. The lady answers the door and she sees her neighbour crying. She sees us and says, don't tell me. The old bugger. He hung on for long enough, didn't he? Come on in, lads. Mm. She was fine. Fair enough. Put the kettle on. Probably the sadder ones are men. Yeah. Bereaved at that age. Mm. There was an old guy in Campbelltown, George, I think his name was, and he was a lollipop man. And he would be in his 70s probably. A, a lollipop man in the town and his wife had died. I had nothing to do with it, but the sergeant said we need to go and see George and get his lollipop stuff because he's not going to be doing that anymore. Yeah. Pick up his uniform and his coat and all that and his lollipop uh, and pass on our respects. So we went to see him in his house and it was it was an old person's house. Do you know that way when you can hear the clock? Tick tock, the mustiness in the air. Uh... Yeah. And uh, had a wee chat with him and he said, do you want a cup of tea, lads? Yeah, that would be great, George, that would be great. So he went in the kitchen and I'm sitting with the sergeant. I'm in uniform at this time. Two or three minutes, five minutes, no sign of him. And the sergeant says to me, go and make sure he's all right in there. So I go in the kitchen and he's standing in the middle of the kitchen with the cabinets around him, crying. He didn't know where the tea was. He didn't know where the, he didn't know where anything was to make a cup of tea. He'd been married for nearly 60 years. His wife did it. Yeah. Yeah. That's sad, oh, isn't that it? That is sad. Yeah. Than even telling him in the first place. It's because the news itself, the way you do it is right up front. Yeah. Yeah. You don't mess about at all. They probably know why you're there anyway. You know, that it's no good news again. 
you go in, say, can I come in? I've got some bad news, preparing them, and then you tell them exactly uh, that, that he's dead or whatever it is that you're going to tell them. Um, and that's the only way to do it, because I know a cop who did it and bottled it at the last minute mm. and said, he's in the hospital, we think he's going to be, we don't know. And he never told us he was dead. He was just... And he's telling the widow that she, he was still alive. And he came back to the police station and came in. Jesus. He came into the police station and said, Simon, I'm in trouble. I said, what have you done? And he told me. He couldn't tell her. This guy had about 14 or 15 years service. He just bawled it oh. when he saw her face. Oh. So I dragged him out into the car, straight back up to the house, and I went in and told her. He'd said he did a heart attack in the bus or something like that, and he died. Oh. And he told her he had a heart attack in the bus. And she went, it's, it's okay, she's all, he's all right. He's all right. <laughs> We've this had an is real life, guy. <laughs> this is real life. We've had the next cop on air before, and I remember this, we, we asked a similar question, and he said that he, ha he has a nervous laughter. Yes. So when he's yeah. trying to tell a story, to like tell a wife and that, oh, oh man. he started laughing. Yeah. But it's the last thing you want to put yeah. It's nervous. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a lot of people like that, Peter. A lot of people have got and interrogated people for a living, right? For a long number of years. Yeah. Interviewed people and body language and all these things that you're looking for. Because we are trained in that. When I left the police, I got trained much more for that kind of thing. But uh, that body language and, and, and that's the way you do it, is give people, get them to tell you the truth and see how they behave and then get them to tell you a lie and wow. see how they behave. Yeah. And you can see the differences. Mm. And the best one of them I ever had was a cat thief. And we had him for one car theft. And we went in to speak to him. And it was late at night. We were wanting to get home, back shift, nearly midnight. Right, just interview him on tape. And uh, asked him a few questions, the usual truthful ones, you know, your name, what's your mum and dad's name, where do you live, are you working? And then, do you ever, you ever smoke dope? And everybody lies. Or they used to lie about that back in the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They'd lie immediately. No, no, I never touch it. And the poor soul, his ears went red. Mm. Bright red. Oh. No, I don't smoke dope. And we're both like that. What? This can't be right. This is too good. <laughs> See this car here? You stole it? No, I don't know. Anything. Bright red ears. So we played with it for a, a few minutes, and every time he told a lie, his ears went bright red. It's like Pinocchio, but we, we were there for a long <laughs> <laughs> We were there for a while when we got all the stolen cars out for the last couple of months. Were you fucking with them after a while? <laughs> what a like? clearance that night. <laughs> it was great fun as well. Yeah. <laughs> it was brilliant. Imagine that poor guy now married. You know, Did you steal his... the car 10 years ago? <laughs> okay, right that Imagine one off. being married now, though, Peter. Uh, Where no. have you been? Oh, I was working late. <laughs> <laughs> you been in the pub? No. How many <laughs> pints did you have? I only had two pints. <laughs> <laughs> so, death messages, as we called them, are a whole branch. They're a whole thing. And you're right, Peter. Every cop has to learn how to do it. Yeah. And it's a big deal because you're dealing with real people all the time and they can react in any way at all. I just always think that it was something like that. I've never had to do it myself personally. But I think that I'd always expect the respect that I'd want, be, I'd want if someone told me. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, of course. The hardest one I ever had to do was to tell my daughter that her best friend had died. I was at a football match. I was a manager of a football team and I got a call on my phone. You need to come back to the hospital. My daughter was in the hospital and her friend had been released the night before. He had cystic fibrosis as well. Yeah. I referred to it in the book in the 10%. Um, and the hospital phoned me and said, we don't want it. Because she was gravely ill at the time and they didn't want to tell her because they thought it might interfere and might make, make her not well. So they thought I was the best person to come and tell her. Were you best to tell her? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Because she didn't need to... Well, I'm saying, who knows? That's the truth of the matter. But she could immediately hold on to me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. She knew that I was there for her and was going nowhere. Whereas a nurse might have been maybe tentative in holding her or who knows. I was the best person to tell her. Yeah. Because I knew how to do it as well. I just sat her down and looked her in the eye and said, Louise, I've got some really bad news, darling. 
I need to tell you that he's died. And that's the hardest one. But you, the way to think about it is that you're doing a service here. Yeah. You know, somebody's got to do this. It's better than a phone call or a text or mm. hear it on the news. Or It's the whole start of the grieving process as well, isn't yes. it? Yes, yeah, exactly. And they know that you've done it before and they know and they've got yeah. questions and it all comes out. So it's a, it's a process. It's the start of a process, as you say, Peter. You're absolutely right. So you moved to Govan in <laughs> Glasgow. Yeah. What was that like? Govan was brilliant. Govan. Yeah. Govan, uh, I was in the CID again and I was in a suit a lot of the time. On the book, they called it. I don't know if this is boring or not, but it's maybe the same as every CID office in the world. But uh, crimes are committed day and daily, 24 hours a day. It's usually yeah. uniform cops that go to the first call and they fill out a crime report. That'll have a different name in different areas, but that's what it is, is a crime report. And that crime report is a paper document. For most things that are trivial, the CID will never become aware of it because there's classifications of crime. Like car theft. Well, car thefts all go through. Cannabis, yeah, they all like go that. through and we've got car theft squads and all that. Yeah. So they've all got their own processes. But when I come on duty in the morning as a detective, uh, there's maybe six or eight or ten of us come on duty and we get allocated inquiries based on these crime reports. So they've been sifted through and come to the CID for investigation, the unsolved ones. And the, oh. the inspector or whoever's dishing it out that day mm. then gives oh. out the crime reports right. based on the previous crime reports well, you've got, what your workload's like, whether it's an area you're from, what, based on all sorts of factors, whether you're going on holiday tomorrow or whatever. And that's on the book. That's the book because all these crime reports go through the CID book and get allocated. And in Govan, we were dealing with, I've no idea what Merseyside would be, but I would suggest that back in the day, it would be something similar. We're talking about 1,100, 1,000 to 1,100 crimes a month going through the CID. And you're saying, pff, nowadays, it's maybe three or 400. So it's just, but things have changed. There's squads now in different ways. Yeah. And we're much better at dealing with statistics now to make things look the way we want them to look. And that's just a reality. That's very and true though, as well, though. Yeah. In those days, that's what we were dealing with on the book. So you could get anything at all allocated to you in the morning, and the next morning you were getting another two or three, and the next day another two or three. So that, that like, was so the So you job. get a car fire, someone who dropped a car and get him to admit it to 20 or 30. That's another, that's like, you know. Yeah. When I remember my old knee injury that got me into the police in the first place. Yeah. Well, while I was in government... <laughs> Uh, I met a guy at court. That's where you catch up all the gossip and things is at court because you meet cops from all over then and you get a chat at court. And uh, a boy told me about a place called Harrogate just outside uh, Leeds and there was a police convalescent home there and that was the northern police convalescent home for Scotland and Northern Ireland. All the cops who were injured, uh, not necessarily on duty, but who had some kind of injury, whether it's in here or physical, yeah. they get sent to Harrogate for a week or two and they had fantastic physiotherapy and all sorts of stuff going on and some nice pubs in Harrogate as well. <laughs> so this guy at court told me, oh, I'm just back from Harrogate, it was brilliant. And I, how do you get there? Because I've got a sore knee. <laughs> I was still playing football against the doctor's advice in these days. In every game, my knee would blow up. Ibuprofen was my best friend. I was living yeah. on ibuprofen. But I, I made an appointment to go and see the police doctor, Dr. McClay, tooled up with this information. And I couldn't say I want to go to Harrogate because I had no chance of going if I told him that. But I told him my knee was playing up, that I was using ibuprofen, that I was struggling after football. And he said, stop playing football. That was his advice, <laughs> <laughs> which was silly altogether. But he said, uh, let me see your knee. And, he said, and it had been like that when I joined the police, remember? I had the scar when I joined the police, so he knew about it. And he said, uh, I'm going to send you to Harrogate here. Right? Oh, yes. Result. And I said to him, uh, I can't possibly go to Harrogate. There's 1,100 crimes a week, you know. We're getting slaughtered and governed. And he said, 
you are going to, it was an order, and nobody could countermand the doctor, you know, so I was off. Mm -hmm. And what a time we had. And we actually came to Liverpool for a weekend in the middle, three of us, an Irishman, an Englishman and a Scotsman, <laughs> came to Liverpool for the job. weekend. <laughs> Man, what a weekend we had. It was the entry weekend as well, but we never got to see it yet. Yeah. <laughs> we were in the pub. What a weekend we had in Liverpool. So Ash wrote that in Govan there was stories involving dr um, guns. Yes. Any time there was a plain clothes thing, plain clothes people think CID. CID is suited and booted, shirt and tie. Plain clothes is when you jeans and t-shirt kind of thing, grow your hair. On the cover? Yeah, yeah. And that's, I was kind of always roped into that, you know. I met a guy, <laughs> I met a guy in a roll shop in Glasgow and he was a cop. And he looked like the biggest heroin addict you've ever seen in your life. He was like that. The drawn cheeks, the complexion. And I recruited him. I went and saw his boss and recruited him to go and buy heroin anywhere. He could buy anything yeah. anywhere because he was a junkie. I'm sure he was a junkie. He's probably <laughs> back in the drugs now. Yeah, we yeah, used yeah. him for about a year. Every time we really wanted to get into a skit, because you cops smell a mile away, you know, it's really yeah. bad. And other than use touts and informants who you've got by the short and curlies, but they're unreliable. They'll run away and tell you lies and all sorts they of things. They just run a few quid, don't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How many stories can I cram into one session? <laughs> you've, got, you've got all the time in the world, just keep going. So they set up a squad and govern. To no, they didn't. They set up a squad in Strathclyde to recover firearms off the streets. It was a, it was a, I can't remember the name of the operation. You know, Operation. Yeah. Guns off the streets, and uh, two detectives from each division, and there were eight divisions, were brought together, given some instructions, and given six months to do nothing but chase firearms. <laughs> And when you're in the drugs world, that's easy because you just switch. Instead of asking for information about drugs, you ask for information about guns. Yeah. It's the same short and curlies that you've got, <laughs> which is exactly what we did. And we had the big, in Govan, we had the biggest uh, recovery rate. I think we had 67 guns recovered in that period, something like that. And just before it, they did an amnesty. Before we launched the campaign, they gave everybody an amnesty that they could go and hand in the guns and not be asked any questions about it whatsoever. Oh, they did a few years ago. To get them off the streets. Yeah. yeah. And some people had stuff lying about the house that they yeah. went and handed in. You didn't get bank robbers getting in with their sawing off to <laughs> yeah. hand it in or anything like that. <laughs> so uh, me and the guy Jimmy Miller were set up and governed to do this, and we had a, we ran riot for six months because we were doing drugs cases alongside it. You can't, you can't really pigeonhole things like that. You just take what comes your way. Yeah. But the story, that the, again, the sun ran with it last week, I got, it was a drug dealer, but he, he said, Mr. McLean, I can get you a Kalashnikov. I said, what? Now, this was a result, right? 47. So uh, he wanted a thousand pounds for this Kalashnikov. I wasn't bothered because it's the police money anyway. I just yeah. went and told the police I could get a Kalashnikov. You've no idea, guys, the trouble I had negotiating a fee for this Kalashnikov. There was no way they were giving a grand. I think it ended up a couple of hundred max, plus lots of stuff I threw into the deal, you know, that you could... Wow. You made the hard 20, for you, 20 didn't fags, a bottle of whiskey... To uh, get a Russian and glass of coffee, like, yeah. you know? <laughs> they would do anything to get a drugs case at that time, but not a Kalashnikov off the street. <laughs> so. But anyway, uh, the guy told me where it was, so I, the inspector came with me, a DI, and we went to this pub down in Motherwell or something like that. And sure enough, it was in a bin out the back of this pub. It, was, it all came true. So we went back to the police station with a Kalashnikov. Real Kalashnikov, right? You ever seen one? Yeah. yeah. It's a real piece of work, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right, that's another story. <laughs> Hence why you're banned from the country. <laughs> anyway, I've got this thing. and uh, We've called the, the ballistics boys and they're going to send the firearms team down to, to get it and all that. But in the meantime... We're running about the corridors. Fuck I'm around. scaring the duty inspector with this thing, right? Bang, 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 bang. It's a real toy, boy's toy. And we're running about. I'm going out the back to scare the typers through the window when somebody, <laughs> <laughs> somebody shouted, that's the ballistics van coming in. Oh, fuck. So we ran away up to the boss's room, which is something like this, and put a big bit of, he'd put paper on the floor. This is the super's office, which is about the size of this. 
and we put the rifle down, the AKA down, and we're all standing round. I need to stand up again, and we're all standing round staring at it, as if we'd never touched it. <laughs> and the ballistics guy comes in and he, he, he goes round it, inspecting it, visually, for two or three minutes. And then he takes a pencil out his pocket <laughs> and he, he lifts it slit gingerly off the paper and starts examining it. And eventually, after about five or ten minutes, he picks it up and he does some, and he says, it's all right, it's clear. And we're all like, what are you talking about? He says, these were seized in Argentina. Mm. When the boys were coming home, they were keeping souvenirs. Mm. Ah. That's where most of them came from. But the Algies knew that and they would stick explosives in the stock. Oh, mm. fucking hell. So that when you pulled the trigger, whether it was ammunition in it or not, when you pulled the trigger, you would blow your head off, or at oh, least yeah. your arm. And we'd been running about the frigging corridors wow. with us. And we'd all like, oh, yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah. obviously. We wouldn't touch it. <laughs> Quite ready, <is. laughs> Brilliant. So, other than friendly fire, <laughs> As, as a firearms officer, armed with a baseball bat, um, no. as a firearms officer, did you get in any shootouts? No. No. Not in that stage of my career anyway. At any stage of your career? <clears throat> After I left Strathclyde Police, but that's the second book. Mm. <laughs> We're on the police service here, the CID, it finishes and govern really. Can you not give us a shootout story as a teaser for that book? I can, yeah, I can give you loads of teasers. I actually gave up firearms and my authorisation voluntarily for a few months just before I came out of the Serious Crime Squad. Mm. There was a hostage situation where uh, the Neds, again an escaped prisoner, they'd taken a hostage, family hostage. We had no idea where. And uh, the driver for a security company was told to deliver the money after he'd done his security run and the family would be released. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. Yeah. I got a phone call at six in the morning. Bang, we're all out there, plotted up, waiting for the security van, who by now has been driven by a police officer, armed, and being followed by the Ned. And the family are held hostage where we didn't know at the time. As it transpired, again, we're sitting in the car park watching for the security van, having a cup of tea or whatever. And there's lots of security vans coming out the depot but we're looking for a particular Reggie number and the big number on the roof. You know, they'll get their own number. Oh, yeah, like AO on four. And one came out and my neighbour, John, said to me, that could be out there, big man. I said, no, I don't think so. Don't think so. Ours is such and such. Give me the binoculars. Fuck, I think it is John here. And he had a look, and it was, it was ours, right? But because of us fannying about, it had gone maybe four or five hundred yards further up the road. And we're in a car park in Govan. We had to get out of the car park and chase it. And it's it's out of sight by the time we get there. But we know where it's going, so it's not a big panic. That turned out to be a saving grace because the family were being held hostage in a high-rise flat overlooking the road where the security... So they're watching where it's being So followed. they're watching the van yeah. and watching for cops. And there were none because we were too busy fannying about in the car park. So it worked out nicely that they saw the security van go away. No police. Yes. They've got the family at gunpoint. Very good police work, sir. <laughs> oh, brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> that's, how, that's how it read afterwards. <laughs> the beauty of police is once the story's done, then it becomes a story that you need it to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've got loads of them. <laughs> of course, that was the plan all along. So this culminated in... <laughs> the wee guy that was following us about following the van about we were following him and it culminated in a cemetery he gave instructions that the, they were to go into a cemetery near Craigton Cemetery and that's where he was going to get the money out of the van and when we got to the cemetery we were right behind him and he, was, he ran through the cemetery off and we were all chasing him with guns thinking he's armed as well as it turns out he wasn't but uh, I made a shortcut and we got him before he got out of the cemetery. At least you couldn't kill anyone, could you? He was thrown in a car, because we still don't know where the hostages are at this point. Mm. He's thrown in a car and taken back to the office and we tidy up, get the van organised and all the rest of it, all the money's still in the van. And when I get back to the Govan Police Office, I'm walking in the marble staircase as it was and there's a head above me. And this is the wee Ned being hung over the banister by the ankles oh. to find out where the hostages were. 
And in the book, I asked the question about whether that was a line crossed. There's a family, three kids, I think, a gran and a mum, being held hostage at gunpoint, and we don't know where. Well, there's no line crossed. And the guy that knows, we've got him. Yeah. Now, do we put him on tape and interview him under caution and phone a lawyer? <laughs> I've dangled someone over the balcony before. I don't know. Or put him over the balcony. Yeah. You, you, and you, you him get a lot of results. <laughs> well, we, knew, we told us where we were going. Isn't yeah. that right, Sean? Only one, well. Who <laughs> <laughs> well. But these are the moral. That's the 10% line. That's that line we were speaking about earlier on, to cross over it or not. And I know loads and loads and loads of policemen Policemen who would say, no, we become as bad as them. We can't be them. Yeah. Fuck that is what I say. I say yes. fuck that too. If it was my wife and kids that were being held hostage, yeah. the line would move. If you're hurting women or kids, all bets are off. We had one guy on, but a policeman, and it, it niggled me because we were talking, and he said, what would you do if you're seeing someone half through your window and half out? I said, well, I'd beat the shit out of him. Oh, you can't do that. So what do you mean you can't do that? He said, well, you just become a criminal like him. What you're supposed to do is just call the police. I said, so if someone's coming in my house and I've got a family upstairs, I'm supposed to just call the police? I said, nah, fuck that. He's getting fucking whooped. You know what I mean? Anyone in the right mind would, wouldn't he? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> the police you know, term gangster with his no comments. <laughs> do you know, so I know somebody that went to a police station recently and every question he was asked, that's no what he comment. said, no comment. And do you know that it's he a never... It's sign of guilt, you know. Do you know that he never got the job? <laughs> <laughs> was he a scout of <laughs> 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 what about shots fired at you story? Yeah, well, I hadn't finished that okay, story, right? Okay. Because, okay. and that was good because uh, we got him over the, told us where the family were. Then it becomes a firearms operation to min, uh, to put a cordon up and contain the situation, evacuate the flat. And he's in a high flat, four, maybe six flights up, and he's got the family hostage. But we're clearing the block. Yeah. And it's all police. There's a helicopter in the sky. It's all going on. We've got negotiators that come in. I became one of them later in later life that comes in and can talk, get communications going, get him a phone in there and get him talking. Uh, it transpired that the, he kept us going till just after about 10 past six. Any idea why? He wanted to be in the news. Mm. The six o'clock news. It? Mm. Anyway, that's what we're up against here. But I was telling you about the firearms. George Baldrick and I, remember him? Yeah, yeah Street sweeper. George and I were put at the back stairwell of the high flats, right? They've got lifts that go up and down, and you've always got a stairwell as an emergency exit. Yeah. And we're at the back stairwell with the door open, jammed open, and we've both got guns. And we're guarding the stairwell in case one of them makes a run for it, one of the bad guys. Now, we're in the daylight, Sunlight, and it's in Glasgow. <laughs> There's a story right away. Nobody will believe me now. It wasn't sunny, was it? <laughs> it was. That was the day. That was the, the day. day. <laughs> that summer. That was our summer. <clears throat> and it's pitch black in the stairwell. So you're looking from light to dark, which is not a clever idea in the first place. And we're standing there and we're chatting, and George says, Listen, and we can hear footsteps running down the stairs, getting louder. Somebody coming down the stairs. So George goes in. Adam's police at the foot of the stairs. Stop whoever's running on the stairwell. Footsteps keep coming. So we're both kind of, what's going on here? So he shouts again, armed police, police officers. I do it as well, but they keep coming. And eventually after what seems like a lifetime, but is actually 20 seconds later, a wee boy runs past us. Mm. Oh. About 12 maybe. Ah, he's a big softy, isn't he? You're saying, ah, why did I not shoot him? See, if that had been a guy with a shotgun, we were both dead. It's that split second. Yeah. Because there's no way we knew what was coming out there. But you're not triggering that. But we knew either. somebody was. And, and but I gave up my fire. I went and saw the boss after that and said, I don't want to carry just now. 
because I don't know what I'm doing with this thing. No, I could see if you shot the guy, the kid, mm. I could see why you'd want to give it up, but I think that's a good story. I think, like, you know, you waited. And I actually, when we think about it, though, you could have been dead, couldn't you? Could I'd have... love to hear an American cop's view, because I've seen a few web- websites. Depends, if the, guy was white or... Depends through... if the guy was white or black. <laughs> <laughs> It really does. <laughs> <laughs> My brain couldn't register it that quick. <laughs> that aside, <laughs> I'd love to to hear an American cop's view on that, a retired cop, because through writing the book, I've became associated with author sites and yeah. all that. And there's some sites you can go on. I'm now a consultant for a best-selling American a USA women's author, Melinda Colt. And she asked me to consult because she does murder books and things like that. So I've helped her with her Garda series, which is a wee plug for her. Mm. Uh, but I'm on her book as a consultant. So there's lots of cops. And the American ones, when it comes to firearms, I mean, they're a mile ahead of anything you get in the UK because they live with a firearm on their hip. Yeah. And a shotgun in their car. It's a real thing for them. Uh, so I'd love to hear his take on that and what an American cop, how he would have dealt with that. I was probably standing in the wrong place for starters. There's all that stuff because you're not used to doing it comes into play. But it's my bottle crashed about carrying a firearm. If I'm not going to shoot somebody, there's no point in having a firearm, guys. Policeman never takes his stick out his bat now to threaten you. They have tasers. They, they have they have different types of weapons, don't they? I mean, they, I think they, they do now. They could taser. Yeah, and I yeah. don't know about back thirty years ago, though. I don't think they had all that. I don't yeah. know. But I'd love to hear a cop's view, who, who's got a, a proper view of it, being a firearms officer that deals with guns all the time. That would be interesting. Or even American people, because they're much more tuned in to firearms than, than we will ever be. Thankfully, I got a concealed weapons permit. And to do the training for that, it was ex-cops who trained us. And um, the situation you described, they said it's life or death and you just have to kill right yeah, away. Yeah. Two in the chest, one in the head, whatever it takes. Go Double tap, down, we otherwise. were always taught. Yeah. And never to aim for anything but the centre of the torso. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like the baton. Remember I said the baton? As a young cop, I was told, don't ever take it out and threaten someone because he might take it off you and batter fuck mm-hmm. out of you. If you take it out, it's because you're going to use it. Yeah. That's the only... T- yeah. And a gun's the same. If you're going to shoot, you've made that decision, you shoot to kill. Because once it's escalated to that level, it's life or death for yourself. Well, don't the buttons yeah. have, like, a leather strap where you can actually put it around your wrist? The button, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's strapped on. Yeah. So it, it does help. So just trying to take it away from you. Some big... I mean, American seals that we... They could ragdoll us. You know, they were real big guys. There was no... I had to jam one of their fingers in the van door to get them into the van. But that's a different thing entirely. But the shooting... There's one shooting I was involved in, and it's back to the mental health thing again. It's in Glasgow. It was a series of robberies, and they were all happening on a Sunday. Do you remember when licensing hours dictated that the pubs opened at half past six on a Sunday? Six. Was that the same down here? We had to close in the afternoon from no, they had half to clo- two. They had to close from two to six or something like that. They I think, had to I think three, it, three in, hours. in Scotland it was half two till five, Monday to Friday or Saturday. And on a Sunday they couldn't open until half twelve and they were shut from half two till half six. Something like that. Yeah. But it was certainly half six was opening time on the Sunday night. And the robberies were all occurring between six and half past six. This is a big chapter in the book because it's a big inquiry. It's a good inquiry, a fun inquiry as well. It was a surveillance unit at the time because there had maybe been four or five of these robberies over a period of six, eight weeks. So it was a pattern. And it was different divisions all over the city and out with the city. So it was no use for divisions to deal with. So they, they set up a squad to deal with it. And it was our squad, the surveillance unit primarily. You didn't have to sit in the pubs, did you? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. I'm good. You know what I'm good at now, don't you? <laughs> well, funnily, one of the pubs was a gay bar, which was quite a thing back then. Yeah. Most of your listeners won't believe that, that, that we had gay bars. But in those days in Glasgow, certainly, it would be the same down here. There was gay nights. A oh, Tuesday nice. night yeah. in Glasgow was gay night. And certain bars were gay. There was only two or three in the whole city. So it was quite a thing. This this was part of the, the liberalisation that was going on. But the, our inquiry centred on a gay bar in Glasgow uh, because there had been a... Every time they did the robbery, they had an Adidas bag that had the firearms in it. 
And that had been seen going in and coming out and the firearms being used. And this had did this bag through the whole inquiry that you need to buy the book. It's called The 10% and you need to buy the book to find out the real story. We centred on this pub where a, a member of staff had been seen with the Adidas bag. So we had to put two cops in undercover and we drew lots for it to see who would go in because it's a gay bar. It wasn't the most popular <laughs> undercover work, right? In the day. Now so them guys can kick your ass, I have noticed. <laughs> now I'm a natural. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have got no bother for you. I <laughs> Bit of tank tower phone there on your way. Oh, I've, I've, I've been in gay bars. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We frequented gay bars. We frequented gay bars. Hey, I don't want to know you. Yellow construction life. hat night. Peter was in the middle of the dance floor, yellow construction hat night. <laughs> Crowbar, Phoenix, Arizona. Really good music. <laughs> You well, know, uh, no yeah, hassle, yeah. Yeah, no hassle whatsoever. Until Sammy the Balls crew show up. Yeah, <laughs> and they always paid on time. Well, they paid up front, really. They always had yeah, money, didn't yeah, they? Yeah. And some of them were hard as fuck. Some yeah. of them. Oh, yeah. There's a game, yeah. I fear, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, you guys' personal life is not something <laughs> we want to go into here. And how you dress at the weekend. Well, I was just looking after him, you see. <laughs> 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 we're going to the gay bar tonight. Oh. They were actually good, the gay bars. You never get any hassle in them. No, you don't. Because it was just everywhere. Didn't get your ass grabbed. <laughs> No, did you? <laughs> Is that why you went? <laughs> so I didn't either. The only reason I went. <laughs> the short straws were do, were were drawn by two lads, uh, Art and uh, and we called them Art and Ted. It was a play on their real names, Art and Ted. Yeah. And they were a perfect couple actually. One of them was a good looking big guy, and the other guy had the beard and looked p- 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 perfect anyway. So they were in there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the kind of guys that would hang about places like that in those days. No offence, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> he was a perv. I say that, nobody knows the way he was. But he actually was. That, that's another story altogether when I caught him watching stuff on the telly. But that's another story altogether. Oh. So they get drawn the short straws and went in. And again, they fell out. Remember the story about me and the puppy? Yeah, and drunk. They did the same over the period of that week. <laughs> But they made up very quickly. <laughs> when one of them's in the toilet and somebody comes up behind him and says, oh, that's terrible. He's a rascal, isn't he? <laughs> Can we give you a hand? Don't you worry about him. <laughs> <laughs> they made up like that. So that culminated in uh, the Sunday night, a surveillance operation, and they were going to go and rob a pub. And the decision was made to intercept it before they got to the pub. Because once they're at the pub, there's other people involved. They're putting people's lives at risk exactly, if you let them yeah. do the turn. So we decided to hit them before they got to the turn. A place called Charing Cross in Glasgow, which is what you would imagine. City centre, traffic lights, perfect spot on a Sunday evening. We hit them there and it was a black cab, a black hack that uh, that the main man was in. There was two cars, but the main man who we were after was in the black cab. And he stood up in the cab with a sawn off and pointed at a cop. He was going to shoot the cop. And we were, I was i was in the car. I had just got there and hadn't quite got out and I didn't have a gun. But in court, uh, one of our lads described it as an Irish firing squad because we had surrounded the car. Again, it's something your American uh, cop listeners will know is stupid to surround a car that you're going to maybe have a shootout. <laughs> <laughs> but these things, when, when you don't deal with them all the time, that's maybe this is maybe the last time somebody was shot by a policeman in Scotland. I don't know, there may have been one since then. But anyway, the guy's in the cab, so he's bent over and he's pointing the gun at a colleague of mine, Les Darling, who's got his gun out and everybody's shouting, police, police, police. And uh, when he lifted the son off, he was shot from behind. He was shot in the backside. But he was only shot once, which was totally against our training. But that's where the Irish firing squad in. The guy who shot him was a guy called George, who shot him in the backside. Now, from that day on, and this is my point... That just dis- disabled him then? It's not a rational decision. It's maybe because he knew his colleague was on the other, other side, side of him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he training, wasn't a very good aim. <laughs> No, I think that's all his target was. Oh, yeah. Through the window of a hack, and he's bending uh, over with a sawn yeah, off. Got yeah. So I think that was his only target, was to shoot him in the backside. Yeah. Uh, one round, which was disappointing. Um, but the point I want to make about this story is it went to the High Court and all the rest of it. And I always remember in the High Court, uh, giving evidence, and my colleague giving evidence, who was in charge of the operation. And when the jury... Uh, 
when he was asked what the police said, it was all armed police stop. That's what we were always trained to say, armed police stop. And you do that two or three times, but then it all went out the window. And Donnie, who was in the witness box, told the truth. He said, armed police stop, armed police stop. And then what? He said, put that gun down, you fucker, or something like that. It became real then. Yeah. And I thought that was brilliant because that's believable because it was the truth. Yeah. If, if you just went by procedure the whole way, it's made up, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. It's like me and my baseball bat. That became my police baton for my statement. As if I'd stand on the car of a, a guy with a shotgun hitting his windscreen with my police baton. <laughs> but a baseball bat was, was naughty. Crossed the line. I don't mind doing, telling you about it either. But so George shot the guy and I can say without a word of contradiction or any fear of contradiction that his life changed. George Adair's life changed that day for the rest of his life because he forever became George, you shot that cunt, Adair. And I make no apology for the language because that's the way police officers speak yeah. to each other. That's who he became. In here, at home, Everywhere, his life then became the last cop to shoot somebody in Glasgow. And he had a heart attack a few years later. I don't know how he is now. And he was a great guy before it, but he became something completely so different. So you he was mocked, he wasn't a hero under that name. He was never be a hero. He was revered by us because he'd pulled the trigger. It could have been any one of us. It could have been any of us that had pulled the trigger. And thank God he did or Les Darling might be lying in the mortuary that night. So nobody had any problem with that. Brilliant George, he pulled the trigger. What happens, though, when a policeman does that, and this is what's forgotten in all the incidents that you hear about in the news in Liverpool and London and all the rest of it, it says a guy was shot by police officers on London Bridge, right? And I see that. And all of a sudden I think of George Adair. See the cop that pulled that trigger? His life has changed forever. Yeah. He's just killed someone or shot someone on our behalf. And all the news is, yes, the victims of the guy who needed to be shot, brilliant. The guy himself, all the headlines and all the terrorist or whatever he happens to be, but it's just a line. A guy was shot by police officers today. That police officer's life changed that minute as well. And do you know what help he's getting from the police to deal with it? Fuck all. Exactly. Nothing. Am I getting that across? Yeah. 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 Because that, George Adair, and, and something else. See the cop that pulled the trigger? There's at least a dozen people, senior officers, forensic people, judges, lawyers, prosecutors, defenders, defence lawyers, analysing every second of footage, every second of radio message to find out if he made the right decision at the right time, with hindsight. People who have never been in the situation, never carried a firearm, and never had to deal with a guy that's going to kill you with a knife or anything, or maybe have explosives strapped to him, they will never be in that situation. But they're judging the guy who made a split-second decision. See, him like a fucking villain. Exactly. You took the words right out of my mouth, Peter. George Adair was treated like a villain that night. He was taken away and separated from us. We were all separated from each other. The police have shot someone. Guy didn't die. Police have shot someone. The inquiry is, why did the police shoot someone? Were they in the right to do that? The bastard had a shotgun who was going to shoot That's where the major inquiry, never mind the just caught guys that were tying people up and holding them at gunpoint to steal the safe, the money out of the safe. Forget all that. A policeman discharged a firearm. Let's see if he did the right thing. And it's that scrutiny that you're under when I'm standing at the stairwell with a wee boy running towards me and I don't know what's coming towards me. Those dilemmas that policemen find themselves in all the time, not just with firearms, no. with violence. You've got to arrest someone. Where are those lines? of What you're supposed to do is use reasonable force. That's a very, very tricky word, that reasonable force, isn't it? Take him down and knock his head on the reasonable table. force for you? Are you a retired police officer as well? <laughs> <laughs> Melzi <Mercy> said police. <laughs> Corrupt. But those lines are very tricky. And they're, they're much, much different lines in the cold light of day with hindsight, which is a great gift. See when it's actually happening. Somebody's yeah. got a knife or somebody might have a gun. Might have a gun, and he's got his hand in here, or he's got something in his hand. 
those situations, we're awful quick to judge. Uh, and, and when things happen, and let's face it, there's a few things that have hit the headlines in the last few months, and, and they always do periodically. They're one in, a th- one in a million. You know, there's people arrested every minute probably in the States. There's somebody being arrested. Yeah. Does that make sense? Every minute of the daylight, God, right, probably for 16 hours a day, every minute there's somebody arrested for a crime in America. That's off the top of my head, but it's probably not far from the truth. Drug possession. And we only hear, arrested. yeah, and we only hear about one arrest every two or three weeks or months that goes wrong, where the cop loses it, makes a mistake, or that shaking gun in Paul Ferris's head, yeah. or, or something happens like that. I've got no no view on whether if they crossed a line, they crossed a line, and they take the the law is the same for all of us at the end of the day. And if it's a bad cop that murdered someone, put him in jail and let's get on with it. But let's remember the thousands and thousands and thousands of lawful arrests that are made every day in our behalf and in our name and are done properly. If you put like a, a, a cop and he's being trained with a gun, if you let him have the gun, you should give him his discretion. He shouldn't be interviewed afterwards or something like that. I mean, the, 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 them coppers what killed the terrorists in London. I mean, there were every right to do it. But I bet they didn't get interrogated for it, did they? I'll bet they did. you did. think? Yes, for it's, sure. It's, it's procedure, is it? Yeah. Standard procedure. Standard, yeah. I think and, that's fucking terrible, that. And they would have the guns taken from them. They would have some kind of profiling done to make sure that they'd be suspended for a length of time on medical grounds, I would suggest, or at least put on lighter duties until the doctors give them the, the sign-off that they're fit to carry a firearm. Okay, hell. I can guarantee, I don't know any of this, and yet not knowing, I can guarantee that the scrutiny from that incident, at least half of it is about the police. Yeah. And whether they, d- they could have d- dealt with it in a different way. It's the famous line that you hear all the time, as long as we learn from it, isn't it? You hear that all the time. We it's never... only the army killer you want, then. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the closest you've been to death? To death? Me, personally? Yeah. Probably that bullet that I wasn't aware of at the time. But I've disarmed people with guns, as you know. Uh, knives. You see, when you make an arrest, I would say that 90-odd percent of arrests, when you get a resist of arrest and he wants to fight back, and you, sometimes you usually know that. We, we would be able to know that instinctively. Or you would say to the guy, there's two ways of doing this. I was quite good at talking, talking them down. Yeah. But I've worked with guys who are not... Police women are terrible for it. Pardon me. Police women are terrible for that. Interrogate well, Putting the cause it worse than right, what it is. And, and, and all it does is wind the guy up because nobody likes that. Yeah. I read a thing about American police, uh, American shootings, whether it's true or not. I read that most shootings occur within six foot. That space. It's when you get that close, that's when things trigger off. You know the expression in Glasgow, we call it squaring up. Yeah. Where you square up to someone, like I'm doing with you now, that's confrontational. Although my hands are open, which is quite friendly. But if I'm squaring up to you, I'm squaring up to you. If I'm side on, I'm much less threatening. You see that? Yeah. If I'm six foot away, I'm much, much less threatening. So that's why most shootings are in that in that space. And when you understand those things, you can manage situations. If I'm out here saying, Sean, let's have a chat here. You're much more liable to talk to me if I'm if I was six foot away, I wasn't quite there. You're not in I'm arm's right. reach, you know, you're not actually harming my you? Yeah, no, and if I'm side on, my hands are like this, come on. You know, there's universal things going yeah. on here, no weapons. I'm far enough away that I'm not going to jump on you. And we're much, so I was quite good at that. Because I'd rather do that than fight, to be honest. But when it gets, some guys just want to go, you say you've got two choices. We can either do this in the, the nice way where we all stay on our feet and nobody gets hurt, and we go and have a chat at the police station, but you're going to the police station. And the other way of doing it, we know that you go there via the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Bravado. But th- th- some of them just go, right, let's go. You know, <laughs> that's, uh, it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of the job. 
So you're saying how close did you come to death? You'd need to ask the guys I was arresting. Yeah, yeah. Because I've taken knives off guys, and I went to an instant one night, uh, CID again, but it was uniforms, had them surrounded, four or five uniforms. He had a beautiful blade about that length, and, uh, and he was wanting to stab someone. And maybe the uniform was part of the problem. You know, when I arrived suited and booted, it, I could get eye contact with him, and we started talking. And the knife goes down a wee bit and it gives me verbal and all the rest of it, but the threat dissipates a wee bit. And eventually I get close enough that I can take it off him. Do they train you to take knives off people? Yeah, yeah basic uh, self, self-defence self stuff. I think it's a bit better now because we've got new batons now and stuff. I th- hopefully our self-defence training's a bit better now than it was. It was a shambles back in the day. Absolute shambles. We know from our glasses. Well, look at the guy, can he do a press up? What, what chance has he got in the street? Because there are violent people out there, hey? Yeah. And they're not, you don't go up and say, Excuse me, I'm putting you under arrest. And that's that. And he goes, Oh, drat. Put the handcuffs on then and let's get it over with. <laughs> Imagine doing that in Liverpool streets on a Saturday night. It's a violent job. There is absolutely no question, and people forget that. They forget that when they see things go wrong. The, the police didn't go in there looking for a fight, you know? <laughs> yeah, we know from our, from our Glaswegian guests, they're handy with the knives up yeah. there. And Blink's, yeah. Blink's got that big old scar oh, down his face. Yeah. You weren't behind that, were you? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, somebody got there before me. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Please draw the line at that. <laughs> you haven't seen our podcast with Ian Blink MacDonald. Check them out. We got, I think we've got a Scot, Scotland, Scottish Gangsters playlist now as well. <laughs> and like I said, you should check Blink's book out, available on Amazon. He's got a book out? Yeah. <laughs> I'm republishing it for him in all three formats. For goodness. Yes. Should Is be he a, sat in the seat? Should be available for, by Christmas. Blink has actually done a podcast in the Southern Studio, and he did a podcast in this studio as yeah. well. Yeah. 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 So funny. His stories are so You should funny. let Sean do your book. It's very good. Oh, if you want, if you want me to do the, if you want me to do the audio book, just let me know. Ah, okay. If you've got, if you've got a true crime book out there published that's doing well and there's no audio book, let me know. I'll split the royalties with you 50-50 a lot more than you get from Random House, for example. <laughs> All right. So you've got next story is nailing a big heroin dealer. There was lots of big drugs mm-hmm. things like that up off the coast of Scotland. The coast of Scotland was was the place to bring your drugs in at one point if you were smuggling them in by yeah, ship. Yeah, you know, anywhere a few big gets tons up there. That was the one where the customs officer died. He was caught between the two ships. Do you remember? No, that? tell us ah. that story. Well, that's it. Basically, it was pissing the rain in the middle of the night. Yeah, and we had to seize the ship as it came in. Yeah, and the customs ship came alongside, but the the customs officer got killed and the got sandwiched of between two yeah. ships. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Yeah. All right, so we've got Marty Pello. <laughs> wet, wet, wet front man. This is interesting because, God, there's so much we've skipped over here, but that's fine because I need people to buy the 10% as well. <laughs> <laughs> the, link, the link to Simon's book is in the description box below this video as our links to all of his socials. Oh, right, so I don't need to repeat it all the time. Just as well. <laughs> I forgot all about it. But um, uh, they don't need to buy now. <laughs> Just before... Well, this is a serious note. By the time I had been in Govan, and honest to God, see that, that line as you get closer to the, the line, the dividing line between good and bad, white and black, good and evil. There's a lot involved down there, undercover. Yeah. Sometimes you don't know which side you're actually on. I did open a house to sell heroin. I told my boss about it, though. I to- asked him if I could do it. I just got the opportunity to get a supply and we opened a house for maybe four or five days where we were dealing heroin in Govan. And from it came the, probably the biggest heroin turn in the west of Scotland about three months later. But that's where it started, was us selling through our letterbox. That's how insane the war on drugs is. You've got the police <laughs> selling heroin. <laughs> yeah, because it was a means to an end. We don't have to tell the Liverpool police that because they already do it. <laughs> I was told it was heroin. I don't know what was in the bags. <laughs> <laughs> Probably just powder, talcum powder or something. But the Neds believed it was heroin, that's all that mattered, really. <laughs> did I backpedal out of that one? <laughs> Michael Jackson out of there. Um, I like the way you did that. Yeah. yeah. That His style. Skillful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Who's, who's Marty Pello? 
He was a lead singer. Where, 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 it was they were a big, big band back in the day, and in the UK anyway. I don't maybe they never made same same time as like Bros. Yeah, uh, the yeah. same time as E Seventeen. Brian Harvey didn't I didn't I had no idea who he was until recently. Brian Harvey, you don't know who he is. <laughs> I didn't he's either. <laughs> we were we were in America. <laughs> the whole it was the nineties because my son would be about twelve or thirteen, which would mean ninety five round about then. Uh. Um, and they were a Glasgow band. You two were stoned out your heads. You'll not remember any of them. No, we raise you. Bonsky <laughs> Pete was our era, wasn't it? <laughs> Frankie goes to Hollywood. I nah, know we're talking. Gay bar stuff. You know what I like gay bar classics. <laughs> YMCA. <laughs> you know the moves? Do you know the moves? No. <laughs> so, by this time... Um, I'm close to that. I've been too close to that line. Some of the stuff that we got up to in there is uh, sounds like you were over that line more than you thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's hard to get back across sometimes as well. <laughs> but I, my daughter had been born by this time. I had three kids. My daughter had cystic fibrosis when she was born, Louise, <sighs> and I'd got involved with a charity, and I was doing a lot of work with the cystic fibrosis trust yeah. because at that time. Believe it or not, we thought a cure was just round the corner. It felt the gene had been discovered and it felt like things, we could we could solve it. Hope. Yeah, yeah. And my a friend's father, who was a retired doctor, told me that five years was the kind of prognosis for kids born with cystic Jesus fibrosis. Christ. So it was a kind of urgency to it as well. She lived till she was 23 and a half, Sean. Yeah. So, but to put it in that perspective, that's the kind of time, everything was urgent about it. Yeah. We were trying to raise funds and raise awareness and whatnot. Uh, and I was doing all that as well as, as the undercover work and whatnot, so it takes its toll. And I was due a promotion, and I got I got asked out of the CID because it was just... And the boss was, what? Nobody comes out of the CID to go into uniform. That was pretty much unheard of. But I'd had enough at that level. I'd just passed my other police exam, and now I've got a career head that I'm thinking because of my family. I'm doing the charity work. And I went into the community police. And you can't get promoted in the police when you've got loads of complaints against you. And believe me, we had complaints on complaints on complaints. Wasn't that a fuck your pension? What? By going from detective to community. No, not at all. No. No. No, it's, no, it's still a policeman, still the same. Everything's the same. It's just a different role. Yeah. And I remember the night that I did it, there was an incident in Govan with a racial incident where there was about 500 Asians... Uh, chasing after all these Scottish white guys because something had kicked off in the street and it was a riot. It was an absolute riot. And there was guys in the chip shop getting hot fat thrown at them and baseball bats. There was a few shots fired as well. The whole thing was a riot. And the next day, I'd been the only DO and detective on duty that night. I remember it because Scotland beat Sweden at football in the World Cup. And that happened so rarely. It's like a GFK mm. moment that Scotland win a game. You remember where you were when Scotland won a game. It's like England beating Germany. But the next day, I went into my boss and I said, Detective Chief Inspector Jack Baird, and I said, I need, to, I need to get out of here. I need to go and do something different. Because all of what I've just told you had happened and it never even raised my heartbeat a notch. I was done. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nothing was exciting in it. Yeah. I'd done the surveillance and helicopters and guns and, and nothing now would, was stimulating. It was boring. It you didn't want it to get like that, did you? You always no. wanted to be. I was going to get stale. Yeah. So I spoke to him and I said, I want to go into the community police, take a few months out. Uh, I've passed my police exam and just have a stock take. Same and pay. He, he said, yeah, he said, no overtime, but he said, you'll just be playing clothes in uniform. You'll be undercover in uniform. And he remember I said that right at the start of the yeah, day? Got, yeah. He was absolutely right. Because I went out in the street with my hat on. The first day I was out in the street with my hat on, I was on Paisley Road West, and a wee junkie girl came over, and I knew her, Audrey, whatever, and she came over. No, I called her over because there'd been a theft of a, a Monday book or something, a pensioner's book. Yeah. Somebody was tanning the pensioner's flats and stealing their books and getting the money. And I called her over and I said, what are you doing hanging about here, the pensioners' books, where are they going, blah, 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 you'll know. And she said, I don't know anything about it, mister, I don't know, officer, honestly, honest to God. And I was a bit frustrated and I took my hat off. And she went, Mr McLean, 
What happened to you? Because <laughs> I was undercover. Yeah. My grey hair was covered. I was just another uniform. But I was actually, and that led to a big, big turn. A really big drugs turn, that one. But again, 10%. It's got to, it's got to read the book. <laughs> but that was a cracker that came from that confrontation See. when she told me what was coming in that night. And although I was in uniform, I went to the boss that afternoon and I said, boss, I need to get a warrant. And he said, it didn't take long, did it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm meant to be the community man that wanders about drinking tea and visiting the school yeah. and the neighbourhood watch. And here I'm coming in with this drugs turn that was major. So, Marty Pell. So that's the vein I'm in. When I'm walking up towards a place called Paisley Road Toll and there's a Bank of Scotland on the corner and it's quite a busy toll with a, a filter lane and three roads meeting, traffic lights. And there's a four by four, a Range Rover or something parked right at the lights, double parked, hazards on, nobody near it. And it's blocking the whole junction. There's cars, can't get beep, horns beeping, all that stuff. I'm in uniform, minding my own business. But I'm thinking, he's getting done, right? So I'm away up, notebook out. And who comes running out the bank but Marty Perlow? Who you guys don't know, but everybody else, everybody else knows who Marty Pell is. Marty Pell Brown, I have you. Giggle him, giggle him. And the smile, a famous smile. And what a voice. Really good singer. And Marty comes out. Oh, sorry, big man. Sorry, big man. I, I was in a rush. I'll not do it again. And jumps into the Land Rover and get, starts the engine ready to drive off. And I said, just put the engine off, sir. I need a word with you. And he's like, oh got one of them, you know, and I've got my notebook out, my police notebook, there's nothing in it at all yet. <clears throat> What's your name, sir? <laughs> Martin Christopher. <laughs> all these names, right, your full name, it's always your full name, right? Date of birth. And he's like, oh, God, man, do we need to do that? Excuse me. Date Sign there, please. Occupation. Okay. <laughs> Musician, right? <laughs> address. I could see him now. Yeah, yeah. Took his address. I think it was a bird's address I got or something. <coughs> I said, that's fine, Mr. Pillow. Could you just sign there for my daughter, please? <laughs> <laughs> and I got me to sign my notebook for him. And he was like that. The big, the famous Marty oh. Pillow smile into the nose. And he said, hang on, big man, hang on. And he got on his CB radio, remember them? No. Yeah. He's on his radio to his office. Julie, Julie, uh, what's your address, big man? I gave him the address. I'll get a goodie bag sent out to your daughter. And, and sure oh. enough, a few days later, all this posters. Oh, all that was that. nice. Yeah, yeah, good guy. So that's wet, 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 wet is it called? Wet, wet, wet. Three wets. You got a stutter. Wet, 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 wet. Wet, 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 wet. Came from Clyde Bank in Glasgow, just outside Glasgow. All oh, right. In 1994, a prostitute fell down a stairwell oh. naked and died. We're rewinding a wee bit now. Okay. Just before I did what I did and went into uniform. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Remember I told you about the no suspicious circumstances with the Chinaman and yeah. the biggest Chinese yeah, carrier yeah, yeah. and all that? Yeah. Well, this one, uh, she'd fallen, it was, it was quite high up, maybe three, maybe four flights up. She had fallen into the stairwell and was found naked in the stairwell. And the banister was about that height. So how you fall over, accidentally fall over a banister is beyond me, right? Unless you're larking about and you're over there or climbing. So or, it over, obviously. But, and naked as well. Yeah. So I went to post-mortem with the boss and within two or three days, uh, it, was, it was getting written off. And I said to the boss, I wasn't happy. I wouldn't have done that as a younger detective when I was just trying to get into the CID, but no. Yeah. And I knew the boss, and he was a good guy. It's the same guy that I told when I was doing the heroin house. And he said, what's the problem? And I told him, I said, just didn't feel right in my gut. I'd been at the post-mortem, and there was nothing. There was no strangulation marks or bruising or anything. Just the fall had killed her. But give him his due, he said, take a week. Take as long as you need. Go and make any inquiries you want to make and let me know if you need anything and, and see what you come up with. But it's a bit like back to your, uh, the, the police officer that was killed here 10 years ago. If I was going into the, the housing scheme just now to start those inquiries up again, and this is not giving it away any secrets of the police because you guys would do the same when you think about it. You flood the area with uniformed cops, 
and every every kind of copper you can get, you flood the area and you start harassing the locals. Right. Yeah, search them legally. Warrants, execute the warrants. Drugs, hammer down on it. You're getting the jail for a bit of blow, whatever it is. Get them hoovered up in, and they'll start talking to get you out of their lives so they can go back to some... It's like we all were in lockdown. We'd have done anything to get back to some kind of normality. The bigger drug dealers will find the guy for you. Correct. They'll say, wait a minute, what is it you need, big man? Yeah. You know what I mean? Phone you. What is it you need? Okay, he'll be, he'll be delivered to you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? It's Hard as simple side. as that. Mm-hmm. To stop business. Yeah. I don't want to stop business. Um, so that's exactly the same with this. I had no resources. I couldn't do that. I had me. Yeah. And the only suspect I had was the boyfriend. Because I didn't, I, we'd done the door to door inquiries, and it's an area where nobody would tell you anything anyway. She lived in a rental flat. It was probably a trick that she'd taken up there. So I would probably have to go into the city centre. CCTV wasn't as prevalent then. The city centres where the prostitutes would be working and to speak to other prostitutes, which takes a long You need to harass them, stop their business, yeah. and they'll tell you anything to get back to work again. So you need resources to do all that. And I had nothing, I had me. And the result of it was, after a week, I'd had the boyfriend in, but I had no leverage to... to when you're questioning someone and trying to, and trying to get information out of him that he's lying about, you need some leverage. You need to know something. You need some threat. You need something against him to, yes. to, to yeah. make it You need threat, some you? friction for him to come up against. A forensic or a fin- anything at all, a fingerprint or anything. And he'd been all over the place. He was her boyfriend. But eventually the family, one of the family phoned me, I think, and I, went, I met them in a pub not far from where it had happened in Glasgow, in Govan. And uh, they all bought me a drink or whatever and they said, Simon, we appreciate what you're trying to do here, but we need to let it go. Wow. And, and I stopped the inquiry. It was never a murder. It was never classed as a murder. But Why did they want to let it go? Because it was hashing up too many memories. Yeah, I think so. I think they wanted to get back. They the, the wanted to get back had, to the normal. Well, they couldn't do, have the funeral or anything. They couldn't get on with things Yeah. until the police right. had finished and released the body and say to the fiscal, so none of that could occur. Um, and they knew what I knew them all by now because I'd interviewed them. You can imagine how much I'd interviewed them to get information about her and mm. photographs and anything that I could piece together. Did they know that you weren't holding that up? Did they know that you were doing good? You know what I mean? Yeah. There are stories in the book in the 10% where I actually solved the crime as well. <laughs> 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 okay, so you became the chairman of a Cystic Fibrosis Society. The Cystic Fibrosis Trust in Scotland yeah. was the charity that I was working with. I became the fundraiser. Is that became... still going? Yeah, oh yeah, very well, much we're so. We're going to put the link then to that okay. below, below this video as well. That would be lovely. That would them. be lovely. Yeah. And the, the book is dedicated to Louise. And uh, there's a, a, a cystic fibrosis uh, remembrance site that people have been donating to just because they want to. So it's all it's all linked to Ringwood, the publishers, and uh, and all the information thereafter is linked through my social media. Through what did you say the name of the site is again? Just to f- remind people. Ring, uh, sorry, it's the cystic fibrosis remembrance remembrance site. Yeah, and I've just. I had an email this morning. They got, we're doing a, a virtual launch on Zoom on the 7th of October where we'll be, we can't meet to do it anymore. But it's sometimes better this way because it's worldwide. I've got my sister in Australia and friends yeah. in America and all over the world now. So we're doing that at 7 o'clock till about 9 on the Wednesday, the 7th of October. Is on your Zoom. book coming out in October? Is that what's It's happening? coming out on the 30th of this month. 30th of September. It's actually physically available. This if, will be a pu- published after it's published, so people can will be able to get it. Then. Yeah. yeah. So the idea is that they can pre pre buy it just now, pre pre purchased. Pre order. Pre order. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank God you're here. He's got, he's got Amazon Prime, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if they pre order, they get a signed copy sent out once mm-hmm. it's published on the thirtieth. Yeah. Signed by me, I should say. <laughs> it takes us a month to two months to get these published, these podcasts. Right. Oh, yeah. right. Okay. So yeah. we're after the event now, then. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So forget everything I've said in the last couple of minutes. But that, that Zoom podcast, the CF Trust, I've just heard this morning, I'm going to put someone on for a few minutes to say a few words about where we are with CF just now and yeah. getting towards a cure because the treatment's much better now. Right. 
things have moved on, they move on all the time. There's new meds now, new medication as well. So we're yeah. moving in the right direction. And at that point, Cystic Fibrosis Trust, at that point I was considering, see with charity, and you'll know this when I say it, when you do one thing, if we decided to do a raffle tonight in a pub, during the course of that raffle we meet people and somebody who knows somebody with cystic fibrosis or something will say, big man, I've got a pub in my place and we could do a raffle up there and I'll, I know somebody that's got prizes. And all of a sudden you get people saying, I've got a pal that drives buses and he could put a bus on. Yeah. I run a football team, we could play a game. It's self-perpetuating when you start charity work. you just got to get it out, haven't you? And for anybody out there who starts in charity work, be very, very careful. It was a warning I got in the early days. You need to be very careful because it is a monster that can overtake your life yeah. completely. And you need to be able to keep control of it because it's 24-7. Because you want to use all the resources that become available to you. And that's where I was getting. And I said to, I went and saw my divisional commander and everybody knew about Louise because I was a fundraiser and all the rest of it. Some fantastic events we put on all over Scotland. I had the professional pool, uh, UK professional pool champion, had a daughter with CF and him and I did exhibitions all over the country. I'll tell you one about Amer Americans because I know you've got a big American audience. Yeah. You okay? Yeah, for go time? for it. Yeah, yeah. This is, time. I was away from Campbelltown but Still going back, my family were there and all that. I was split up from my wife and she was there with my kids. So we put on these pool tournaments in all the police stations uh, in, in Strathclyde and had a finals night at police headquarters at Loch Inch Police Recreation and made a lot of money. So I did the same in the pubs in Campbelltown and other places. All the pubs were to play off that had a pool table and the two finalists were to come to a finals day so that was about 32 guys were coming to the finals day. And I had four tables set up in a big hotel and they would all come and play the last 32 down to the quarters and the series. Yeah. And we'd end up with a pool champion that day. <laughs> and I brought Ross McInnes down, who was a UK professional pool champion, to play a few games, do an exhibition and raise some more money. Because he, he was also the, U, the world speed pool champion. Okay. He could clear the table. He had the world record at that time for clearing the table. He was a real McCoy. I had posters of Ross all over the place with his, with his dickie on and all that and his cue. So the night before he came down to Campbelltown, I got a phone call from the American base, from their uh, NAFI. And they said, could we get this guy to come down here? And I said, well, he's coming to Campbelltown. He's going to be doing this and doing that. He said, how much money? We'll give you money if you'll come here. Charity. I said, oh, it'll cost at least £200, which was probably a lot of money in 19 canteen. No problem. I should have said more, obviously, but they said, no problem. Bring him down. So it was arranged that when he arrived in Campbelltown, when he flew into Campbelltown, I would pick him up, take him straight to the American NAFI, let him do his thing for an hour, and then I would pick him up again and take him to the event, the main event in Campbelltown. Whew. So, gets him at the airport, we go, he's up for it. He's well up for it. Take him to the American place. And as we walk in the door, guys, there's two or three hundred yanks. Yeah! The place erupts, right? Because this is the UK professional pool champion, tuxedo, dicky bow, Q, the whole place. And they've got a big table set up. And Ross comes in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's quite a modest guy, a good guy. And he looks at the table. I'd never met him before. He looks at the table and he says, Simon, is that the table we're playing on? And there's a wee bit of hush round about us. I said, yeah, obviously. He says, I've got a problem then. He said, look at my cue. And he opens his box and his cue had a tip on it like that. The balls right? were like that. The American pool table was at least twice the size of a British pool, much more. The bags are like buckets yeah. and the balls are like that. Yeah, really yeah. heavy. And he's saying, I can't hit one of them with this. I've never played this before. And everybody's going, oh, is there a problem? Is there a problem? There's a murmur going all around the place. There's a problem, there's a problem. And one of the Americans says, oh, you could try one of these cues, you know, a solid cue. And Ross is like, oh, for God's sake, are you OK? Yeah, we'll play, we'll play. Can I have a wee practice game and tell me the rules? Because this American pool's completely different yeah. from pool. So he goes on and they have a wee practice and their main man shows them the rules and how to play and beats them. And the whole place is an uproar. And I have to leave now. So I said to Ross, Ross said, uh, I need to go. Are you going to be okay? He says, aye, on you go. And I said, how much money have you got on you? 
And I said, how do you raise money for the charity? I've got the 200 quid. How do you raise money for the charity? He says, I get them to bet. And and whatever they the bet, if, whatever they bet, I'll pay them if they win. And if they lose, the charity gets the money. I said, that sounds like a great idea. How much money have you got on you? And he's got this puzzled look on his face, as if I'm an alien. He says, I don't know. What, he thinks I'm looking for a loan of money, I think. He says, I don't know, maybe a hundred quid or something. I said, do you need any money? He said, Simon, just go. Come back in an hour and a half or whatever, right? Just go. Because I'm thinking he's going to lose all his money. Because <laughs> I'm a fan of like all the Americans in the place that think they could win a game. He appears back. I go and get him. and He gets in the car. I said, how do you get on? He said, hey, yeah, he's got about 500 quid. What the hell? You got the hangover then? He says, fuck off. Simon. He thinks I'm at the wind up, you know. He thinks nobody could be that naive like all the Americans were. <laughs> oh man. So I'm sorry, America, but you were taken for a ride with that one. But everyone else you. was. Everyone I've, else was. I've, I've got to commend you on raising money for such good causes. My sister's little niece was diagnosed with leukemia a year oh, and a half. Oh, God. And uh, my sister had to give up a job. She was li living in and out of hospitals for two years, um, Great Ormond Street Hospital. Yes. So I went there. And all the little kids with the cancer were all sat around with the, with the family members and the shaved heads and everything. And um, my sister said, those kids and those kids and those kids aren't even going to see Christmas. Yeah. I feel lucky because there's been this advancement in childhood leukemia and, and, you know, we've got this really high survival rate. It's gone up from like half to 90%, I think, over the years. Yeah. And, and God bless the hospital, they did save the kid. So my sister now, I think she's, she must have raised about six figures for Great Ormond Street doing all auctions Brilliant. and all kinds Brilliant. of stuff, yeah. So I really feel for what I, you've been through. I used to say back in the day, <clears throat> I don't talk about it as much now because things move on, yeah. but I used to say there's a children's hospital in Liverpool. Yeah. We had the Royal York Hill Hospital, the Royal Hospital for Sick Children in Glasgow. And I used to say back in the day that everyone should be made compulsory to visit the children's hospital for half a day once a year. Yes, and it would change your life. It did. Spend a bit of time with them. Yeah. After, when I came out of Great Ormond Street, I was supposed to go to the Tube and just go home. I walked around London for two or three hours yeah. just thinking trying about... Trying to get it into Just trying to process what I'd just yeah. seen. Yeah. It was in, in, in... It's the most humbling thing. And with Louise, she was so alive. It was as if all the kids, were not just with cystic fibrosis, the words were mixed in those days. These terminally yeah. ill kids had a vibrancy about them that you would recognise, yeah. as if they were trying to cram everything into a shorter space of time. Yeah, yeah. It amazing like, places and amazing staff yeah, that deal yeah. with it day yeah, and daily. constantly on the front line. Yeah. 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 The bravery of the little kids as well. Amazing. That just yeah. blew me away. I couldn't fathom it, just how brave these little kids are, these little souls. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Certainly changed the tone of the podcast oh, yeah. there. Yeah, 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 tears here. So, But it's a nice place to take us, yeah, right, as we're yeah. near. Because I could go on all day. You know that, don't you? We love this. We is, have this a, is our perfect guest. We have we a, want, I just want someone to, I'm going to sit here. I just want someone to go on all day. We I'm, haven't. I'm, I'm, like me lunch. We haven't. We thought we were going one guest today. Let me just tell the audience what's happened here. <laughs> I was angry at James English for cancelling at the last moment. We, we filmed two podcasts a day. We rent the studio out. Last moment he cancelled on us. But you know what? It's been fantastic because you've took us on a, yeah. such a journey today. I'll tell the audience also. Sean told me we were doing from 11 to 1, one guest. And then we'll be having a lunch for an hour and a half. And then we were doing it again. No lunch, no we nothing. We didn't bring our lunch because James English cancelled to blame. I brought me fucking lunch. <laughs> I didn't bring shit. So. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> what about Fiona out there? She's heard all this before. <laughs> <laughs> we were meant to be going to the Beatles Museum. I'm sorry. <laughs> so Simon has graciously stayed for five hours now. Well, We've been filming for four, right. well, let for me, four hours. Let me help, <laughs> let me help you finish it now. Almost, almost. <laughs> because honest to God, oh, we could geez. go on and on and on and on. That's and the perfect on. It's it's we start. If it's you're thinking about it. coming on our podcast, me and Wilma <laughs> just want to sit here and listen to someone who can go on all day. If you yeah. can't go on all day, don't message us. If you're gonna, We're going to ask you a question and you're just going to go, blah, 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 blah. that's it. 
As long as you don't mind me going out for your fag break. <laughs> the sad thing is there's subjects in here that we've only touched the surface with. We have to you know what I mean? Then, yeah. Yeah. Firearms and drugs and especially your yeah. drugs project. I really want to know more about that. Yeah, yeah. But where we are in the story is nice to finish oh because I went to the divisional commander and yeah. I said to him, I'm trying to do this charity stuff and I'm trying to do my job and trying to do this. What would be great would be a year out, a sabbatical. No wages, just a year out of my career. They would have added a year on at the end. And I knew that I could make enough money, raising money with a charity, that, that I could afford to negotiate a, a commission that would have been uh, well worthwhile for the charity. I was probably raking in a couple of hundred grand at a time yeah. over a year. It would have went through the roof if I was full-time because I was at the peak of my powers. My daughter was savable. I was young and vibrant. I knew everybody. I had a police warrant card. I was learning things from people at like Ralph Slater. Do you know Ralph Slater? Not Liverpool, Newcastle and Glasgow, the suits. Ralph Slater's is a big, big brand in the UK. Of but Anyway, another story, another day maybe. But he was teaching me things about charity and about how to raise money, and I was at the peak of my powers because he taught me, not, I'm not asking for anything. I'm giving you an opportunity to give. Sean, this is an opportunity. If you can, that's fine. I understand your circumstances. But you've got an opportunity to help kids here. So that he turned my thinking around from begging to giving you an know, That was a big, big thing. So I went to the boss and he said, have a think about it. There's possibilities. I'll speak to who he had to speak to um, about a sabbatical for a year. Uh, the, the fundraising stuff, we could go on all day. But it was taken out of my hands a few weeks after that because I was approached by another branch of the security services and offered a job that would allow me to spend time with Louise because you never know when how long you've got. No. You, you never know if it's another six months. Go, yeah. And she would get very ill and be in hospital yeah. and that could be the last time. We now know that that went on for 23 and a half years, but yeah. you don't know that at the time. So I, I had to leave the police. Uh, that was part of the deal. Uh, signed this and signed that and got my pension and all that sorted out. So I didn't lose financially. I gained quite a bit financially and got flexibility into my life that I could move on. Um, and I can't, I, I can't put a price on that, the time I got to spend with Louise. She died in 2011 mm. and I got to spend the last two years with her almost exclusively. The, the almost is because... Young 23-year-olds don't want their dad with them all the time. Uh, but uh, I got to spend all that time with her on the hospital floor of the hospital and we went on holiday and her boyfriends and all the rest of it. And she died on the 15th of October, 2011. And uh, to give you an idea of what kind of girl she was, guys, she left me a note that I found two days later in my bedside cabinet. So it's a nice note to finish on. Yeah. Go for yeah. It, yeah, it's it's lovely. Mm -hmm. Although I'll be bubbling at the end of it. I I was in my room and I had some friends round who were commiserating condolences before the funeral. We were getting ready to drive down uh, for the funeral down to Campbelltown, and it was in my bedside cabinet. She'd written it the week before because she was getting into hospital and she knew she wasn't getting back out. Nobody else did, but she did. Hey, Dad, you've been the best dad ever. Don't ever doubt that. Okay. Now that I'm gone, I'm not really gone. I won't be there for you to see or to cuddle, but I will be there with you in spirit. I don't want you to be sad. Be happy that I'm free. Wow. Give me a hug. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're socially distancing in here, guys. Okay, I'll come here. <laughs> You've got to go into self-isolation oh, now. Cheers, guys. Oh man, so well, what a brave soul. So that last chapter is about Louise, really. <gasps> and that's why the book is dedicated to it as well. What she a was hell of a so story, brave. what a hell of a journey you took us on today. Good. You'll have to come back. Aye, aye, aye. I need to speak to the boss, I think she'll let me. what I've just heard. <laughs> man, you are an absolute fucking hero in my eyes. <laughs> as well as being the funniest cop we've ever interviewed. I've been called a few things in my time. <laughs> 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 that's not a regular <laughs> one. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Ooh. Thanks very much. Enjoyed it. I'm supposed to finish the video now. I can't, I can't speak. I'm, I'm speechless. All right, people, if you watch this, oh, you must be as blown away as us. Oh, you're one of the most interesting per people I've ever met in my life to sit here and just... I've not been bored. It's just... It's four hours has gone like that. It has, yeah. And, and your wit as well just shines through. It's been through. good fun, guys. Thanks. Your wit yeah. shines through. 
this the energy in in here today is, is it's been like nothing. I don't miss me lunch for so just far. anyone, you know. <laughs> the only thing, <laughs> the only thing that could have been better would have been if I'd understood anything Peter had said. <laughs> But he's big enough that I just smile and agree. <laughs> closing, my closing statement then. Let me just get with it. All right. We appreciate you letting us know below the video what you thought about today's podcast and what you thought about Simon's journey. And I'm sure you're going to be as blown away as me and well, man. It takes a lot to impress us. In the description box, I'm going to urge you, please go over and support what Simon is doing. There's going to be the links to his book, his social media, and also the links to the charities that he's, he's been working with for, for cystic, cystic fibrosis. Huge thank you to all the people who have subscribed to the channel. Subscription logo is in the bottom right-hand corner. We've got all of our socials down there. We've got the Wildman playlist, um, well over 100 videos now, some of them approaching half a million to a million views. So if you want more Wild Man Madness, there's hours and hours and hours of endless <laughs> Wild Man videos on the Wild Man playlist. We've got the True Crime podcast down there as well. And also a huge thank you to people who can continue to donate to help us film these um, podcasts in professional studios with cameramen and sound engineers. Oh, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm still like... <laughs> Oh, I gotta give you another hug, man. Proper one about knocking over microphones. Are we still on camera? Yeah, we're still on camera. Oh, better be careful yeah, yeah. then. I better not touch yeah, your yeah, bum. <laughs> Again. <laughs>